Good evening, everyone. This is a time and place set for the November regular meeting of the Royal Oak Planning Commission. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order, and we'll start down on that end. Well, wait a minute. We're going to start way down there where that guy's <laughs> sitting. And uh, please introduce yourself uh, for the record. Yes. Joseph Murphy, Director of Planning. Ann Beakey. Clyde Asbury. Charlene Douglas, City Commissioner. Nick Kurchowski, City Attorney. Mike Fournier, Mayor. Jim Ellison. And Gary Cassad, I'm the chairperson. All right, first thing, does any, uh, do any of the commissioners or the director uh, have any uh, additions to the agenda? I don't see any. Okay, next item is the approval of the meeting minutes from September 12th. This is a couple months ago. Does anybody, uh, any of the commissioners have comments, questions, corrections, edits to these minutes or a motion to approve? I move to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner Douglas. Uh, any discussion of the minutes from September 12th? All right, seeing none, I'll call for a voice vote. All those in favor of the motion to approve the minutes for September 12th, say aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. The minutes are approved. I will sign those and get them over to Mr. Murphy. Okay, the next item on the agenda is public comment on non-agenda items. Um, I'm going to take a minute here, uh, if you don't mind, and I'm going to stand up because I've been ruminating over this for a couple months. I was chairman for a long time, and I didn't have this. They gave me this recently because I have to bang it down when there's uh, unruliness. So what I'd like to do is just go over some ground rules uh, so we're a little clear on how the, the system works here. Uh, so the Planning Commission, uh, if you, if you want to speak on public comment on non-agenda items, you can do that. When it comes to agenda items, which is a public hearing, the public can speak on that. The ground rules are the same for both, okay? Um, and the next thing we're gonna do is public hearing, but this is for both. Uh, first of all, you get three minutes per person, okay? Not per topic. Um, and um, you're gonna have three minutes to speak. You're addressing the commission as a whole, not individual members. And it's not a back and forth. Uh, please don't address individual members and expect a response. It's not how it works. Uh, we will listen and we will take notes and at the end of public comment there'll be an opportunity for the commissioners to respond to you or the director or the attorney to respond to you or if there's a question that we can't answer there might be uh, some comment about what we need to do to investigate. You'll hear that. Our planning director is right there. He's taking notes all the time I assure you. And uh, okay. Now this sort of goes <laughs> do I have the, the gavel here and I don't want to use it. The Planning Commission serves a quasi-judicial function. We're not judges, but it is our function to hear evidence and take testimony and apply the law, which is the ordinance, to the facts. It's a serious matter. We take it serious. Every single one of these people up here take it serious, and we know you take it serious. And so that's the sort of decorum uh, that we, we are trying to engender here. We don't, we don't make a decision until we hear from everybody who wants to make a presentation. That's because it's a quasi-judicial function. We've got to hear the evidence, okay? Um, so I ask you to treat this like a courtroom, not a football game. Uh, hooting, hollering, cheering, clapping, that's not appropriate here. And, and, and also, what this is, it's a free market of ideas, okay? Your ideas, our ideas, the petitioner's ideas, the professional's idea, it's a free market. But free markets reward quality. And we ask you to keep that in mind. Polemical, insulting, disparaging, that doesn't work in a free market of ideas, which we're doing here. So I ask you to keep that in mind. And then I won't have to use the gavel, all right? Let's have a productive uh, hearing, thanks. Does anybody want to speak on a non-agenda item? Anybody? That's a first. Okay, I'm gonna close <laughs> the public hearing and we'll move on to the first agenda item. Uh, this is uh, conditional rezoning uh, of SB 2309 
Uh, one three, uh, this is a con uh, uh, unfinished business. Uh, Mr. Murphy, can you walk us through this? Yes. <clears throat> As you noted, this item was postponed from your September the 12th meeting. There was a public hearing that was held and closed. You do have the discretion as to whether you would like to reopen that public hearing tonight. But the petitioner is voluntarily seeking to conditionally rezone this property from neighborhood business to multiple family residential with the associated drawings that you have in your packet. So the petitioner uh, did listen to the public's comments as well as your comments at the September meeting and they've modified their drawings. I'll give a brief overview of those modifications and then of course the petitioner can highlight those in finer detail when they step forward. But the previous voluntary submittal that they provided you included 27 units in a multiple family residential development and they reduced that to 22 units. They were proposing to provide one parking space for each of those 22, 27 units. They've now modified the ground floor of the building and included additional parking which increases the parking ratio to 1.6 parking spaces per unit. So they've increased the parking per unit, reduced the number of units. They've modified the 11 mile road ground floor area and facade you'll see on the light shaded area in the, on the screen. Screens in the room, they provided additional parking underneath the proposed building. The previous concept that you had reviewed, there was entire floor area that covered uh, the the frontage along 11 mile road. So that modification has occurred. The, the building is also has a greater setback on 11 mile road. It's eight feet, eight inches. It was less prior. And they've also increased the setback on Phillips from no setback to one and a half feet. They modified the drawings to increase the landscaping from what was 4%, now it's shown at 10%. And they've increased the number of EV charging stations available to the residential units from two EV chargers to four. So they'll be able to charge four vehicles. You're being asked to make a recommendation of approval or denial, and this will proceed forward to the city commission for their consideration. As it is a change to the zoning ordinance, it requires two hearings at the, or rather two meetings uh, at the city commission and I'll have, I'll be available if you have any questions. I have a question right away. Just to, for the record, I want to clarify, this is a, a recommendation that we're, we're giving for the conditional zoning. There's a, a, a site, the site plan is part of that recommendation. It's only one vote. Yes, that's, that's correct. It's a, it's a amendment to the zoning ordinance. So only the city commission can amend the zoning ordinance after they hold a public hearing. So based upon your recommendation, uh, whatever recommendation that is, uh, it can proceed forward to the city commission and they'll discuss the item at the first agenda and then they'll set a public hearing if they decide to move forward at the next meeting, they would hold a public hearing to um, amend the zoning ordinance. To change the zoning, there is a development, a written development agreement associated with the conditional rezoning request and attached to that written agreement are the exact drawings that are approved by the city commission. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have a question uh, for the director or anybody else before we call the petitioner forward? <coughs> All right, hearing none, I'm going to call the petitioner forward. Bring your team up. Please introduce yourself and uh, tell us why you're entitled to the relief you seek. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm John Abro with Stone Gate Property Group, um, based out of uh, Big Beaver in Troy, Michigan. Uh, thanks, Joseph, for the uh, introduction for the changes on this presentation from the last back in September. Um, he gave us the, the numbers, and I would like just to 
just by mentioning that yes, uh, decrease of units by 20% of the development. Uh, for parking was 26% increase of the parking ratio from the 24 to 34, which were required only 33, based on a one and a half, uh, one and a half parking space per unit. Um, also mentioning that the landscape requirements, yes, we did increase the landscaping from our last plan two and a half times. So it was a 640 square foot to now the 1560, which is now meets the 10% minimum requirement. I know that was a concern as well. So from the last meeting, um, we did hear the planning, planning commission's comments, the neighbor's comments, um, also uh, their, uh, their requested changes. Uh, we spent a couple months redesigning the site. Um, also, uh, also the building number of units. At the same time, we're trying to accommodate and also make the proper changes needed for not just to satisfy majority of the comments made by the board, the neighbors, as well as for the development to make sense. Um, by reducing the number of units, or 20% was a hit to the knees. So again, we heard those concerns, and we're hoping that this proposed development here would better fit the site itself. Um, I'd like to make a comment regarding the one and a half uh, cars per unit. Um, just one block over 350 linear feet from our property is a CBD zoning, which at that zoning does allow parking requirements of 1.5. So we're right just there. Before we were asking for two ratio or one to one, apologize. Well, now we're, we're seeking 1.6 or we're, we're providing 1.6. Um, with regard to the landscaping that was done, um, by increasing the landscape from 640 to 15, 1560 square feet with, for the minimum 10%, that allowed us to <coughs> add these bioswales, which is another sustainable item that, we're, that we propose to our project. The surface square footage around 7,000 square, or 8,000 square feet of parking in the, in the rear, on the, south, on the south side. That will feed, um, per records that we have, Royal Oak has about 33 inches of rain per year. So that square footage will pretty much feed that 15, 16, 50, 15, 60 square foot of landscape area, which is another sustainable item that design that we, that we proposed. Um, we're still keeping all those items from before, uh, the electrical uh, um, high efficiency appliances for the units. Um, and one thing too we wanna make mention is that the units that we reduced was also on the third and fourth floor. So we took in count and said, hey, you know, if we can reduce the number of units, let's go on the rear side, which faces the neighbors, and reduced um, on the fourth and third floor itself, which eliminated uh, one balcony on the third and fourth floor on the south side, facing the neighbors itself. Again, we revised our floor plans, our elevations to match those changes. Um, still the high design um, materials so still proposed. Um, Joseph's point about setting setback. So we did now push the, uh, so now we're having a 10 foot clearance, which I know that was a concern to a lot of the neighbors, um, those who left Phillips Street. Um, so a 10 foot clearance setback has now been met. So I do have more to present, but I'll let, uh, kind of get the feedback first um, on those uh, changes that we made. Okay, are there questions for the petitioner, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, uh, last time we had a, some discussion about uh, assigned parking spaces. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on what your position is on assigned versus float uh, to handle any sort of irregularities with guests and everybody coming? So we have removed that des that design itself or those notes just because now we now have one half 1.6 parking ratio compared to the one one to one. So again, the 22 units now we have additional 12 parking spaces that allows guests um, gotcha. uh, at, at, at particular. So you'll have like one unit one space assigned per unit to, to keep the peace among the neighbors on site and then the rest will be unassigned for um, guests, etc. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. The 12 edition. 12 additional, yes. The 12 unassigned. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Other questions for the petitioner? Uh, I have one. Um, I, I, I actually like some of the new uh, design elements here. Uh, you have a Exit on to 11 mile. There's already an exit on to 11 mile, but this one's coming out from the building. And I just uh, wonder about uh, what uh, considerations you had to safety as as uh, your cars come uh, out onto the sidewalk there. Great point. So we 
we still have that 10 foot clearance, triangle clearance on both, um, on both angles of that corner. So today, so yes, both the 11 mile and the Phillips are gonna be existing to remain. So no curb cut changes as what, is, what you see today on site. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at, yes, the, that site plan does show a tw uh, 10 foot triangular distance or triangular um, vision clearance for those coming in and out, which is pretty much what you have today. Okay. Oh, if I can mention, photometric plan was also revised and have met the city requirements. For the photometric plan? Okay. Yeah, I know that was again, that was Woody's concern last time, so that has been now revised. We, we were all concerned. I, I, you're very good. You were. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I was looking at this thing upside down. Okay, any other questions for the petitioner? All right, hearing none. I guess I would turn to my uh, commissioners, and, and uh, as Mr. Murphy pointed out, uh, the public hearing is closed, uh, but um, is there a consideration of reopening it at this point? Does anybody have a comment on that? Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's always, we've had substantial changes to, um, by the petitioner. Um, I think it's, it's helpful to hear if um, there are any additional concerns or any concerns no longer exist, I'd like to hear from the public. So if my colleagues would support it, um, do I have to make a motion to, to do that or is it chair? I don't know, Mr. Murphy. It, for, for a clear record, you, it, it's appropriate. It's, it's, yes. I, I don't believe it's necessary, but I think for a clear record, it's appropriate. I always, I always laugh at myself because I probably could have just made a motion. We would have voted on it before we had to ask the question and answer it. So I'll move that we uh, reopen the uh, um, public hearing. Support. There a second. Support uh, by Mr. Ellison. Oh. Okay. Uh, any other comments on this? Okay. Uh, all in favor of the motion to reopen the public hearing on this item? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We're going to reopen the public hearing. Is there anyone here uh, in the public who would like to speak on this conditional rezoning at uh, 600 East 11 Mile? <laughs> All right. These are these are unique things happening tonight. I stand I'm, corrected. Yeah. I'm going <laughs> to close the public hearing then. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, moving back to this side of the table, uh, is there discussion here uh, among the commissioners about this uh, about this uh, recommendation, Mr. Ellison? <clears throat> I'm just going to make a comment. I mean, we we looked at this last month, and there was all kinds of problems with it. All kinds of things that we needed done to make it work for us. Very seldom have I ever seen a plan come back to us that has accomplished, if not, you know, 95% of those desires. You've come back, I think, in my mind, you've come back with a good plan. You've addressed the concerns we had, setbacks, parking, that kind of stuff. And, and, and I think from what I'm looking at right now, it looks like a very good plan. All right. Any other comments? Ms. Mayor. Yeah, I just want to underscore, um, you know, and, and I appreciate the chairman's words at the beginning of this meeting because I think sometimes it's misunderstood the purpose of the Planning Commission and sometimes it's misunderstood what our role is and what we're charged to do and it's misunderstood that, you know, just like a court case or a courtroom, people can pay their, you know, fee and present here, you know, they could ask to put a Six Flags amusement park in the middle of Vincetta Boulevard and if they want to pay their 400 bucks to petition, it's a dead, it's a no, but they're allowed to come up here and, and petition. I think um, this petitioner, um, you know, what I saw a couple months ago was, was eagerly and honestly listening to the feedback of the neighbors on Phillips um, and came back with a revised plan that shows that the process that we have here works. If we, you know, avoid disparaging language, if we avoid slander, if we avoid all these, all these conspiracy theories and we just say, okay, I have concerns about this project, I want to talk about it. Um, things come back and they can change in an innovative and positive way. It's not always the case. Uh, sometimes petitioners choose to make changes. Sometimes um, claims can be unfounded uh, or, or not factual, and that's okay. Uh, feelings are real and raw. Uh, but I'm really happy. Uh, um, I think for me, all of my issues I had with the project were addressed. And, um, and I think it went even further past that to address um, the neighbors as well as the uh, the concerns of the rest of the commissioners up here. So um, it's the process that's working. 
All right, thank you. Any other uh, comments? Ms. Beakey. Um, I, I appreciate the adjustments that were made to this, and I especially appreciate the modification on the, on the um, staring uh, on the upper uh, unit so that it's not overlooking the back um, dwelling so much, the people who live behind. Um, I'm still personally concerned that it is a very dense um, situation with um, 22 dwellings rather than four given our current options in terms of our zoning. And I'm also concerned about the uh, removal and lack of trees. And while I absolutely appreciate the addition of the green um, that was added there, um, I'm still not very comfortable with the giant modifications of the setbacks. Um, and I'd like to say something about the parking. Personally, I thought your solution to having people park in the, our parking garage was good given the fact that our parking garages are woefully underutilized. Um, and this probably won't pertain to this because you made adjustments that were requested by others. Um, but even assigning parking in our parking garages when you are having a rental building um, for the residents rather than the guests would allow modification to that parking and I hope we move in that direction because again I believe we have excess parking. Um, as it stands now because of the setbacks in the green space I think I would still remain on a little bit concerned side and maybe um, I'm leaning towards a no but I do appreciate the, um, the modifications that were presented here. All right, other comments? Okay, I'm gonna make some. Uh, this criteria that we're applying today is uh, not, uh, it's not one of those you, they have to, the petitioner has to show uh, in a positive way all of the criteria. This is one in which we have a number of factors that are in the uh, ordinance that we are to consider. Uh, putting together last or two, whatever it was, several months ago when the petition was here and tonight in the revised plan, uh, my feeling is that, uh, and I won't read them all on the record because they're, they're in the statute, but I, I think at a very minimum they have uh, shown that uh, factors A, D, G, and H in the ordinance they've, they've complied with. Uh, there's arguments for the others. But I think that's, uh, to me, that's a satisfactory showing. I do appreciate the adjustments made. It certainly is not uh, out of place here. That's surrounded by multifamily. Uh, and I think there's a good use for this, uh, to redevelop this parcel in this way. So I'll be in favor if somebody makes a motion in that direction. Mr. Ellison. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move the site plan as uh, resubmitted uh, with all the contingencies as listed by the planning department. And uh, that's it. All right, uh, motion to uh, recommend uh, approval to the city commission with all the contingencies recommended by the planning department. Is there a second to this motion? Second by Commissioner Douglas. Is there further discussion on this item? Mr. Redbury. Just for clarification's sake, uh, the ex-mayor's motion did specifically state the site plan. Do you want the conditional rezoning, Mr. Murphy, to be part of that motion? Well, there's a suggested motion in the packet, which, if you're referring to that, does specifically include the reference to the conditional rezoning and the associated Right, that's supplement. sort of what I was alluding yeah. to, yes, sir. Yeah, I didn't see a motion in the packet. That's page uh, 304 in the, in the packet. Four. You Perhaps you can affirm if, if and, and, you and intended on referencing the motion in the agenda packet. Yeah, I want to appreciate that uh, because indeed he didn't use those words. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not finding the, the revised motion in here. If I may, I think the question is really, you said a motion to approve the site plan, but we're, can, you're, you're recommending to the commission both the conditional rezoning yes, and I'm the sorry, site yes, plan. Yes, so exactly. I think they're just I, looking yeah. for clarification that that yeah, was the intent of That was of the intent of my motion to prove everything I submitted in front of us with the site plan and the conditional rezoning. Yes, that was my intent. Okay, thank you for that clarification. All right, given that clarification, is there any dis further discussion on, on the motion? Mr. I will be voting in favor of this motion. That was in, uh, in town for the September meeting, and this is really one of those classic examples where I came to this meeting tonight 100% on the fence. I didn't know which way I was going to go, and it was really going to be up to what the people in the audience said. If we were, you know, five person was going to push back a little bit harder, maybe ask for this or maybe ask for that. But the fact that you know nobody came out and spoke against it says to me that you know this uh, developer must have you know checked out the boxes that they were looking for, and they're content with what we're seeing moving forward as nobody said a word, so that being the case, I will be in support. 
All right, and I just want to, Ms. Beaky. I was going to mention there are four emails that were submitted, so yes. written comments were submitted. Yes, that, which that I opposed the, the. Yes, I reviewed those comments. I don't. They might have been late. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Just that there's not opening. Any further discussion on this item? All right, hearing none. Uh, the motion on the table is to uh, recommend approval of the conditional zoning in the site plan of the city commission with all of the uh, contingencies recommended by the planning department. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing aye. none, motion passes. No, I'm nope. no. I'm oh, you were no. no. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so we have one. <coughs> five, one, two, three, four, five yeses and one no. I apologize. Uh, all right. Nonetheless, motion passes. Congratulations. Uh, we're ready to move. Yes, I think we're ready to move on to the next item. All right. Uh, next item is a. Which is the next item here? Oh, here it is. Special land use SB 231116 uh, at uh, 1314 Northwood Boulevard. Mr. Murphy, please walk us through this. <laughs> it's a religious institution located at the intersection of Crooks, Webster Road, and Northwood Boulevard. Uh, there's been a, a long history of an independent daycare facility on the ground floor of the religious institution. Uh, the petitioner can, ex can express the recent history, but my understanding that the daycare tenant, uh, past daycare tenant moved out, a new one wants to move in. For some reason, the previous daycares did not have the required on-site outdoor play area that's associated with not only the city's zoning ordinance but also the state license that they have to obtain. So they're here seeking a special land use permit to place an outdoor play area. Uh, I'll, I'll hover over it on the Google Street View image and then I'll bring it up on the drawings. An outdoor play area between the back side of the building and the adjacent historical society of the old fire station building. So they're seeking site plan and special land use approval in order to create that required outdoor play area. And I can take any questions that you may have. Mr. Esbury. Yeah, Mr. Murphy, let me get my mic on, sorry about that. Yeah, I was going to ask you, so, yeah, I was going to ask you, sir, you know, because when I read this, I was sort of like, wow, I'm, you know, this kind of surprised me that's in front of us. You know, can you really explain in a little more detail what's driving this? They did not have a designated outdoor play area prior, and they approached us asking for that permission and to do interior renovations to the building to renovate the prior daycare space. So we were able to provide a signature of approval for the interior renovations, but the outdoor play area in the, this is in the one family residential zoning district, which does allow uh, daycare facilities associated with religious institutions, but the, the required outdoor play area is, is specified as a special land use in the zoning ordinance. So in order to have the, in order to establish that outdoor play area, they do require site plan and special land use approval from you. All right, but that's not being driven by the state as part of their licensing requirement as well? It is not only a requirement under the city zoning ordinance to have an outdoor play area, it is unquestionably re required by the state. And the size that they're proposing is the state's minimum. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Murphy? All right. Let's call up the petitioner. Please come to the microphone, introduce your team, and tell us why you're entitled to the relief you seek. <coughs> My name is Al Tumala, and my address is 3021 Helen Court in Royal Oak. I, as a member of the Royal Oak Church, uh, along with Joe Lendo, who is the chairman of the Board of Trustees of our church, are here tonight to represent the church in our request for a special land use approval to construct and maintain a 1,200 square foot playground on a church property. The playground is required by state licensing regulations in order to support a licensed child daycare facility. For decades, the church has offered a preschool slash daycare program 
conducted mostly by our volunteers. In 2020, the program was suspended due to the COVID pandemic. Fortunately, we've been presented with an opportunity to develop a licensed child daycare center for 25 to 30 children ranging in age from two to five years. It will be operated by an experienced professional daycare organization and funded jointly by the church and the daycare operator. In addition to interior building renovations required by, for state licensing, the outdoor playground is necessary for a licensed operation. We respectfully request your approval. All right, are there questions for the petitioner? All right. Hearing none, I guess I would uh, say, why don't you have a seat? We have, this is a special land use, so we have a public hearing on this. All right, is there anyone in the audience who would like to come forward and speak on the issue of the special land use uh, on this item? That is three times in a row, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much. I'm going to close the public hearing and uh, we'll bring it back to this side of the table. Do we have questions uh, uh, among ourselves? We want to bring the petitioner back. Uh, any comments, questions from the panel there? Ms. Beakey. I just have a comment. Um, I really appreciate uh, this uh, reopening of this daycare and, and I'm glad to see the addition of the outdoor play space. Um, I'm all for this. As we've heard in other um, presentations about daycares, we have a very big deficit in terms of numbers of interested families needing daycare. Um, and I think this is also a lovely place to have a daycare uh, in the play area right between the church and the historic um, society building. Because when people visit the museum, maybe they'll be lucky enough to see some nice kids playing outside. So I'm all for this. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor. And not only will I say there's a deficit and wholeheartedly agree with Ms. Uh, Beakey's comments, but I'll also say placement as well. So having this uh, near and about, you know, in, in, I mean, right there, there's neighborhoods all around. And so having these uh, types of uh, services um, that are run by professionals uh, in geographic proximity to parents who need to uh, have care for their children, uh, it's not just the amount, but where they're located as well for not just convenience, but, you know, every... You know, I remember my kids were, were little. Every 10 minutes, every five minutes was really, really valuable. So uh, if you could save a little bit of a commute and have a, a trusted partner nearby to help you out, um, I think it's, uh, it's a good thing for our community and for the neighborhood. All right, thank you. Uh, other comments, uh, questions, or a motion? Commissioner Douglas. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I will move approval of the special land use and site plan as submitted with the standard contingencies. I support. Um, oh, I got a question. Uh, you, this is two votes, though. We need two oh, votes. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. right. All right. So, I'll move approval of the special land use. All right. Is there a second? Support. Second. By Ms. Beakey. Okay. Further discussion of this issue? Okay. Hearing none, I'm going to call for a voice vote, but I'm going to pay more attention this time. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to approve the special land use, say aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, motion is carried unanimously. Let's move on to the site plan. Uh, is there discussion of the site plan? Commissioner Douglas? I'll move approval of the site plan with the contingencies one through six as listed. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Beakey. Is there a discussion of this issue? Okay, hearing none, I'm gonna call for a voice vote on the motion to approve the site plan with the uh, listed contingencies provided by the planning department. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Congratulations, good luck to you. Continue, good luck to you. you. All right. <coughs> Next is a number public hearing on special land use and site plan SB 23. Dash 11 dash 17. This is at 31 786 Woodward Avenue. Mr. Murphy, please give us a preview. The site located on Woodward Avenue between Chester and Hunter, and it also has an adjacent 20 foot wide public alley. In two, some board members may recall that in 2015, they were approved to redevelop the site with a new gasoline filling station 
that had an associated convenience store with el sale of alcohol and a carryout restaurant. The Planning Commission's approval in 2015 explicitly did not provide them the opportunity to have outdoor display and sales of merchandise. And they've had uh, items for display and sale adjacent to the building for several years now. So they are seeking approval to retain what was originally never, never approved. Uh, they're also seeking an opportunity to construct a new independent drive-through building, a drive-through restaurant, coffee house building on the south side of the property, and I'll turn to the site plan for that. So the proposed prefabricated building would not have any interior seating. It would be for employees only. And it does have a walk-up window on the Woodward side facade. And of course it has a drive up window for drive through service as well. Both of the uses, the display and sale of outdoor items adjacent to the convenience store as well as the drive through element of the proposed building, both of those are special land uses and both of them require approval independent or, or not uh, from the planning commission tonight. <coughs> The new building, as you can see on the drawing, and I'll hover over it, the new building is located on the south side of the property. It is approximately a foot off of the south property line on Chester Road. And the Planning Commission does have discretion over the placement of the building. Uh, there is a requirement for 25 feet, but the ordinance does say that the Planning Commission does have discretion during the course of site plan review. We do require eight stacking spaces for any drive-through restaurant. And the stacking spaces start at the point of uh, service, so the drive-through window. And you'll, you'll see shown on the petitioner's drawing that they do provide eight, at least eight parking spaces, but they're dependent upon the city's pub adjacent public alley in order to accommodate that. Currently, the, they do have a license agreement for use of the alley in placement of the, back in 2015, the Planning Commission required them to put in a masonry screening wall along the east side of the public alley. So they approached the City Commission in order to accomplish that because that item, required item, is in the city's public alley. So they do have a license agreement for that. But you can see right now that the alley goes through all the way from Chester to uh, Hunter if I'm correct. And they're proposing on the concept to close the alley at Chester and add landscaping so that they can accommodate the stacking spaces for the associated drive-through coffee uh, restaurant building. So they're dependent upon the, the city's public alley for use of the stacking, the required a number of stacking spaces. Uh, obviously, there's a central point of access to the site from Woodward Avenue. And you'll have people going to the convenience store, which has a carryout restaurant. You'll also have customers, like you do now, customers driving to the fuel pumps to uh, obtain fuel for their vehicles. And now we'll have the additional element of people going the opposite direction on the south side of the property for use of the drive through restaurant. So there's some concern over the, the number of components of, of items occurring on the site and the traffic flow associated <laughs> with them. We certainly do have some concerns over that. The ex all of the existing uses require 35 parking spaces. The existing site provides 39, so they're compliant. But obviously they're placing, they're proposing to place the new building in a portion, on a portion of the property which is currently parking. So they'd be removing parking, and of course the new building requires a certain amount of parking in and of itself. So the existing uses plus the Tim Hortons building require 39 parking spaces. And you can see on the drawing on the screen that the proposed site plan, modified site plan, provides 27. So they would be deficient in the number of off-street parking spaces. 
The prefabricated building measures uh, 14 feet 9 inches to the roof line, and I'll scroll to that elevation. You can you can review that. This is a newer concept building that the petitioner, I'm sure, can highlight how it's been deployed across uh, different in different places uh, in this country and others. But you can see to the roof line. It measures 14 feet 9 inches, and at its tallest point of the parapet wall, it measures 23 feet 9 inches. There, uh, the Planning Commission does have some discretion over the height of parapet walls and the building's facade and, and landscaping, of course, as well. Uh, staff does have some concerns with regard to whether the parapet wall is, is purely intended for signage, and obviously under the city signing ordinance, we don't allow signs on facades that project above the roof line. So as shown, they would need to come back to you to seek a variance from the sign ordinance to have a sign on the building on the parapet wall, which extends above the roof line. So a staff's concern is that uh, if, you, if you feel it's also appropriate that the parapet wall not exceed the height of any mechanical equipment on top of the roof. And the petitioner can highlight the, what the intended height of the mechanical equipment would be. We certainly don't want a parapet wall going so much above and beyond purely for the point of having signage upon it. So we don't have any objection over the outdoor sales and displays. Uh, we do have suggested contingency associated with that, but we've noted the concerns with regard to adding the additional drive-through restaurant. It would require, and I'm going to go back to the site plan again so that, uh, that everyone can have an understanding of, of what I'm referring to. So this is the public, the public alley. Again, they're proposing to close it to utilize it for stacking spaces associated with the drive-through facility. Uh, the Planning Commission does have discretion uh, in the zoning ordinance to allow public adjacent public alleys to be an escape lane. Mm -hmm. So we require uh, what's referred to as an escape lane for all drive-through facilities and for those waiting in line in, that, in the stacking spaces to get to the point of service we require an adjacent drive aisle lane as an escape lane so that if someone wishes to no longer wait in, turn, in their line to come to the menu board and place their order, they think it's taking too long, they can enter that escape aisle and exit. So the Planning Commission does have the discretion to allow an adjacent public alley to be used and as, as the required escape lane, but obviously they're unable to provide an escape lane on the site as well as provide all of the stacking that's required on the site. And they would be required if, if you do grant site plan special land use approval, they would be required to then proceed to the Zoning Board of Appeals to seek a variance from the minimum number of required parking spaces for the site, the required escape lane, which they're unable to provide, and the number of uh, stacking spaces as well. If the Zoning Board of Appeals approve the variances, they would then proceed to the City Commission to request to have the existing license agreement for use of the alley modified so that it matches this drawing. In, a, in essence, allowing them to use, to close the alley at the south end and use it for the required stacking spaces, as well as the menu board that's shown on the drawing. And we have obvious concerns over the placement of the menu board that close to the proximity of the adjacent single family dwelling and the number of cars that will be idling in the, in the stacking spaces as well. So I encourage you to keep all those things in mind as you uh, converse with the petitioner about their proposal and prior to that if you have any questions for me I can uh, uh, assist with that. All right, are there further questions for Mr. Murphy? Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and I apologize. Um, in the calculation, we talked about the number of parking spots. To clarify, we don't count the drive-through stack spots where you see, like I think in the depiction is like eight cars. We don't, we don't count those in the parking calculation, so to speak. No, they are. Uh, they have that separate count, and that we require at least eight spaces right. uh, stacked in order to get to that point of service, the, the drive-through window. 
but we don't re we don't count it's them a, as separate, separate parking separate spaces. Stacking requirement, not the overall. They're not considered blended into the overall parking uh, numbers. That is absolutely correct. Okay. Good. Thank you for that clarification. Ms. Beaky. I'm not sure if you can answer this question, but I'll I'll, pro po I'll pose it, and then if you can answer, great. Um, with the multiple uh, businesses functioning there, the gas station as well as the convenience store, if they were to add a, a walk-up coffee place that was only walk-up, so someone would have to park or they'd have to come by bike or come by from, from the neighborhood, and it had that same dimension, as it, would, would they require more? Would, would there be a requirement for more parking spaces if there were no drive-through and they were to put that coffee station there just as a walk-up window? Or do they already have sufficient based on the other businesses already functioning there? Because it's a small structure, so I assume it doesn't really require a lot of parking if there's no drive through Are you referencing the fact if they added a walk-up window to the existing building to provide coffee? Or No, no, even if they put this function there, but it only had walk-up, no drive-up. Yes, the building... Uh, people work inside the building, so we do count it at a certain threshold. Certainly a lot less of a park required number of parking spaces versus if there was seating inside for customers, then the parking requirement it becomes much more intense. But we certainly do have people working inside the building, and uh, this particular building requires, I believe in the, the write-up it refers to four parking spaces per our calculation. So okay. yes, if they did not have a drive-through window, the building uh, with its walk-up window would still require four additional parking spaces. Thank you. Mr. Esbury. Mr. Murphy, can you clarify one thing? Oh. Can you clarify one thing for me? When it comes to the stacking, you mentioned that's one of the things that they would have to go in front of the zoning board to get relief for, for the amount of stacking spaces that are being provided. Uh, it's not on their property. Uh, they they would be required oh, because to... It's a, it, because yeah, it's in the public alley, that's what's driving that ordinance or, or that requirement? They would be required to seek a, a variance from the required escape lane. Gotcha. Okay. Yes, okay. the escape lane. Right. Which Thank which you. they're just physically unable to provide at the site, and perhaps the petitioner can can speak to that and how they en envision being able to, I'll say, accommodate something of that nature. Whether that's people going down the uh, up the north side of the alley, what have you, I don't know. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Thank you, Chair. So, um, the alley is a two-way alley. So it accommodates two lanes. So why can't it accommodate both stacked cars and escaping cars? Now they would have to they would have to leave the the um, uh, Chester Street end open. But once they did that, then they people could escape using that that space in the alley. Yes. Yes, if they did not close Chester, uh, the alley could function physically uh, as an escape lane, presuming somebody isn't coming northbound on the alley. Uh, I, I could imagine people seeing the number of cars waiting on Woodward Avenue to get in the single drive lane to the site and turning up Chester and taking the shortcut around to sneak around and get in. Uh, at that point, then you wouldn't have the ability for people to escape and, and go past. But that's something that you can certainly discuss with the petitioner as to the closure or, or, or not. Uh, staff had suggested initial, in initial conversation that we would highly encourage them to close the alley at Chester so, so that it prevents that from occurring from customers trying to come down, come northbound on Chester, uh, the alley off of Chester, and then make that sharp turn to get into the drive aisle and you have other people coming in the site. It just adds to points of conflict, in our opinion. But perhaps the petitioner analyzed that themselves and they can speak to that. Uh, because one might also speculate that the kind of people who go to here are regular customers, and they might figure out quickly that they could go turn um, east on Hunter and stack in the entire alley behind the get the convenience store. I think there are probably endless possibilities. Yes. Sorry. I think there are probably endless possibilities, yeah. and of course we're not discussing the customers that come to the fuel pumps or the convenience store, which has <coughs> its own carryout restaurant and. <coughs> sale of uh, merchandise, including alcohol. Got it. Thank you. 
Other questions for Mr. Murphy? All right, seeing none, I'm going to call up the petitioner. I would ask you to introduce yourself, introduce your team, and tell us why you are entitled to the relief you are seeking. Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, uh, I'm Dennis Cowan of the firm of Plunkett Cooney, and I am here this evening with our full ownership and design team. Uh, first, I have uh, Ken Lucia, who is one of the owners, and Leif Kassab, who's in the back. They co-own the property. Uh, we also have Scott uh, Tuvian from Boss Engineering. Uh, which is responsible for the design and it will address many of the questions which you've raised uh, in the preliminary round. And also Rafael Putras. Rafael is our builder with RSP Construction Inc. So a couple of preliminary points then I'm going to hand it over to Scott to walk you through the site plan and, and our response to some of the issues which have been raised and that we quite frankly anticipated. So uh, this uh, Shell Station and the Barrels and Vines store and associated uh, businesses all opened in 2017. Uh, the owner worked co cooperatively with the city in establishing a brownfield uh, district in order to uh, uh, remediate some prior contamination that had been on the site by another owner. Uh, the business has been very successful. The neighbors in the area, the immediate residential areas, consider this to be uh, their convenience store, uh, and there's a very good relationship that the owners have built uh, over the years, and I think that is uh, manifested in the fact that we had a petition um, that was uh, presented with 30 uh, signatures, and I do have in my stack of stuff, here, another 13, which I'd like to present to you uh, for uh, that have been ascertained in the right. last couple of days. And those are all, these are all from people primarily, actually, 19 signed on Hunter and uh, four on Chester, uh, but also from some of the surrounding streets. So uh, we were very pleased to have um, uh, that good relations with the neighbors, and they are supportive of this effort. This will be the first of its kind in this area, uh, what we call a, a mini Tim Hortons drive through uh, It was started originally by the company, uh, which you may know is uh, from Canada, uh, but they have some there. They also have uh, placed some of these in West Virginia, in Ohio, and Florida. Um, it is a small building. It's about 650 usable square feet. It was always the goal of the of the business to have a national coffee service uh, that they could uh, have on site. Um, in the post-COVID world, it's a mandatory requirement that that kind of service be a drive-through. Uh, one of the things that happened in COVID and it's been sustained is there was a 20 to 25% increase in drive-through business and there was an excess of 100% of ordering by digital means and either pick up at a window or pick up inside a store. Uh, so it really has, uh, goes without saying that this really a requirement that, that Dunkin' Donuts does have. Um, you will occasionally find a non-drive-in in some particular places such as strip centers and things like that. But for these purposes, especially with the mini concept, uh, drive-through is, is needed. There is also an ulterior motive for doing this, and it's a very important one. There has been, over the last three years, a very difficult situation at the business that has been created, and I used in my letter to you cruisers. I don't want to call them cruisers because I don't want to dignify them. I would call them loiterers. And these are people who use uh, the cruising that happens in the summer. Uh, it's a summertime event now, as many of you know. It's not uh, just uh, uh, one weekend in August. And as a result, what has happened is they literally have taken over this parking area. 
and it's caused a lot of disruption. And if I showed you some of the videos, it's unbelievable. So they even go and take over the uh, pump, uh, the, the the sites at the uh, at the gas pumps. And so we've worked very carefully or closely, the business has, with the police department. But you know, people find ways to get around things. They go buy a bag of chips and say, "I'm a customer," and things of that nature. So there was some success in getting some of the folks out. But by and large, it continued and persists to this day. And I think some of you may have even witnessed some of this behavior. And so there, again, they would like to have the opportunity to put this Tim Hortons for first and foremost a business reason and service customers, but second of all, to rid themselves of this what I would call occupation that happens in the spring, summer, and early fall uh, by people who quite frankly are from Royal Oak because they found out through uh, the police checking license plates and things that most of these people are not from our community and, and I think uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, the, we have talked with the police department and they believe that this will help the situation with the uh, invaders or loiterers but also that it would be helpful perhaps in alleviating the situation a little bit south with Starbucks because as many of you know, people who are looking for coffee in the morning on Woodward, they're either driving north or south. They're probably not gonna cross over unless they really need a fix of whatever their favorite coffee is. And right now in that area around 13 Mile Woodward, which is very busy because of uh, Beaumont, now Corwell, and other businesses in and around the area, they're pretty much going to stay in that north or southbound lane. This will provide another alternative. And I do want to make it very clear. We are not Starbucks. Um, and I say that because when I told my wife about this, she said, you're not going to have the Starbucks problem, are you? And I said, no. If you look, we have not only the eight stacking spaces which are required, but if you kind of draw the cars all the way down to the sidewalk, we have the equivalent of 16 stacking spaces. That's double what is required. So if we had a run on Tim Horton's coffee in the morning and nobody went to Starbucks, we're not gonna have a problem of stacking back onto Woodward like we do down the street. And also we do have 27 parking spaces as opposed to there's 11 spaces at Starbucks. So uh, we're not trying to jam something on this property the location of the building, which Scott will talk about, is primarily driven by the fact um, that we had to avoid two areas in placing the building. One is engineering department informed us that we had to avoid building over the stormwater detention area, which is to the southern part of the property. And also you note on the plans that the hookups for the gasoline uh, trucks are right there in that, in, in, in that area also. So there was no real alternative other than to go to the far southern end of the lot line. So that those introductory remarks uh, being said, um, I'd like to invite Scott to come up and uh, talk and walk you through the site plan and address some of the issues such as the escape lane and things of that nature. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Uh, as he mentioned, my name is Scott Tuziant with Boston Engineering, 3121 East Grand River Avenue in Howell, Michigan. Uh, Mr. Murphy did a, a great job of providing an intro uh, about the project. So I'm going to speak uh, primarily about uh, some of the main concerns that are, are brought up in uh, in the letters. Uh, one of which is, is going to be the parking deficiency. Ultimately, a variance will, will need to be sought. Uh, the other is occupation of or utilizing the alleyway for the stacking spaces uh, in addition to the, the menu board. And then uh, the third uh, and primary uh, is location of, uh, of the building. Uh, and, and actually a fourth one is, is ultimately why no escape lane was, was provided. So uh, to provide insight into uh, ultimately how uh, the site was laid out, uh, just thinking about the building and, and its placement, um, you know, the site as it exists today has three access points, Chester, Hunter, and, and Woodward, the primary of which is, is of course, off of Woodward. And uh, as uh, Mr. Murphy had indicated that maintaining that, uh, that access point off of Chester, especially in close proximity to where we would ultimately uh, have this building be placed, uh, does introduce additional points of, of conflict. Um, it, it just introduces more variables total. Um, so eliminating that really cleans up the overall site circulation. And again, a, a majority of the, the site users are coming in from, from Woodward and turning, turning right into the site. 
So um, thinking about you know, alternate locations that this building could go, um, of course, really we're limited to the south uh, third of the site, um, of which there is exist, uh, really important existing infrastructure uh, in the underground storage for stormwater as well as the underground fuel uh, tank. Um, we didn't want to put the building too close to the canopy uh, because we wanted to ensure uh, that the drive-through lane was, you know, had adequate separation from the primary uh, access way or the lane of travel uh, of cars coming in and out of Woodward. Um, and uh, so ultimately we wanted to, uh, that guided our thought process to want to um, isolate this building uh, to almost operate independently on the south side of the site. So as far as its location, um, it, it is proposed to be a foot off of the, the right of way there on Chester. Uh, I'll note that that is pretty consistent with, with really this portion, this corridor of Woodward Avenue of, of buildings being uh, built right up adjacent to, to the right of way. Um, uh, additionally, you know, putting it close to the right of way there does maximize the, the potential for additional uh, stacking spaces beyond what's required by ordinance. Um, so we do provide uh, eight as shown. Um, so kind of getting into the placement of the stacking spaces within an occupation within the alleyway. Um, Ultimately, because the Chester Road access point is, is being closed and you're, you're, uh, again, you're cutting off that two-way circulation point, um, that southern half uh, of the alleyway, uh, the southern half of the site that is, really isn't, um, isn't necessary in the sense of circulation for, for an alleyway. Um, so the viewpoint, again, was to utilize that additional space uh, as, as the stacking. Uh, so getting into the, the escape lane, um, uh, the la I'll note the, you know, the most likely people that uh, will try to escape or leave, leave a drive-through lane are the people near the end of the line. Uh, you notice the, the speed at which the line is moving isn't to your, to your standard or liking, uh, something comes up, et cetera. So I'll note that the last few cars in uh, that, that are required for the stacking uh, and any beyond would be able to escape uh, through that parking lot uh, just prior to the dumpster pad. So uh, a partial provision for, for uh, again, the primary people that would need to or want to escape uh, is there. Um, additionally, you know, just talking about the building and ultimately what's being proposed is this is a, a small footprint building. The operation is drive through. Uh, there's no indoor seating or outdoor seating as, as Mr. Murphy had uh, initially opened with. Um, so their business is drive through. Uh, it's going to be, you know, these smaller buildings, um, although this is newer for Tim Hortons, there's another brand uh, similar to Scooter's Coffee. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, very similar setup, a small, narrow, you know, roughly 20 foot wide building, uh, again, focusing on just drive through. So their goal is to turn people over. They don't want uh, cars sitting in the lane uh, in that drive-through. So they have they don't have as many options as, as say you know more landmark coffee uh, shops do. Uh, again, ultimately to promote that turnover uh, and have cars cycle through the drive-through. Uh, I, I will note uh, from a standpoint of circulation and safety and circulation on site, um, the exit point of the drive-through is not right at a location of primary travel. In other words, we're not discharging cards right after the drive-through right into that primary access point off of Woodward. Again, that, the whole goal of keeping that building to the far south uh, achieved that. Um, so in talking about parking, uh, so currently the site is compliant, uh, a few excess spaces actually. Um, over time, uh, you know, this site has had the ability and, and fortune of, of time to know that they don't need that much parking. Uh, that is the amount of parking they currently have on site. Uh, and because they don't need it, and it is uh, oftentimes available, that is why it is being occupied uh, by, by loiterers. So knowing that ultimately, yes, it doesn't meet the ordinance requirement for the parking, but also knowing the current business model for what is out there, in addition to this coffee shop and, and what it needs, which again, a handful of employees, we're talking two to three employees inside to facilitate this, this small building, because um, quite frankly, you're, you're not gonna get many people that, that park and walk up uh, unless they're at the pumps and they go and walk up and try to get a coffee while their car is uh, being filled. So um, we didn't, we still don't believe we need as much as we show, but we also recognize we don't want to be 
we don't want to be in a spot where we're more efficient than we have to be. We want to reduce the amount of variance that ultimately we're seeking for, for parking. Um, so with that being said, just talking about how people, uh, just human nature, what is seen and how people use the gas stations, um, uh, a lot of people that do fuel up their cars do tend to, while their car is fueling, tend to run in and, and grab something really quick. Um, so all those, those, although those 12 uh, fuel island spaces uh, aren't included in parking calculations, uh, in a in a actual matter of fact, some of them are as far as people that are still utilizing the C store uh, while they are fueling up. So. Um, other than that, I think those were the, the primary points I, I wanted to bring up, so I'll, I'll pass it off uh, for, for any discussion or any additional questions. All right, are there questions for the petitioner? Mr. Ellison. Now, hopefully I have just a simple question. Have you established a typical time for a turnover on a, a transaction? Someone comes in, goes to the menu board, orders their meal, gets to the window, pays for it, and leaves. Is, have you got an established time frame for that? We would have to uh, consult ultimately with the, with the franchise uh, about okay. what they're seeing at I'm their other concerning, locations. I'm Good assuming question. this is gonna be the full Tim Hortons menu. 3.38 this, this, is, this doesn't have the, the full uh, kitchen footprint that the typical then, location okay. would have. Then that makes it much easier. I'd, yeah. I'd be concerned if they're, if they're fresh making their breakfast sandwiches, so it's going to be donuts and bagels. And, right. and, and, and uh, again, a lot of coffee, I'm not personally a coffee drinker, so I don't know all the ins and outs of, of variations that people can order on their coffee, but just knowing some things that, you know, again, just kind of using on uh, a Starbucks as an example, um, you know, there's a lot of different options you can have on your coffee, yeah, right? Yeah. So yeah. this being kind of more of a, a of a quick turnover model, that's that's not really an option. It's, okay, that's, it's, that's, right, that's, they have that's, stuff ready to go. That's what I want to hear. Yeah. I, was concer I was concerned about something holding up the progress. You know, we got eight stacked, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden we got 12 stacked, and then we got through, because someone's getting a special sandwich. Sure. So that's not going to happen. Okay. Other questions for the petitioner? Okay, I have one. Um, don't go away. So, I'm sure there has been a time where the escape lane was not required. I know this to be a fact because when I was in Sturgis, I went to the Hot and Out, and it's a long thing with no escape lane. My question for you is, have you done other drive-through facilities, food facilities, that don't have an escape lane? If so, where? Tell us about them. So, most of the facilities that we do are the larger footprint and they have more options. They are drive through restaurants. In those cases, you do have longer order times, in which case you do want to promote uh, or allow uh, more access for, for escape. Uh, in this case, this being a unique, I personally have not done a, uh, let's call it a small satellite uh, coffee shop uh, like this. Um, so uh, again, just thinking about the business model of, of the use and that quick turnover for, for getting people their coffee and out, um, it wasn't as high of a priority and knowing that there, yes, you're correct, uh, it has never, hasn't always been required and some places still don't require. Um, it, it, it hasn't it wasn't as much of a driving factor, uh, I guess, in summary, as, say, your more uh, staple drive-through restaurants that we typically see. So again, this is, is kind of new for, for a lot of people, these satellite type, but I believe this is also gonna be the first of many, ultimately, in the area, so. Mr. Ellison. Just a quick comment. The, the wonders of the internet we can look it up and find out that the turnover time, average turnover time for Tim Hortons is 3.38 minutes. If you get a bigger sandwich, it's 4.38 minutes. But said, you see, you have the asked mm -hmm. the question, it's right there. <laughs> I got one by Mr. Hortons hey, for doing that research for me. <laughs> the average time for a Starbucks is uh, close to five minutes. And this is actually something I found out in Starbucks, because the first thing when I saw this come up, I was like, uh, you know, the same thing I guess uh, Mr. Cowan's wife had, is like, are we gonna have another mm -hmm. issue on Woodward? And I think the design is, is, is certainly way different, but immediately I thought, what is the throughput of, um, you know, a Starbucks line versus that of a McDonald's or that of a Dunkin' Donuts or that of a, a Tim Hortons? And even more specifically, this time doesn't account for the, um, 
you know, quick service feature that we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. So what it's suggesting is in the timing, like Starbucks has an immensely more complicated menu like you were suggesting. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the other competitors that say Dunkin' and Tim Hortons do not. You know, you might be able to get a whipped cream and milk and caramel in your drink and you're on your way in a very quick order, which um, this isn't about drive throughs what I found in Forbes, but it's more about, um, you know, revenue turnover throughput of customers and why some are outperforming others in terms of financial results. But I thought it very interesting, so I shared it. Sure, Mr. Allison, to answer his question. <laughs> All right, uh, Ms. Beakey? If you're done. Says we have to move to a public hearing eventually, right? Before we discuss? Um, Isn't there yes. a public hearing on this one? Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, 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 I was just curious. No. Okay. Um, I think we're still on the petitioner. Uh, I still ha I, I have some questions. I'll tell you this. Uh, we'll, it's a good idea, Ms. Beakey. We should move to the public hearing. Even if you're turning th people through at, at, at three and a half minutes, I'm looking at the site plan, and it shows to me five cars that may not be able to escape. That means they may be sitting there between 15 and 20 minutes with no escape lane. That is a concern to me. The other thing is I'm not a designer, but this site plan, and I've been to the site, it doesn't appear to me that you could not design this with an escape lane. That's what I think. Maybe I'm wrong, but it looks like you could. So I'm concerned about no escape lane. But Ms. Beakey. I, I guess I'll add a comment. I, I, I was thinking to save until after the public hearing, but um, as, far as, as far as using the alley also um, as something that would be, be um, permitted for this car use rather than as one as an alley exists now, which is also for walking and biking, um, I think that's a bit excessive in terms of um, how the site plan is designed. All right. Um, is there any other questions for or comments to the petitioners before we open the public hearing? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna ask the petitioner to have a seat and I'll open the public hearing on special land use. Um, and before I do, I just, uh, Mr. Murphy. So we've got two things going on here. We've got a request for a special land use bundled together. One is for the outdoor display and one is for a special land use to have a drive-through service. Correct. There are two different ones. So if we were to approve this, we'd still have to approve the site plan afterwards. Yes. Okay, so Mr. Ellison. Quick question for me. Ms. Murphy, you had mentioned earlier that we've got to get the land use for outdoor display, outdoor sales. Is that part of, this is all rolled into the same thing here? Should be a separate memo. Uh, excuse me, it should be a separate motion. So, you, so I, it will be a separate action. It's, it's a separate, uh, separate motion when it comes to addressing the special land use because okay. they're both special, special land uses. Okay. So Thank it's you. appropriate for you to act, in, act independently in making a motion of those unless you want to lump them all together. Your, your proposed uh, motion is a little bit... Uh, uh, it's a little bit confusing, so yes. Um, so two. That's what you're recommending. Yes, it, okay. it's appropriate to, to independent. And, and I stepped out. Uh, I'm hoping that you conversed with the uh, applicant about the outdoor sales. About the what? Outdoor sales and display. Not really. <laughs> That's okay. All right. So I'm going to open the public hearing. And just, uh, uh, just with that clarification, there's two separate motions this uh, commission is going to take up for its special land use. One is going to be for the outdoor displays, and the other one is going to be for the drive through Are there members of the public who would like to come forward and speak on this special land use item? Please come on up. Introduce yourself. You have three minutes. Good. Good evening, my name is Cynthia McAvoy and I'm the property owner of 3722 Hunter Avenue. Firstly, I would like to express my support for Barrels and Vines' success, and I also support their desire to find a solution to alleviate the loitering cruise, cruiser issue, since this affects us, the, the neighbors and residents as well. Currently, there are three entrance exits to Shell and Barrels and Vines, one on Woodward Avenue, one at the alley on Chester Road, one at the alley on Hunter Avenue. The proposed plans for the addition of Tim Hortons include closing the alley at Chester Road. Whether my neighbors on Hunter Avenue were aware of this when they signed the petition, I do not know.
By closing Chester Road Alley, four things will happen. One, barrels and vines will have possession of the public alley. Two, Hunter Avenue will inherit increased vehicle and truck traffic from Verrills and Vines customers who currently use our street and neighborhood as a shortcut. Three, Hunter Avenue will experience increased accidents due to the northwest positioning of the alley at Hunter. Traffic turning in and out east of the alley requires a sharp, wide turn. Hunter Avenue is a narrow street and unable to safely accommodate wide turns. I have personally witnessed two accidents, and I predict there have been more. Number four, the loitering problem will continue to be an, is an issue at the alley on Hunter Avenue. Loiterers will still gather behind the barrels and, and vines building on the east side, where they are able to hide from Woodward Avenue visibility. When patrolling police cars arrive, the loitering cru cruisers quickly disperse by speeding onto Hunter Avenue and then return once the police leave. Therefore, I suggest closing the Hunter Avenue alley as well. By doing so, Barrel and Vines customers will enter an exit from the street address of the business, Woodward Avenue, and Hunter Avenue residents will greatly benefit from reduced vehicle traffic, congestion, and speeding. I respectfully thank you, Commissioners and Mr. Mayor, for your time and consideration. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else like to come up and speak on the special land use for either one of these items? All right, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the side of the table, ask commissioners if we have uh, further questions for the petitioners, for Mr. Murphy, uh, among ourselves, Ms. Beakey. Um, I guess I have a general comment. Again, at, at this location, and I wasn't familiar with the issue about the cruisers and that kind of thing, and I, I'm glad to hear the owner um, working on that, um, but given given the fact that Royal Oak is one of the few areas in the whole entire uh, region as well as state that really emphasizes walkability and neighborhood businesses, I can't um, support a special land use for a drive through I think it's inappropriate. Um, walkability has been a part of our master plan since 1988. Um, I'm very a pro uh, modifying Woodward Avenue and making it more uh, neighborhood friendly and slower. Um, in con conjunction with, uh, or consistent with the 2014 Complete Streets uh, design of Woodward Avenue and also in conjunction with the extensive discussions we're having right now on, mod uh, on our newest uh, master plan. Um, so that's one issue. So I, I can't support that. And also the issue of the alley being given over, I think also as a public right of way to a private function um, makes it even less so. I'd be happy, very happy to see a coffee function there to complement the other businesses if it's a walk up and a bike up and that kind of thing. And to the point about the alley uh, misuse by uh, people loitering and such, um, I don't know if this is something we've used in Royal Oak yet, but, but bollards that can be removed in the case of a fire or in case of something else, but where people can walk and bike through, um, but cars can't use an alley, um, could be something that would help relieve the stress on the neighbors. Um, and as again, something that's used a lot in other communities, I'm not sure if we have that in place yet, um, but it would be very functional. And with regard to the issue of outdoor signage and the special use in, in that regard, I guess I was not I was not on the planning commission the last time it was advised that that would not be allowed but I would be consistent with I think the previous denial of the outdoor signs given whatever was debated the last time um, and so I understand that the petitioner has been going against what was advised um, and so I don't think that if I understood Mr. Murphy's uh, initial address. But anyway, but as far as the drive is concerned, I can't support that on any level. Um, oh, and also it's inconsistent with our sustainability and climate action plan, just the notion of idling. If they wanted to have some pull-up spots for someone who is disabled and cannot get out of their vehicle, with the digital technology and the pre-ordering, that would be very, uh, I'd be amenable to seeing, you know, five-minute pull-in, pull-out at the door um, for that function, um, but but not for a drive through All right, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just a quick comment about the, the time, the three minutes. Um, that is actually from order to um, customer leaving after payment receives their, so when you look at it, it wouldn't be, I think on average 15 minutes, but there could be you know, some diverged time there uh, with cars that stack beyond the ordering. 
that you can see um, in the drawing that go beyond the, the ordering window there. Um, but I, I guess, or ordering sign, rather, whatever the menu board. Um, I guess my question, I thought it was pretty intriguing. I mean, you're pretty much essentially cutting off the through, with this plan, cutting off the throughput of the alley anyways, because uh, on Chester, you've essentially blocked it off, which, you know, I think it's an interesting question we got at public comment. Does it make sense to look at um, Hunter, or does it make sense to do one of those where you kind of bump out the curb where it's a left turn only, or whatever it may be? And, and I'd be curious to understand, Mr. Murphy, maybe you have some ideas, and, and my colleagues here, um, what the impact would be is if we did close that off um, as well, uh, would that create too much congestion because there'd be less options and Woodward would get all congested or is it not really meeting that critical mass? Does it make sense as a trade-off for the neighbors? Do you exit people to the left versus giving them the ability to turn right? I thought it was an interesting point and uh, I did not imaginate an answer. So I'm hoping my colleagues would enlighten me a little bit on their thoughts. All right, I'll give me a thought. Um, I think that I'm familiar with Arby's on Woodward, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I just had to remind myself, I went and looked at a picture of it. The escape lane in Arby's is the alley. It's very tight there. Um, so um, we've seen this before, they can use the alley. When I look at the, at the site plan, I don't understand why, uh, and I say that as if I know what I'm talking about here, I don't. I, I have a question about why the alleyway has to be completely closed off to Chester. It seems to me that the easternmost portion could be left open as an escape lane uh, as only southbound. And mm -hmm. it seems to me that then you would have an escape lane because we know from Arby's that there's room to do that, you know. So anyways, I, I have some uh, concerns, the math, uh, I don't want to get in an argument about this, but if it's three minutes from order to getting your drink, there's still, the math is, that means that these five cars that I'm looking at might be sitting there for 15 minutes. The fifth car was sit, may sit there uh, for 15 minutes and it have no escape lane. That's a concern to me. Is it the end of the world? I don't know. I, my, my feeling about this is it seems like a coffee service here is a nice uh, addition. I'd like to approve it as a special land use, but I'm probably not going to be supporting the site plan. That's where my head is at. So you asked me. It's a minute, please. Mr. Elson. <laughs> we are dealing with a complicated problem here. The problems at that shell station go back two decades. That's when the dream crew started. That's when the previous owner of the Shell Station uh, allowed the cruisers to park in his lot and even encouraged them in, to come in and park in his lots. And that created the mindset that that lot was always available for people to park on a Friday or Saturday night and watch cars. So that's the mindset we're trying to get rid of. Um, over the years, over 20 years, the, the people that are doing this have changed. The people that used to, they used to go in there would follow the instructions and the police asked them to leave, they'd leave. These, these guys don't leave. So, uh, you know, this, this business has a problem it needs to deal with. And so uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if the Tim Hortons drive through was a problem, but it certainly is something um, to get us going. Because if we do nothing, it, it, that's not going to change that problem up there. Um, I, uh, yeah, I don't know where I stand on this. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, we look at the, the bulk of the problems, the backup problems we're going to run into are going to be in the morning, because that's when people stop for their coffee. I mean, that's where we've got the problem at Starbucks is, is uh, you know, when everybody's going to work or dropping their kids off at of school or whatever, that's when traffic's all backed up. And I think, um, and I go past the Tim Hortons on 11 Mile and, and uh, Stevenson, and, uh, they're always busy, but they've got a huge stacking area, so the cars are always in the lot. So you, you're going to have that problem of cars overflowing or increasing traffic, um, and I don't know how we get away with that until, until you get to you know 10:30 in the morning and the rush comes down and and uh, slows up. Uh, the other question I wanted to ask, I don't know if anybody's got that answer, is is has the uh, the opening of the of the car wash impacted traffic problems on Hunter? Mr. Cowan, maybe you have that answer. Um, 
Well, the car wash exit, when you come in, the car wash exit is opposite. Yeah, yeah, I, have, so I, 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 can't, I can't say for certain. I want to address, though, one issue about this timing, because I think it's very important. Because of the fact that there's very few of these minis right now, the timing that you refer to is for a full service Tim Hortons. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Three point three minutes. I would hazard to say that because you have very limited, it's probably in half. And let's face it, all of us go to drive throughs. Okay? Mm -hmm. And what's your number one decision when you pull in? Am I gonna get in this line or not? How long is it and how long do I have? If I have 15 minutes, which it maximum a situation, uh, I'll wait. Or if it's something I really want. Uh, but this is a, a very quicker turnover, and there's very many escape opportunities, including just before you get to the menu board, cutting down the lane where the parking spaces are. So there's a, a, a whole, I think, first of all, the 3.38 minutes yeah. is a little overblown because that's based on a full service Tim Hortons, not on a limited service Tim Hortons. And also, you make that decision when you pull in, and perhaps you make that decision even before you pull in, and there's one other option you have here. If you're gonna, if, if it is busy, you can always pull in and gas up and walk across and get one at the walk, at, at, at go through the door and, and get a coffee. You don't even have to get in the lane. You don't even have to get in that drive-thru. And I think that's gonna be something that happens is that people are going to gas up and either leave their car there when they're done or while it's gassing up, which they're not supposed to do, uh, they're gonna walk across and get a coffee or they can even go to the service station ahead of time, order a pickup, put get their gas, and then go over and get their pickup order. So there's a lot of options to cut down on the uh, waiting time, which I think will serve not, not to have the need for an escape lane. I think also, um, with respect to Chester and closing that off uh, and talking to Ken uh, and Leith beforehand, a, a little bit of this was trying to be helpful to the neighbors on Chester. Uh, I wish we could solve all the problems of the world and also cut it off on Hunter, but I'm gonna be realistic with you. I don't think your fire and police department and emergency services will ever allow you to have no access mm -hmm. off that alley because you've only got one entrance way. I learned a long time ago. Mm -hmm. If there's an accident that blocks off that one driveway in off of Woodward, you have to have a second access point to get in. So, uh, I, although I, I would love to be able to do it. I think from a, from a, a fire, police, and, and EMT uh, safety issue, wouldn't be able to close off Hunter. But that was the, the idea of closing off Chester was also to prevent people uh, from coming in, which we definitely think is gonna cause a problem, um, but also uh, to prevent people from escaping, going out onto Chester, um, because of the fact that they have ample time to make a decision and also ample um, uh, alternatives to not even have to get into uh, the driveway. Sir, let me, can I finish okay. where who, who I was? Who was there? first. Can, what, can <laughs> I finish yeah. where I was? Um, <laughs> I, I, I think it's not fair to say that everyone uses drive throughs I personally avoid them at all costs and walk into a place before I would ever go to a drive through or walk up to a window. Um, but the other thing I also want to emphasize is to resolve the issue of loitering and people staying in the alley, putting in a drive-in place is not going to resolve that issue, especially if this is something that goes on at night and other hours. I think it would be much more effective and appropriate in terms of that alley to do something with regard to, again, bollards or something else that's removable and fully uh, in conjunction with police and fire safety. Um, and again, to have a coffee shop, as you just pointed out, if it's busy or if there were no drive through people would walk up to it. You already have a convenience store. You have a gas station. And again, in this community and in, in um, this area, I don't think a drive through is an appropriate um, uh, function. And it also definitely is not appropriate if we're trying to resolve loitering as the issue. But, but um, so, seriously, Commissioner, there's seven drive throughs within a half mile either way. And this isn't like this me. is not an experience we have in Royal Oak and already. That actually is the we other have drive throughs The other thing I wanted to point out also, and I would like to see them phased out personally, but the other thing that Starbucks, I, if I do go on Woodward, it's usually between hours if I'm going to visit my mother. 
who is north of where I live, and that, that Starbucks is startling, uh, has the cars on Woodward at all hours. And again, I think this is inconsistent um, with where we're headed as a community. All right, Mr. Ellis. Let me, okay, yeah, because I was in the middle of my discussion when I asked Mr. Count a question. But to go back to your concern, I've gone by Starbucks and there's nobody in there. So it, it's a, it's all happenstance of what they're going to do. But, the, but there's no question that it's first thing in the morning when that is backed up. Because I go by there on the way to work and I see it. And then in the afternoon, people will stop it on his bed. But the primary time is in the morning. Now, this going back to this drive through again, as I said, this, this can solve a couple problems. I think it is knowing how the cars that come in there and loiter and how they like to position themselves so that nobody's within six feet of their car. Right. It's, it's going to, you know, it's going it, to persuade them not to come in here. They'll find some other place to go. But going back to what you were saying, Dennis, about access for emergency vehicles, we've got to have access for the dumpster. I mean, the dumpster cannot, the, the, the trash removal cannot come in off of Woodward because they'd have to drive under the canopy over the pumps to, to get in the back yeah. to service the back of the building or service right. the neighborhood. So, so to block off Hunter, your your the fire department won't let us do it to begin with because they've got to yeah. have access all the way around 360 yeah. degrees around the building, and uh, you, and you can't do that by driving under a gas canopy. So, um, that's a good point. It's not the it's not the best plan, but knowing the situation. Uh, from experience, up on, in that particular uh, location, uh, it, it has a it has a chance to to um, kill the loitering not kill the loiter but abate the loitering problem. But it also has the opportunity to decrease the amount of people that are going to pull into Starbucks because they'll come another half mile forward right. and get their coffee here if they know it's going to be faster or shorter or whatever. And then and I think the Barrel and Vine don't they serve coffee too? We do. Yeah, so I mean, it's like you were saying, you pull up and get your coffee, or you get your gas, get your coffee, you walk in, and you know, Tim Hortons can do their own thing back there. So I, 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 I say, I don't think there is an ideal solution to this, but based on the shape of the property, the size of the property, and the business in that area, I, I think it's a, I think it's a situation that could work. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so since I uh, decided to do a little impromptu research on the times that seems to have distracted the conversation a bit, let me um, uh, make sure that uh, I say again, that was for a full service, Tim Hortons. It was associated with a number of different things. And, you know, I had a marketing professor tell me one time that the average person, well, I won't say it because apparently some people might take it wrong, but uh, the average person has one breast and one testicle that tells you absolutely nothing about the person probably sitting next to you. So we can't always look at averages the right way, you know? Um, so, but what I see here is that even if it takes three minutes, which seems like on the high end, uh, and, and at the risk of offending the chair, um, you know, my calculation, so you move three cars in three minutes. So that would be a minute a car. You have that. That's 30 a car. There's some posts here that say the target for a, a, a single transaction is 36 seconds. You know, that's their target at Taco Bell and Tim Hortons. So I think the stack would probably move, but I think you get to that point of no return. And what might be interesting is, and I don't know if we've ever done it, but to have a sign, you know, not a buyer beware sign, but hey, there's no escape lane. Uh, after this point. So if you know you enter here, you're going to have to sit through somebody ordering and complaining that their caramel, there's not enough caramel in their, you know, latte or something like that, or they're, they're, there's not enough cream in their coffee, you might have to wait an extra minute or two. And I've been in these before in other cities, and sometimes it's frustrating. Uh, the person in front of you paying with pennies, whatever it may be. But if there's a little bit of a, a sign there to warn the customers to say, hey, you know, you no turn around past this point, uh, so they understand and have clarity that they're getting into a singular lane, might be a little helpful. But I, I don't see the queuing with this type of service to be significant unless the operations are absolutely atrocious, of which it would be out of business within a month and it would be a moot point anyways. Right. Commissioner Douglas. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, there was an article I read uh, within the past two weeks, might have been in the New York Times, about the um, growth in drive-through business. Um, it's, here, it's here to stay. Um, with the article made clear, I mean, COVID drove that. And, and as much as we may wish that people didn't sit idling in their cars um, waiting to get their coffee, that's a business model that, that exists and there are businesses that exist to serve it. So I'm not inclined to deny a drive-through business for social reasons. 
Um, I'm inclined to think that the people who um, shop here are going to be regulars. Um, I, I don't. I, I think it's going to be rare that anybody gets surprised by the amount of time it takes for them to get their coffee. I also said, and I, I speculated about this earlier, that the you know savvy customers will come up Hunter and turn right into the alley and queue all the way down the the back of the alley. Um, uh, Mr. Casada offered a, a, a voiced a thought that I I could also embrace, and that is to partially block. Chester um, with signs that say exit only, no entry traffic. Um, and by leaving that open, you make it possible for people who live on Chester to walk onto the site to go to the convenience store rather than going all the way up to Woodward. Um, so I'm, uh, I was initially skeptical about the lack of uh, ability to escape, but I'm, I'm moderating my views and, and I continue to um, enjoy the discussion we're having here about um, uh, how we solve that or if we need to solve it. Other comments by the commissioners? Mr. Esby. Yeah, to sort of piggyback on Ms. Douglas's point, I mean, Mr. Cowan, have, have you entertained the idea of making that last southernmost part of the alleyway one way only, curved and directionalized to feed onto Woodward only and not feed into the neighborhood? to create the walkability that she alluded to and so forth? Yeah, uh, first I, I want to point out that uh, the, the master plan in section 5.1, and I'm reading this, use alleys as a second access to buildings providing parking and pedestrian ways. That's, I didn't make this up. This is, says it right there. It's exactly what we're asking for. And yes, we have no problem with uh, the suggestion that Mr. Cassad has made, and I think uh, Commissioner Douglas and, and, and you are now men mentioning, of uh, allowing an uh, exit only, no entrance, and that would uh, be helpful to the folks on Chester. Quite frankly, the folks on Chester and Hunter, as well as other streets are, uh, that come down, do come through the walk through the alleyway. It's already walkable from that perspective um, and has been. So I, we wouldn't have any objection to um, that modification. Are there other? And by the way, we would also put the, the, the last chance sign up. I think that's a good idea. This is your last chance. After that, you're committed. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, do we have uh, is that a hand? It was a hand. Um, I, I, I'm going to segue a little bit here. The issue of outdoor storage. Yes. At some point, when do we want to address that now? Do we, uh, we can address it? it right this minute. Okie dokie. Um, the previous uh, special land use denied outdoor storage of everything, and yet there are things that gas stations sell that should be stored outdoors propane mm -hmm. tanks and firewood. Um, and, and it makes sense to put your ice machine out there also. So I might be inclined to um, uh, allow them to store those items outside. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna just go ahead and respond to this because I believe I was on the Planning Commission and, and my recollection, anybody can tell me I'm wrong, was that the request by the petitioner was we want three signs on two sides of the building. And we said in exchange for that, you can't put any signs in the windows. I didn't remember saying we couldn't have any uh, outdoor displays. I don't actually remember that, but if that's what we said, we said. So it is slightly disappointing that they went ahead and did that. However, I've been by the building and for the most part they do not put signs in the window, especially on Woodward. I don't think I've ever seen a sign in the window. I also want to say this partic uh, particular petitioner has done a terrific job keeping their light on their own property, which is an issue with me, as you know. And so I would uh, be inclined to say, okay, there, this property owner and tenant uh, uh, play ball with us and they for the most part they do what they say. I also understand the market pressure to say everybody, I don't, I don't think selling wood was a thing back when we approved this. Now it's become a thing, everybody's selling wood. I don't think that was around before. So <laughs> the market pressures have changed and so I sort of sympathize that oh we got to keep up with the other gas stations. I wish they would have come and asked for this uh, affirmatively. Uh, when they did it, but nonetheless, I think we do, I want to remind the, the panel here that we have to have separate 
motions. We've been recommended that by Mr. Murphy. So one of the motions is going to be on the outdoor displays all by itself. And then the next one, will, that would be the special land use. Should they even be allowed? And then we're going to have to have a site plan to say where they're going to be allowed. We'll have to prove that. And then we have the special land use for the coffee and the site plan for that. So there's really four votes here. So we can start wherever you want. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, the reason why they're selling ice and wood and propane and like definitely propane and wood to Commissioner Douglas's point makes sense to be outside uh, is because uh, it's been established even by the neighbor's signatures that this is a oasis for them of convenience. It has the things that they need where if you want to promote walkability, uh, you make the things that people want to buy closer to their homes. And so if they uh, need to grab a bag of ice or they need to grab a propane tank, it's, it's nearby. They're not driving you know, three miles to go get a propane tank. They're driving, you know, 300 meters to put it in you the back. You ever carried a propane tank? Never mind, go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, not necessarily walking, but still not having to drive down yes. to, you know, um, somewhere further away uh, to, to get those things. And, and some of those things are a little bit heavier, to your point, uh, Chairman. Uh, and so having them outside of the store to be able to load into the car, I, I hate, I, I was at a store uh, recently up north and I had to lug, I didn't grab a cart because was, it was a busy time, 4th of July, there's no carts and I'm carrying bags of ice uh, through the grocery store as opposed to straight to my car out of the parking lot. So I do think that uh, there's a reason why they carry that stuff. It's because the neighborhood wants it, the people in the vicinity want it, and they are kind of items that should be stored outside, at least a number of them, and they're a little bit bulkier that need to have a direct path to people's trunk. And it encourages them to, to shop local versus going further away from their neighborhood uh, to procure these items. So I don't think it looks unkempt. Uh, I can see on Google Maps it looks nice to me. Um, I would have no problem supporting uh, that change. Are you making a motion or are you just talking about it? I'll make a motion to that effect. Okay, so there's a motion uh, by uh, Mayor Fournier to approve the special land use for the outdoor displays. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Oh, it's a, I'm going to call Mr. Ellison. Okay, uh, is there further discussion of this issue? Remember, this is just the special land use. Ms. Beaky. I appreciate the further clarification about previous discussions as well as these explanations, and um, I can support this special land use. Okay. Further discussions on the special land use for the outdoor display motion? Okay. Seeing, uh, wait a minute. Is there a, there's a public hearing on this, yes? Yes. We had one. Oh, I, we had one. Oh, we had one, yes. Okay. It's for everything. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to call for the vote on the motion to approve the special land use for the outdoor display. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. So you, the special land use for the outdoor displays has been approved. Now, is there a further motion? Uh, Mr. Murphy, I'm going to ask for your advice. Would you, uh, it seems to me that uh, we might want to go to the next special land use before we move on to the site, site sure. plan. That's appropriate. Okay. So the next item here is, are we, is, is somebody going to make a motion regarding the special land use for the coffee service? Mr. Ellis. Make the motion for the special land use for the coffee service. All right. Um, is there a second? Second by Commissioner Douglas. So we have a motion to approve a special land use for the drive-up coffee service. Um, is there further discussion of this? Seeing none, I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. One no, five yeses, motion passes, and so the special land use for the coffee, coffee service is approved. Mr. Murphy, going back to you, can you just point out to us the um, site plan for the outdoor displays and uh, like your thoughts on it? Page nine. I'm sorry, you're looking for me to display it on the screen? Yes, and, and I don't know that you addressed this in your, uh, in your preview here. Do you, does, the, does the department have any concerns uh, about the plan that's been proposed? And yes, I'd like to see it on the screen so we know what we're talking about. Yes, uh, so I'll zoom in on it a little bit. It's at the front entrance, which is on the south side of the building. And the, we did visit the site, and we, as always, 
<coughs> excuse me, consult with different departments, including the fire marshal. The fire marshal had concern over the existing items and their proximity to each other based on uh, flammability and explosiveness. So the petitioner has modified the drawing to show where they would put specific items in compliance with the fire code and also not blocking any barrier-free parking spaces or barrier-free entrance to the building itself. So there's, we'll say there's been some concern over that and what's shown on the drawing is compliant. Okay, and you're talking about the site plan uh, uh, drawing and is the, is the Locations of the it looks like four different uh, four different uh, outdoor display items is that now the what we're going to vote on and do you have any concerns about it? No, I don't have any concerns and it would be appropriate to, to vote on it. Sure. Okay. All right. So um, coming back to the side of the table, does anybody have any further uh, comments? Questions for the petitioner, Mr. Murphy? Comments between each other or motion on the site plan for the outdoor displays as shown on, on, on our packet? Mr. Murphy. Mr. Cassad, I'll take a stab at this one. And Mr. Murphy, correct me if I get this wrong. I'll move the site plan 231117 with the seven contingencies A, 1 through D. Two, three, four, five, six, and seven, as listed and stated by the planning department. Oh. Is it Don't eight through eleven apply to the coffee house? Let's bring that up on the screen. Yeah. It was a very precise motion, so yeah, it I threw us off. <laughs> I we were, I we were about the storage. There's a break in in. Uh, in what Mr. Esbury is referring to, the suggested motion, there, there is a clear delineation here. So yes, that is correct. These relate to these relate to the outdoor displays and the approved previously what was previously approved on the landscape plan in the, the last go round in two, 2015. They would be required to make those modifications and implement those items. Okay. Would it be, uh, could I just ask you to re repeat your motion, do you mind? I'm not sure I can, and I got a, I got a <laughs> thumbs up from the city attorney, so I should just keep my mouth shut. Well, I'm going to let him do it. <laughs> no, so I'm making a motion for a site plan 231117. With the contingencies A through D, plus two, three, four, five, six, and seven, as listed and stated by the planning department. All right, thank you. Is there a second? Or was there already a second? Is there a second? For Commissioner Douglas. Douglas. Okay. She got it. Okay, so we have a second. Uh, further discussion of the. Yeah, the discussion. question I, are we moving the entire site plan, which is the coffee house and the outdoor storage? No. No, because this is the, I'm looking at the I'm looking at this this um, page here and it's got item A, which is the coffee shop, and item B, which is the outdoor storage. So if you're moving the resolution or the uh, recommendation from the community development department on page uh, whatever page this is, the opening page. No, I'm on page nine, feeding into page ten, that where the planning department specifically listed the seven contingencies for the, the outdoor storage. Okay. And so, so this is just the outdoor storage. The okay. Yes. And I'm going to say that's probably appropriate given the conversation that's occurred mm -hmm. with regard to potential modifications that you may or may not include in a motion regarding the alley. Okay. So then, yeah, with this motion, we're just kind of tying up everything with the outdoor storage is what the attempt here is, um, Mr. Asbury, and then we'll handle the um, site shop. plan and use um, for the drive-through uh, separately, and you're just dissecting those, and one through seven clearly is um, with the outdoor storage. Okay, that makes sense to me then. Okay. All right. That's clarity. Good one. All right, is there further discussion of the uh, site plan for the outdoor display motion? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to call for the vote. Again, just to be clear, this is to approve the site plan for the outdoor displays for this property, including the contingencies uh, 1, A through D, and all the way through 7. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes, so the site plan is approved. Now, the last remaining issue for this item is the site plan for the drive-up coffee service. Comments, motions? 
Yes, sir. For the purposes of discussions, I'm prepared to make a motion to approve site plan 2311-17 as it regards the coffee house with items 8, 9, and 10 as listed and stated by the planning department and with item 11 being modified to indicate the alleyway feeding Chester Road turns into a one-way feeding only toward the west end of the street so it doesn't feed into the neighborhood, it feeds Woodward only. All right, the, um, the motion is to approve the site plan for the drive-up coffee service with contingencies 8, 9, and 10, but number 11 is modified that, uh, is that that's going to be modified to feed Woodward only and uh, is that based on approval of the planning department? That's based on my motion, but if we have a second, we can discuss it. If we come up with a better solution, I'm all ears. I just want to get the ball rolling. There's discussion, I'll support it. Okay, second, second by it's, it's, Mr. Ellison. It sounds like you're basically taking item 11 and, and including item 11, which is the Chester Road right away, and modifying it with the right turn only. Is that what you're saying? Fundamentally correct. One way right turn only. One way right turn only. So it only feeds Woodward, not the neighborhood. Yeah, and then, so and then, they, and then so they, they let me add, let me modify my motion to state and properly sign to indicate that you cannot turn in okay. into that alley from Chester. So this is this is this is giving us our escape lane out of the drive-through and go south on the alley and turn right onto Chester to get to Woodward. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm good with that. Okay. Um, all right. I'll make a comment. I'm good with the concept. I'm concerned. And I'm a little nervous about not seeing the plan. In other words, we're leaving this as a, a, a problem to be solved. And uh, until the engineer puts pen to paper and comes up with a design, I'm a little bit concerned. Um, I, I don't know what anybody else thinks, but I'd, I'd love to have them redesign this and come back um, and give us, give us an opportunity to see what they're really going to do. Well, then let's ask the question differently. Mr. Murphy, are you comfortable with that motion? Do you feel you can handle it administratively, or would you rather kick it back to us? It'll be handled administratively in the sense that the petitioner will provide revised drawings to us, and we will help them make application to the city commission for a modification to the existing license agreement to use the alley in the manner in which you've stated versus what they've shown on the drawing. So before it goes to the city commission for modified license agreement request, they will have to modify the drawing to illustrate what you've stated in your contingency. Right. And at that point, we'll have several fresh sets, sets of eyes to look at it. Mm -hmm. Well, five. <coughs> five. <laughs> and two tired sets. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I would only add as a word of caution, whatever we put on the um, uh, the exit there on, on the alley heading south to say head south and then to Chester, I'm tripping over my tongue. What I'm trying to get at is watch your design so that we don't go too far out into Chester Street that's going to impede traffic flow on Chester. Because I've seen too many of these right turn only bump outs we put on the streets that, that force people to wait for someone to go by before they can go in. So whatever you put in there, make sure it allows for two-way traffic on Chester Street. Um, all right. Speaking. I'll, I'll just comment that I'm not going to support just based on my previous comments. All right, thank you. Um, I, I am leaning towards support, I'm still nervous, is all I can say. I can make my decision here in the next 10 seconds, but I, I w personally would rather see a, a site plan come back. I don't think that the solution, uh, even though uh, I was the one who brought it up, I don't think it's necessarily, uh, I think you need to have, the engineer needs to spend some time with it and think about it and come up with a plan. and. I guess if we don't want to see it again, and we think uh, Mr. Murphy and his crew uh, can can uh, do what needs to be done, then that's great. But uh, anyways, I, I'm still a little concerned about that. But Mr. Elson. I'll only add that that you know we've done this many times before with taking back to the planning department, who are our experts, mm -hmm. who will work with the petitioner, who has their own experts, who are engineers or designers or whatever. And, and and come to something as long as we state our intent is to have that 
right turn only out there. And as I said, just make sure the traffic goes. Trust them to put it, because otherwise they're gonna draw it, bring it back to here, and, and this the county worker, and this mayor, and that lawyer, and, and, and whoever is going to make a decision of whether the engineers did it right. I'd rather just let them come up with a plan that follows our direction and it'll give them the ability to prove it. I appreciate it. Any, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, and I'll just add, there's very limited space and ability to do anything really creative there. I think that um, when you start measuring it out and applying the engineering standards, uh, that between the petitioner's engineering team and our engineering team, there's probably just gonna be a singular option that's possible there uh, that wouldn't require you know, some sort of unique variant for us to approve. So I would put, in this particular case, I hear what you're saying, Chairman, in this particular case, I, I'd say, based on what we've suggested, it's gonna be a straight shot, limited what you can do there, and therefore, um, you know, I put the judgment that they'll apply the engineering standards to make it happen, and it'll be what it will be. All right, thank you. Um, other uh, comments on this, questions? No, we do have a motion on the table. The motion on the table was, uh, by Mr. Esbury to approve the site plan for the drive up coffee service with contingencies 8, 9, and 10 as stated by the planning department. And uh, instead of number uh, 11, uh, the direction is for the engineering department to work with the petitioner to redesign uh, the uh, area there exiting onto Chester Road to make it uh, serving or uh, feeding Woodward only. That's the motion. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Or if not, I'm going to call for the vote. All right. All those in favor of the stated motion, say aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, no. Okay. We have five yeses, one no. Motion is carried. The site plan is approved with the contingencies and the direction to modify the plan. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with your Timmies. The, the only question I had is, uh, maybe it's for through you to Mr. Murphy, but we're all set to go to the zoning board, Mr. Murphy, for our next our next stop. Okay, with this approval, thank you very much. Just right, wanted to make you. check that. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Next order of business is the special land use and a site plan to renovate uh, existing motel at eight eleven. Oh, Mr. Mr. Casada, I was just going to ask you the the feeling of the board because it looks like we have a pretty packed house here, and I'm sure the next debate will be lively. Do we want to move along to the site bar to the sign variance, knock that out, and then uh, spend the ample time needed to take care of the uh, item E3? I thought you were going to ask for a bathroom break, but um, I think that's a fairly good suggestion. Uh, what do the other commissioners think about make that? Motion. I'll make that as a motion. Okay. I'll second. All right, the motion is to alter the uh, sequence of the agenda to bring the sign variance SV23-1103 uh, forward and deal with that prior to the 811 East 11 mile. And it, was there a second on that? Yes, me. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, hearing none, the motion passes. Is the petitioner here? I just make sure they didn't, they're here. For the sign variance, is the sign variance petition? They are. Okay, so Mr. Murphy, why don't you give us an introduction before we call the petitioner up? Yes, thank you. You're keeping me on my toes. <laughs> <laughs> Great day to have a cold, my friend. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the exist the site. The existing site is on North Main Street, just south of 13 Mile Road, and the petitioner is proposing to reface the existing sign that you see shown on the screen in front of you. It's a projecting sign that measures just under 11 square feet, and it projects out 36 inches from the building. Uh, it also extends, the, the building uh, is on the north property line, and, and you can see if I zoom in ever so slightly that the, this sign is a little thicker, and it extends beyond the wall, so it extends beyond the face of the plane of the wall. Uh, this is in sign area two under the city sign ordinance, which prohibits 
projecting signs and it prohibits uh, signs from ex extending beyond that plane of the building. So the petitioner is seeking a variance in order to reface the existing sign, not to structurally modify it, but to change out the face plate to reflect the business that uh, they've established at that location and perhaps they're here to address any uh, questions that you might have. All right, I have a question for you. So, so this sign, this sign frame was existing. Uh, it was a different business, and and so all we're doing is refacing it. Is there any other changes being made? No, they're not proposing any additional changes based on the building division's review of their sign permit application. All right, thank you. All right, is a question? A question, uh, Mr. Murphy. The um, the business has planters that come out from the front of the building to the sidewalk. Does the sign extend, is it deeper than the planters? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no, it, it, it's not. It doesn't extend past the property line, uh, it's closer to the sidewalk. It, so it does not hang out over the public right away, no. Thank you. All right. Um, any other questions before we call up the petitioner? Okay, is the petitioner here? Please come forward, introduce yourself, and tell us why you're entitled to the relief you seek. Good evening. Uh, my name is Larry with uh, Sinorama, and <clears throat> we're here to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> Just look to reface the existing sign. As you can see, there's really no place to put another sign on the building um, that traffic can see going both directions. So that's why we're looking to just, all we're gonna do is take out the old Lexan and put new Lexan faces in. All right, are there questions for the petitioner? All right, uh, here, now why don't you just stay there just in case. Um, so is the, is, the, is the business open and running? Oh, why don't you step up and for the record introduce yourself, state your name please. Hello, I'm Diamond Parker, the owner of the Diamond Experience, uh, which is the building that we are using for the sign. And um, basically, I've been in there since May. Um, I have not, I actually covered the sign up. It's completely white because I had a grand opening and I didn't want the previous owner's sign to be on there because it's not my sign. And so now that I have covered it in white, it's basically like a non-zone, like no one is coming. Uh, it's no, you really can't tell that the business is open. So for the last six months, I've been drowning right now. And I just feel like I really, really need the sign. It's already, it's everything, it's already working. It doesn't come past the flowers. It's uh, shorter than that. Um, and it's just pre-existing. I just want to change it into my logo with my number so people know I'm open. It doesn't even look open. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. is, the, is the sign lit? Um, I, I was asking for a lit sign. I'm not sure what it was already previously. I'm not sure what it was already. I suspect it was. Oh, okay. So, okay. But the, you're, I guess I should, this is for the, the sign contractor. So if, if we grant the variance, there's going to be a refacing, and this is going to uh, light up at night. I do believe it's an illuminated sign, yes. Okay, just to clarify. Okay, any other questions for the petitioner? Well, no, no questions, just comments. Statement? Yeah, I mean, this doesn't seem like a hairy situation. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, sorry, one dad joke per night, I'm allowed. <laughs> um, I used to be three, but Commissioner Douglas got after me, so now I've negotiated one. Um, I mean, I see, you know, we talk about hardships and we talk about unique properties. That's why we have variances. That's why we have the ability to look as a sign variance board as well as the planning commission uh, where things make sense. If this was a brand new sign in the middle of downtown uh, doing something kind of crazy, you know, that's a different situation than here when you have the physical layout of the adjacent buildings, an existing format here. We're popping it in and out. We're not creating anything new. Um, 
and it doesn't extend into the right of way, uh, I don't have a, uh, a, an issue allowing the, the panels to be uh, flopped in and out given um, the unique, um, I'll say, well, I don't want to say geography, but you know, the uniqueness of the, the situation where the building's placed. Is motion? Sure, I'll, no, oh, wait, Ms. Beaky. Okay. Oh, that's okay, you can go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll move uh, for approval of the uh, request for variance. Is there a second? Commissioner Douglas, so we have a second. All right, the motion is to approve the request for the uh, variance. Uh, any other comments? I, there is. Ms. Beaky. I was just going to comment that um, looking at this type of sign and the fact that it doesn't protrude over the sidewalk where people walk, we often talk about it being over the head. Um, I was immediately inclined to approve this redo. I might be slightly concerned that it's going to be lit. I mean, the old one maybe wasn't lit, but I'm still inclined to uh, support this. Yeah, my, my fellows here know that I'm, I'm deaf on projecting signs, um, mm -hmm. and yet, uh, as the mayor pointed out, it doesn't project over the public right-of-way, um, and as you look at the facade of the building, there is like no place to put a sign on mm -hmm. the front of that building, um, and so I'm, I'm going to support the motion. All right, thank you. Um, we certainly, uh, yes, we want our businesses to succeed, and we don't want to cause... Uh, you know, we have to balance uh, the ordinance uh, against reality, and so I'm going to support the motion. Uh, I do think, just for the record, that I think that this is a variance, uh, and, and the rest of the building is a difficult building, but um, anyways, never mind. I, I, think, I think there could be an improvement, but it would take cost, it would take des a design and money, and, and so I'm going to support this motion. I think it's a reasonable request by this business owner. All right, is there any uh, other discussion? All right, hearing none, I'm going to call for the vote. All in favor of the sign uh, variances requested, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, congratulations. Sign variance is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, <laughs> you already had your... <laughs> Figured I'd get it out of the way. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, we're now moving backwards to the uh, Special Land Use and Site Plan. This is uh, SP 23-11-18 for 811 East, uh, 11 Mile. Mr. Murphy, can you introduce us to this request? Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, I uh, should disclose that the manager of the hotel in question um, is my personal fitness trainer. Um, I do not financially benefit from that relationship. In fact, I gain pain from that relationship. Um, uh, and I do feel that I can, I can decide objectively on this despite that relationship. Um, but I invite dissent from my fellow commissioners. Thank you for making the disclosure, which is a voluntary thing. Um, Mr. Ellison. It's part of the problem in a small community like ours is we know everybody. And I've known a number of people involved in this project because of my experience of working with them and just because we know them in the, in the community. But but I, I do have the ability to look at whatever is in front of us uh, reasonably and, and, and obliquely and, and um, uh, be able to judge based on what's on the drawings as opposed to who's presenting it. All right. Thank you. Mr. If, if I may offer some guidance to the Planning Commission then? Please. So as properly uh, raised by uh, the Commissioner, um, so before casting a vote on member, which a uh, state law requires that a member uh, might have a conflict, shall, be, shall disclose that potential conflict. A conflict is defined as the Planning Commission member having an immediate family member that is involved in the request which this Planning Commission is asked to decide, uh, or the Planning Commissioner has a business or pecuniary interest in the property uh, which is subject of the request, or a business or financial or pecuniary interest in the applicant's company, agency, or agent association. Uh, whether the Planning Commission member owns or has a financial interest in any property immediately adjoining the property involved in the request. Uh, so those are the things that you would um, determine whether or not there is a potential conflict of interest here based on what's been disclosed. Uh, 
I don't find any of those have been satisfied uh, to establish a conflict, but as an outline for this board to determine whether or not um, that that poses a conflict uh, with regard to this, that would be your decision to move forward. Any uh, comments from the commissioners? Well, I'll just make a comment. I don't, I don't think it's a conflict. Uh, I think I appreciate what I would consider voluntary. I said it was voluntary because the, the, com the commissioners have to look at the statute and they know what their relationship is. I looked at this. Uh, I don't see a conflict, but I think it's uh, the right thing to do for Commissioner Douglas to make the disclosure, even though it's not a conflict, uh, just to make sure the air is as clear as possible. So I appreciate it. All right. Any other comments? All right. Very good. Now, uh, back to the action here. So uh, we're at special land use uh, and site plan for 811 East 11 Mile. Uh, Mr. Murphy, why don't you give us an intro to this? Certainly. This site is a few blocks east of us. It's in the city's neighborhood business zoning district. And it's, uh, as, as everyone knows, it's an existing motel. Motels are neither a permitted nor a special land use in the neighborhood business zoning district. So the building and the use that are there currently are non-conforming. And the petitioner is looking to convert portions of the building and the parking lot into, uh, I'll hover over them and then we can look at the floor plan more specifically. But on the south side, excuse me, on the west side of the property, the petitioner is proposing to convert uh, a portion of the building which is storage right now to a bar lounge area with alcohol and live entertainment and a dance floor and then adjacent to that where there is a uh, you'll see a, a white car or vehicle that I'll hover over they're looking to create an outdoor an adjacent outdoor lounge area with alcohol as well there is a masonry wall that is along the south side of the property along Potter Avenue. But the area at that corner, which is adjacent to the, uh, the single family home um, along Potter Avenue, there's a wood fence and the petitioner can describe uh, that there's an adjacent tree to it and they feel as though it's appropriate to keep the existing wooden fence as opposed to uh, putting in place a masonry wall, which may help deflect some of the noise from the outdoor lounge area. They're also looking to modify the lobby area, which again, I'll hover over it, is along, is along 11 Mile Road. And that area would include a lounge area for uh, distribution of alcohol and, live and with live entertainment. And they're looking to modify the east end of the building to create a, uh, a small diner area and that certainly would have alcohol as well. It would have some seating that we can look at the site plan and a Google Street View image, but seating in front of the building directly adjacent to 11 Mile Road, but not differentiated. So not separated by any type of a railing or anything separated from the sidewalk area. And then of course they're looking for approval for the outdoor in the middle of the parking lot, an outdoor area, social area for uh, with alcohol as, as well. And the, that portion, the middle of the parking lot, that's been used in the in the recent past for outdoor concerts and social gatherings. Uh, they they've done that without zoning approval. The petitioner can express the pathway that, that they obtained in order to have those activities, but they didn't receive zoning approval in order to establish what is currently there. The zoning ordinance does identify or call out particular uses, and there is no such use for outdoor lounges or concerts areas, but there's a provision in the ordinance that does allow staff the discretion of determining the most closely associated use that is identified in, in the zoning ordinance. And so we've taken uh, the, we made the determination that the proposed outdoor lounge areas are most similar to an outdoor cafe. And outdoor cafes are 
a special land use, just like the distribution of alcohol is a special land use in the neighborhood business zoning district. So while the hotel itself, the motel is not a permitted nor special land use, it's again, it's non-conforming, but the components that they want to add to it are special land use elements. So they are seeking special land use approval, and of course they would be expanding or altering that non-conforming use in a manner which extends its longevity, um, alters it in a way which, in, which increases it to continue. And the petitioner, they can propose how they intend to operate at the site. I'm going to go to the site plan now, and I believe that'll help our conversation with identifying the areas in which patrons will be able to purchase alcohol and then how they're able to move about the property. And that's something that has, uh, that, that staff, planning staff, and uh, the staff from the police department have some concerns over it. It's a, it's a unique approach that will be challenging, to say the least, to, um, to we'll say, patrol uh, and to, uh, to moderate. So someone would be, would be able to uh, consume, purchase and consume a drink on the uh, west side of the property in what's converted to the, a bar and a, and a dance floor and an entertainment area. Uh, and they would be limited to carrying their beverage on the ground floor and the elevated walkway. They wouldn't be able to walk, we'll say, through the parking lot, down the sidewalk, and to other portions of the site which have a indoor or an outdoor lounge component. And in the middle of the parking lot, the outdoor assembly area, um, people wouldn't be able to, again, take a drink in a hand and simply walk across the parking lot to it. Someone would, a patron would have to hand that drink off to an employee. The employee would have to carry it for them to, the, to those areas. Um, so it really adds some complexity uh, to what they're proposing. <clears throat> the existing non-conforming hotel and the proposed uses, they require a total of 143 parking spaces. And the proposed site plan identifies 57 parking spaces, so they certainly don't meet the minimum required uh, off-street parking. They are proposing to, and I'm gonna show Google Street View image to give you an understanding of what it looks like now. Currently there's a dumpster that sits on the, in the parking lot on the west side of the property and it's accessed by the drive approach or, or curb cut along 11 mile road. You can see it sitting out in the middle of the parking lot. They're proposing to enclose that, appropriately enclose that dumpster, but they would have a separate drive approach or curb cut along Potter Avenue to, to access that. So a refuse vehicle would pull in off of Potter. The only thing they would be able to get to is that dumpster enclosure. They would then have to back across the, the sidewalk out along Potter Avenue and then proceed further north. Um, the planning division and the engineering division of the community development department have a strong objection to to that proposal, and that's been expressed to the to the petitioner from the beginning. That it's that's a unique approach. We don't see that in town uh, on a regular basis. They do have the ability to have the enclosure on their property and have it accessed like they currently do with a refuse vehicle from a private company from the drive approach on 11 mile. While it's not ideal uh, in its maneuverability, we think to place that burden upon the business across uh, Potter and certainly the residents on Potter with an additional curb cut and removing on-street parking uh, is unnecessary. So you're being asked to, pro to, to make a recommendation on the special land use that's being requested. And this use as identified in the zoning ordinance 
because there is n there currently the petitioner does not have a liquor license they will be approaching the city commission and asking for approval to ha establish a liquor license at this location that would be accompanied by what we refer to as a plan of operation a written description of how they propose to operate and of course a set of drawings that identify the location where alcohol will be consumed and how uh, the site will function this use as identified in the zoning ordinance because there is no current alcohol sale on the property, it's a special land use that y the Planning Commission is making a recommendation to the City Commission to approve or deny this request. And we'll say all of that gets packaged up and sent to the City Commission. So the site plan uh, that you approve gets sent on to the city commission and the city commission will consider it at the exact same time that they consider the liquor license plan of operation from the petitioner and the city commission will have the final say on the special site plan and special land use approval for this proposal there's also uniqueness in the zoning ordinance amendment that occurred uh, i think it was probably early this year or late last year in that the City Commission, in this scenario, the way it's worded in the zoning ordinance, the City Commission has the ability to allow deviations from the zoning ordinance. So I identified that the petitioner does not provide enough on street, excuse me, off street parking. They do not provide enough parking for the use hotel and then the addition of the lounge areas, the bar areas. So they do not provide enough parking. They do not go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. As it's specifically worded in the zoning ordinance, the City Commission has the ability to grant that deviation from zoning ordinance standards, such as off-street parking. So you're making a recommendation, approval or denial, or something in, in between, uh, that gets passed on to the City Commission. And again, they will consider it and be the ultimate determination of site plan and special land use approval at the same time that they consider the petitioner's request for a liquor license plan of operation. And that's a similar pathway as we have established for marijuana establishments. All right, uh, Commissioner Douglas. Yes, thank you, I have several questions. Um, the um, entertainment, the, the music, the concerts that they put on on Saturday nights, full disclosure, I've been to a couple of them, um, but the control of those is not really part of our discussion here. Um, whether or not they're allowed to have live music, how it's regulated, clearly needs to be addressed by other departments in the city, but is that under our purview? I have indicated that the, the outdoor lounge areas are not a specified use in the zoning ordinance. You can't go through it and find that, those, that particular wording. So we had applied the most similar use as an outdoor cafe. If you look at the outdoor cafe standards, which are very specific special land use standards, it does explicitly prohibit uh, outdoor uh, live music entertainment or even um, uh, piped in music over audio. So the city commission does have the final say in that deviation as well as whether that can be identified in the petitioner's uh, liquor license plan of operation. And they, they can express to you that, that they were operating under a special event permit, but it's it's certainly appropriate that they identify that in the plan of operation that gets presented to the city commission. And special event permits are really intended to be one time only event. Uh, obviously, the concerts were occurring on a frequent basis. The most appropriate way of addressing that and whether they have uh, music, live entertainment, speakers, what have you, is all associated with city commission's purview to approve the liquor license plan of operation. Okay, good, thank you. Um, um, the, the dumpster and the, the West parking lot. So how does that, so right now, how does uh, the, the, the truck come in, access it, and leave the property? 
I think that's a good question for the petitioner. Um, there's, there's no other, they, they can express that, I think, in, in greater depth. But I, I'll point out the fact that there, there is no curb cut along Potter. So they have to either back all the way out onto 11 Mile or they have to presume there are no cars there and back into those empty parking spaces and turn out and head face, face forward onto 11 Mile. There's also a separate dumpster uh, that's shown on the drawing adjacent to the area that they want to convert to the diner on the east side of the property. Uh, okay, and then another question, and, and again, this may only be relevant to a liquor license, but um, guests who stay in hotels uh, will buy packaged liquor um, to consume in their rooms. Um, is that, what parts of the property are controlled by the liquor license, and how does that, if at all, affect Package liquor consumption in rooms? That I don't know the answer to. I'm certain that the police department does, and I know that the petitioner has uh, expert legal counsel that they've retained that I'm certain knows the answer to that question for you. I look forward to hearing that. Uh, okay, thank you. Yes. All right, Ms. Biggie. Just a quick clarification with, with regard to the non conforming use of the actual place as a, as a hotel or motel. That is because prior, th that it was already in place when the neighborhood business went into place and it therefore it's cons it just been consistent over the years, is that why it, it's non-conforming in that neighborhood? In 2001 there were significant changes done to the city zoning ordinance as we came out of the 1999 master plan. Mm. Uh, and one of those elements was to create different zoning districts and before it was, this site was in what was a light commercial zoning district. I don't recall whether that, that was many years ago, I don't recall mm -hmm. that luckily, uh, whether that was one of the uses that was explicitly called out as either a permitted or a special land use, but certainly the the current zoning district does not allow for, for that. Um, obviously the petitioner had purchased the hotel and renovated it, um, so it, it's allowed to have cosmetic updates, yep. but this certainly goes above and, and beyond cosmetic updates and adds to the longevity of keeping n a non-conforming use. Mm -hmm. And the intent of identifying non-conforming uses is to not perpetuate their longevity, but to eventually establish a use that is conforming. Now the city commission will have the opportunity to determine whether they feel that it's appropriate or not for this uh, operation that had that additional aspect of alcohol and outdoor mm -hmm. space uh, and whether they think it's detrimental to the uh, uh, continuation of the hotel or not. That's an entirely different conversation for a city commission right. to have. I, I just wanted to clarify that it was probably already existing. Okay, thank you. Oh yes, it's been around since uh, I think 1956, okay. if I remember correctly. All right, any other questions for Mr. Murphy? I would just say I appreciate Commissioner Douglas' question. I, I also wanted to ask something similar and I just want to repeat it so I make sure I understand. There has been quite a bit of uh, discussion in some of the emails we've seen about the outdoor music, but we're, that's not part of the special land use here. That's something that the city commission will deal with. If we recommend that they would have uh, be able to serve alcohol as a special land use, then the city commission will decide what to do about the music aspect of it. Ultimately, they will. I, if you, if you, as indiv uh, individuals and collectively as a planning commission, think it's appropriate to add specific language with regard to outdoor entertainment, I think it's entirely in your purview to make that recommendation to the city commission. Yes. They'll, they'll be the ultimate decider of the special land use and the site plan approval and the liquor license plan of operation, which will have all those components. But uh, if yeah, you That's what I thought it, you said, that the plan of operation is the place where the outdoor music was going to be dealt with. Yes, but I think if you have an opinion and, and you want to make a recommendation to them, you're okay, welcome to do that. because this is just a recommendation. Correct. Okay. Either That's way, it's just a recommendation. Okay, very good. All right. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Murphy uh, before we call up the petitioner? All right. Uh, hearing none, I'd like to call the petitioner forward. Please uh, come up with your team, introduce yourself, and tell us why you're entitled to the relief you're seeking. Good evening. 
Again, Mr. Chairman and members of the Planning Commission, Dennis Cowan uh, with the firm Plunkett Cooney. Uh, with us here today is our team, first of all, our owner and sole owner uh, of the uh, uh, Hotel Royal Oak, Jim Razor. Uh, also our architect of record, uh, Jeff Klatt. And right here is our liquor license counsel, uh, the one and only Kelly Allen. We're glad to have her on the team. And uh, so, 10 years ago, when we talked about this property, we talked about vermin, undesirable users, police calls, and a property in total disrepair. There's been a complete transformation with a multi-million dollar investment that has become a destination for travelers and visitors to our community. Today we don't talk about the same things we talked about 10 years ago. We talk about a spur of economic development. We talk about place making. And we talk about bringing more visitors to Royal Oak. And it should not escape anyone's notice who is here tonight that as a result of the amazing transformation that took place under the leadership of Mr. Razor, that other businesses on 11 Mile have made improvements because this was a blight on the community. And if you even go into the neighborhoods, you'll see that there's been continual new building, even very close and near to this hotel after it has been renovated, and certainly even some homes before. But there's no denying the impact that this transformation has made. And uh, I thought it was a good question by, uh, by Commissioner uh, Beakey, um, or, or, or I'm sorry, uh, or whoever it was a question about, about the uh, you know, non-conforming status. Well, I will tell you in 2001, because I was the chairman of the master plan committee, we were trying to get rid of this hotel. So we were gonna make sure it was a non-conforming use. Well, if any of us had the vision that Jim Razor had to do what he has done and his team, that wouldn't have been the case. The motel would have certainly been an allowed use. But at that time, we were facing a battle primarily with hotels on Woodward, uh, most of them are gone. And those have all been replaced with much better improvements. So the point is, this has been a very responsible owner who has bettered not only his business, but helped better the community over the last 10 years. But that physical transformation was only the first phase. Along with that comes making sure you remain competitive and that you're servicing your guests with what their needs are. And it clearly has come to Mr. Razor's attention and at the request of the guest is to have alcohol service on the premises, which is very typical for lodging uh, facilities such as this one. And as a matter of fact, only several blocks away we have the Hyatt Place and they have liquor service. <coughs> And they have it in different parts of the building. And it's not unusual in this instance, if you go to any hotel, you'll have a lobby bar, you'll have maybe an outdoor component, and you'll have what's called the social area, which in most places would be around the swimming pool. But there is no swimming pool and there's no plans to have one. So, um, or skating rink, <laughs> for that matter. But the things that are being asked for in the context of the liquor license are normal and typical for this type of establishment. Uh, and with respect to the competitiveness, uh, the issue really isn't on the weekends. Mr. Razor will tell you that uh, things are pretty good on the weekends in terms of occupancy. It's the business traveler uh, during the week. And many times the business traveler uh, has had it with a long day of work and he or she just wants to you know, order a pizza, maybe walk down the street, get something to eat and finish it with a, a cocktail or adult beverage of, of their choice. So there, that is the uh, rationale and the basis for asking for a liquor license. But I would say to you, because of the way Mr. Razor has uh, operated, he certainly, uh, and the track record he has, um, he certainly, I think, has earned the opportunity to petition 
both to you and to the city to have a liquor license on premises and serve his customers and have a full uh, service uh, for them and the services they're used to at other lodging facilities. Of course, as required by law, we will have defined areas of service for alcoholic beverages and um, also be able for the first time to have uh, with the diner to have food service on the premises. Although I will tell you that uh, Mr. Razor has been very pleased to recommend and to send his customers and patrons <coughs> to places on 11 Mile and into downtown and has a special relationship with the Village Grill, which is right next door where uh, most folks have a, um, an opportunity to go for breakfast. Uh, I think also I want to emphasize that um, Mr. Razor has been a very good neighbor. He's responded to the neighborhood in many instances uh, for uh, different requests that they've had. The concerts that have been mentioned have been attended by many neighbors. Um, one neighbor told me kind of an interesting story that uh, she goes out and gardens on Saturday nights uh, after the music starts because she doesn't have to wear headphones or put the music on. Uh, so I think that's a, a one one person who's who's pleased with those concerts. Uh, in any event, in. Along those lines, uh, we did have a neighborhood meeting. We did send notice to, I believe it was all 125 people who uh, uh, received this notice uh, of the meeting this evening, and 15 showed up. And it was a very positive uh, uh, exchange, and there were some good suggestions, uh, which we are gonna incorporate into our plan. So we have, uh, I believe, a very good plan. Um, it is a plan that uh, will require um, good stewardship, and I think Mr. Razor has demonstrated that. There is challenges because this building is a place that was built 70 years ago, and we don't uh, perfectly fit into every aspect of the zoning code, so there is some relief that we're asking in different areas uh, with respect to the strict application of zoning, but we think it's merited because we really can't change the building. The building is as it is, and by the way, we're not changing the footprint of this building. All that's changing is uses in about 4,000 square feet of the building, uh, or what is there today. So I think that's important to note, and at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Klatt to walk you through the site plan. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening and thank you for your time. Jeff Klatt with Krieger Klatt Architects, 2120 East 11 Mile Road. And again, Mr. Murphy did an excellent job uh, explaining the architectural portion, so I'll attempt to be brief and not too redundant here. But as Mr. Cowan suggested, we are proposing three new service spaces within an existing building and some minor site improvements to support those. Uh, this is our site plan, as Mr. Murphy uh, indicated before. The large gray shape represents the existing footprint, and again, uh, we are not expanding that. So all this, all the new work will take place within that existing footprint. Uh, Mr. Murphy, is, is, do we have a site plan that shows the shading? I think this is the landscape plan. So again, Mr. Murphy pointed these out, but I'd like to be a bit redundant here. So again, this work will be over two phases. So phase one consists of work in the northwest corner, That'll be the new bar area and event space, complete with an outdoor patio. Uh, phase one also includes modifications to the existing lobby area, which will include a new bar space as well. And then phase two, that'll be the new uh, diner area. So that'll take place within existing storage areas of the building itself, new ADA restrooms, et cetera. And I'll jump into the plans in a minute. So again, the site impl improvements are, are pretty minor here. The existing curb cuts remain, existing navigation circulation around the site's the same, parking spaces are the same, pedestrian circulation's the same. It, it's all really, generally the same. Um, Mr. Murphy did touch upon the new trash enclosure, and believe me, we explored every location for that. We looked at the east side of the site. You really can't go there. We have you know, existing guest suites as well as entry points, so we can't place it there. So it really boils down to this being the ideal location. Uh, it was also noted that the staff would like to have uh, maneuverability through our site to that, but we, through discussions with the waste management team, it's very dangerous. That truck has to pull into the site, then has to back out to 11 miles. So they're not only concerned with safety for their drivers, but also safety for motorists on 11 miles. It's a very challenging condition. Mm -hmm. So we think that's a very logical, con logical maneuverability, you know, off a of potter through a new curb cut. And again, we're going above and beyond here. I mean, right now that trash enclosure sits on the site without 
I'm sorry, the trash receptacle sits on the site without an enclosure. So not only we, we're going, like I said, above and beyond, it's not just a simple six foot high brick embossed wall with wooden gates. And this is a full enclosure, complete with a roof structure and an overhead door to really mitigate any odors and or views to that trash receptacle within it. And the condition is not unique on Potter in this area. We're across from a commercial building that also has three overhead doors. If you don't mind, I have a couple photos here. If I can pass these out, if that's okay. Sure. sure. Uh, the first two images are really of the tree, which I'll explain in a minute. Sorry. 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 I'll, I'll, I'll there's yeah, there's, sorry, the first two images are of the tree from my next point. The third image is of those uh, overhead doors that are to the west. And thank you, Mr. Murphy. That's probably a lot easier than, than me passing those flyers out. But as you can see, it's a very similar condition. We have overhead doors there. And we also looked at moving that trash enclosure to the north. But that's really inappropriate due to the fact that we have our single family neighbors there. So we know they would not be in favor of us pushing that trash receptacle closer to their home. So again, we feel that's the best location from a safety standpoint, a functionality standpoint, and we think we improve the aesthetics of that condition as well. So that's the reasoning for that. Uh, the fence is, really the first two images that I provide in that handout, that's that fence condition. So I know the staff report suggested a new masonry wall to complete that L shape back to the building. But as you can see, there's the neighbor's tree is on that property line and that's a big challenge. So if we were to put a masonry wall that that requires a deep foundation, that foundation will sever the roots and kill the tree. So right now that it's a mature tree, it provides good screening, it provides uh, shading, it helps to mitigate some of, the, some of the sound and noise and it adds beauty so we'd hate to kill that tree for the sake of a of a of a harsh wall and we think the the wood wall is a bit wood fence is a bit softer too for a residential neighbor it gives us the ability to kind of move around that tree a bit more with posts versus that full deep 42 inch uh, foundation and then the, the last site modification is really we're, we're suggesting a series of planters and chains to define that pedestrian circulation around the site that mr murphy alluded to that just you know directs the, uh, the the circulation related to the alcohol consumption on the site or to the to the uh, service areas. Uh, if we could jump to the floor plan, I'll briefly touch on those on the on the areas. So again, up in the in the northwest corner, that's our new uh, bar and event space. Right now, that's used as meeting rooms at some point, but it's also storage. So we're going to reinvigorate that space with a new bar. Uh, two new ADA restrooms to support that too, as you can see to the right over there, right behind that space. So we'll, we'll lose a guest suite there, but we'll have two new ADA restrooms. Uh, we're proposing uh, three new openings, two overhead doors that'll allow uh, the guests to you know, also access the outdoor patio space defined by the masonry and hopefully wood wall. And then we also have a new opening for really a, a, a bar. We can open the bar up and we can have seats against there. So really more of a pass through and guests can you know, sit, sit outside but also enjoy the, the interior too. So some tables and seatings. I think we were suggesting 37 seats within the interior, maybe seven at the bar area. Um, the lobby area, so the, the area at the front of the building, right in the middle of, this, of the plan there, Again, that's the, the, the lobby will still remain as is. We'll have our service counter, but we're going to be converting the, the, the offices to a small bar. So there'll be you know, a four-seat bar kind of at the back wall. Then along 11 mile, we'll have some seating and a lounge area. It hasn't been designed yet, but that's the general intent. So a nice, you know, spacious, open area for customers to enjoy. And then the final space, that would be the, that's phase two. That is the new uh, diner area. So along 11 mile, we'll have the small seating area you know, countertop bar, quaint, quite charming space. Uh, there's a, there'll also be some outdoor seating too. On our property, note that the property line is about three feet out from that wall. So we're not suggesting tables and chairs on 11 mile, just a spot similar to the bar in the back that we're proposing an opening where chairs can kind of, you know, cozy up to that window. Behind that, we'll have a new kitchen area. We're calling it backup house in that plan. And then two new restrooms. Uh, note that the restrooms are, are not connected internally. Uh, the guests will have to exit to the outside to get to those, but there is a covering. Covering, and that's common. There's there's a you know a great a barbecue restaurant in Clawson called the Woodpile. Very similar situation. They have their you know indoor space, outdoor space, and they have a restroom along along Main Street for their guests to use. But they are exiting outdoors, so it's not uncommon. And with that, I'll I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, we wanted to have Kelly Allen address a couple issues. I think uh, including the one that was raised. 
uh, just on the aspects of uh, liquor license and those requirements. All right, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the introduction, Dennis. She's the MC. See, um, I'm Kelly Allen, um, Liquor Counsel for Mr. Razor's um, wonderful project here. Um, we have applied for what's called a B Hotel license. So you're all accustomed to a classy license, that's for a bar or a restaurant. The B Hotel license means that the entire licensed premises is the, is the hotel. Um, it is a reclassification of what we know as a Class C license. It does not require any local approval to reclassify because it's like on the same level in terms of um, density or, or in terms of use. So liquor control does not ask us to reclassify that license. We are way underway with the Liquor Control Commission. Um, we're queued up in administration right now. We've been busting here and at Liquor Control and a shout out to your police department and of course your, your planning department and especially I want to thank Lieutenant Renaud for all and Chief for all that they've been through. They've come out to the site once or twice I think. We're on our, our second I think reiteration of the plan of operation which the city commission will take up. Um, I do want to talk about what, what is licensed real briefly and answer um, Commissioner Douglas's point. So B Hotel means that the entire place is licensed However, even if this place did not have a liquor license, you are able by law to go to your local Meyer and get a six pack of beer or a bottle of wine or whatever and bring it into your room. Your room is your sanctuary. Your room is considered a private space. So um, while one of the biggest reasons Mr. Razor is introducing this for the community is so that his hotel guests will have access to the same thing that other hotels such as the Hyatt would have, that it's not necessary in order to have alcohol in your room. So our challenge really is um, to meet all liquor control codes and rules, which we have. We're an administration. That means everybody is signed off. The only thing left there is for the, you know, the commissioners to put their rubber stamp on it. Are these outdoor areas and how we transport alcohol to and from? So we paid special attention and care to this center area where the concerts take place because of the parking lot. Which is why, as I think Jeff pointed out and Dennis pointed out, um, we will not have clientele or customers crossing from that lobby bar into that area, alcohol in hand. You either must order from a wait staff person, and John could probably speak to this too, Calvin, wait staff person in, within that area, or we're gonna set up a bar in that area. And that's what liquor control wants to see. They wanna see, and so does the community. They don't wanna see people walking back, back and forth in the parking lot with open alcohol. So that will not be happening. Um, either staff or we're gonna add a bar there. Um, I also want to point out that um, we are trying to make, make certain deadlines um, in addition to getting on your city commission um, because Mr. Razor is under contract to purchase this license. He is purchasing a license um, it wasn't, it's a resort license, it's coming from another community. These types of licenses are transferable anywhere in the state. Um, very few licenses available in Oakland County, as in two, and, and they're hard, you know, they're hard to get a hold of. This license is transferable anywhere, and you pay a lot of money for it. Um, we have a closing deadline that we've extended, um, and it, this is not, this is just to say that we're all fours trying to get this done and with the help of the city. <laughs> Um, we should we should make his deadline. I mean, just personally, from having worked on many, many, you know, sites like this with outdoor service areas, the liquor commission is very particular about that. And um, he will be Jim will be required to post no alcohol beyond this point, no alcohol beyond this point, meaning traveling around with alcohol. This is not going to be a free for all. This is going to be a very um, thought out enforcement, you know, procedure. John and Jim are both trained in alcohol management. They've taken the training. All their people that will serve alcohol will be trained in alcohol management. We do not serve minors. We do not serve intoxicated people. And we do not walk around this premises um, except for the designated areas of alcohol. So if you have any other questions for me, I'd be happy to answer those. Are there questions? Come on back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so how will, I mean, neighbors are used to coming to this, bring in their six pack for Saturday night concerts. Um, how will, assuming we um, want the concerts to go forward, mm -hmm. um, what provisions is, are the operators going to make to make sure people don't bring their own? Mm -hmm. Or hotel guests who've you know, got a six pack in their room look down in the middle of the afternoon of this nice green place and want to go down there and sit in a chair and drink their beer. Who, who are the cops here? Mr. Calvin is a cop. Mr. Razor is a cop. 
all of our internal staff are cops? And, and, and that is a really good question. And it, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's going to be easy peasy, because it's not. But they know what they are serving in their establishment, and they know what they're not serving in their establishment. And to your point, Commissioner Douglas, once this goes forward, if this goes forward, there will be no alcohol from any other space except for the Hotel Royal Oak in that outdoor area. You can't come with your own alcohol. Right. Um, it's, um, I mean, it's not licensed now, and so, you know, theoretically, it's not prohibited. But once they are licensed, that will be prohibited, and they will be watching it like a hawk. I mean, it, it for a bunch of reasons. One, they need to, they need to comply with liquor control. Two, they need to comply with the plan of operation that we're submitting to the police department. And um, three, they're, they're not doing this, they're doing this to be competitive for their other uses, not just for that concert use. It's, as Dennis said, it's for the business traveler. And um, the whole idea is that all alcohol, to the extent that they can, will be purchased from the hotel, with this exception of your sanctuary in your room. Thank you. Uh, don't go away. There's probably more questions. I know I have some. Okay. Um, I'm a little confused. Uh, I haven't been to one of these concerts. Uh, my understanding is they happen on Saturday night. As it stands now, today, and again, I might have misheard this, as it stands now today, because there's no liquor license, people can walk down to the liquor store down a couple blocks, a uh, block over, and bring alcohol and sit and listen to the music or not? Not with the liquor license, they can't. And no, uh, as it, it stands now, I'm asking. That's a that's a police department decision. I can answer it in this way: liquor control doesn't have any jurisdiction here because they have no license. Hmm. Clearly, as a hotel, they can go down the street, purchase their, put it in their room. I think that there has been some special event permits pulled for these kinds of things, um, but that that's in the police department's purview. If they wanted to stop that, I suppose they could. Okay, don't go away yet. I won't. You also said something that you said that if there's a concert and people want to drink after the, now I'm talking after you get a liquor license. Right. In that situation, people could drink in the open area, but the, they would have to be served by staff coming from one of the bars. Yes, or we set up an additional bar in that area. Is that on the site plan? Because I don't see it. Well, I don't know if it's on the site plan. Do we need it on the site plan? No. Okay. Well, let, can I explain that? Um, just yes, additionally. Please. So an additional bar permit with liquor control, with every liquor license, you get one bar. And our main bar is going to be in the lobby. That's our, our, that's our bar that is, stays there, it stays put. An additional bar permit is something you can move around. So um, our idea was to get the additional, I think we have two additional bar permits. So we have one permit in the lobby, we have one permit in the northwest corner, and then we have this sort of floater. And this, it won't be there all the time, so in, in my view, I mean, Mr. Murphy can correct, but it doesn't seem to me it would belong on the actual site plan, because it's not always going to be there. Mm -hmm. It's going to be up to management and ownership to decide whether or not for this particular event do we want to set up an additional bar. Liquor control likes to see that so that we don't have any transport of alcohol mm -hmm. across the parking lot. Um, but it's not practical to have that bar or, or cost effective or even sightly, I think, to have that bar set up at all times. Does okay. that make sense? So if you've got a, uh, a special event, part of the special event permit would include that? Um, my understanding, and, and Mr. Cowan can help, my understanding is that once they have a liquor license, they will no longer require any special event permits. What they are doing um, is cover, will be covered in their plan of operation with their liquor license. So their Saturday night events are standard operating procedure. Uh, but that, that additional bar won't always be there. That will be up to management. I mean, let's say if they're having, you know, the Rolling Stones, they're going to want that additional bar. Mm -hmm. If they've got, a, you know, a one piece acoustic type of thing going on. Then perhaps their staff will run back and forth, and then you know they're gonna they're gonna have really qualified staff doing that. All right, uh, the the diner phase two that will not have alcohol. It will, but it is phase two. Okay, but okay. So are there three areas that are going to serve alcohol in indoors, or just two? One, two. There will be three, but for now there's two. Correct. Okay, the phase one is two, but but we're maybe you don't know the answer to this, but you're you're asking for 
special land use and site plan approval for three. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. Any other questions for the? Um, I have a question. I'm, I'm not sure if I, this is probably on a Ms. Ms. Allen question, but probably a Mr. Cowan question about the nature of operations of the garage that's being converted into a bar. So I'm assuming that'll be Mr. Cowan or Jeff. Or Mr. Okay, thank you. So I just like to cover it, uh, to finish up the presentation two issues um, that have uh, been discussed <coughs> so we can take tackle those head on. So, yes, Mr. Razor does. Uh, very much want to continue the 12 concerts. Um, we have a track record. Um, those have been run well. I know there's a variance of opinion regarding sound and things of that nature, but I want to tell you what the rules will be going forward. I have a copy of what uh, Kelly has put together and preliminary presented to the police department. It's the plan of operation. That's what the city commission will review when we get to that level. And as to section seven, it says, Pipe, canned music, or live music will be restricted to a level which will not adversely impact neighboring and adjoining property owners, and Hotel Royal Oak will strictly comply with the city and the provisions of the sound ordinance. Hotel Royal Oak pledges its full cooperation with the police department and or adjacent and adjoining property owners in this regard. That's going to be signed, and that's what, what Hotel Royal Oak uh, will have to live with uh, on a going forward basis. So there's no confusion about that. Uh, that will be the the rule, so to speak, that we are going, that Hotel Royal Oak is going to agree to as part of its plan of operation. So I want you to know that. Does the ordinance have a measurement? In yes. It? Yes. What There's is a it? measurement in your sound ordinance. Yeah. Do they, I don't know. I don't you know. Don't know, know what, I, don't know the, I don't know. I don't know. Does Does the hotel own a decibel meter? They're not very expensive. I. I don't believe so. No. Okay. Well, it would be easy. Is all well, I'm well, now, now you have to understand the the landscape changes, so to speak, because the liquor license is tied to this plan of operation. Okay. So we have to adhere to that, or we jeopardize the liquor license. So yes, we've already talked about having some checks with decibel meters and things of that nature. Yeah, I, yes. I just, I'm trying to address some of the yeah. uh, issues I saw people raising about sound levels in the neighborhood. It would be very simple. They have a decibel right. meter and they have uh, the ordinance in front of you and they hold up the decibel meter and make sure you're not going over it. Right. The second issue... put that in the operation agreement, it's all I'm saying. <laughs> right. No, I, I agree. And if it requires some modifications to the... Uh, location of the music and things of that nature, then uh, that will have to be put into operation also in order to comply. So the second thing is the parking issue. So the way the city counts parking is as if each one of these units of areas of service uh, and the diner are all independent of one another along with the hotel. So there's a double count because when you have a hotel, the people who are staying there are the ones using the services within the hotel complex. Now we're not saying that it's 100%. We're not, we're not going to say that at all. But in consulting with other motel hotel operators, about half your customers for alcohol service are the ones who are already there, whether it's during the week or on the weekend. So. The other component will believe, and we very much believe this, is about 20% of the clientele will come from the neighborhood. Uh, we all know that, for instance, people who live up in, uh, where I live, 13 Mile and Woodward, we can walk over, right over to Brown Iron, I'm only a couple blocks away. People who live near Dugan's walk to Dugan's. And if you talk to them, there's just, you know, somewhere between 15 and 20% of their clientele is actually within walking distance. So we believe that is gonna be consistent with this so we, uh, situation. So we really believe the parking is probably in the neighborhood of 30 spaces of, of an actual deficiency because people are already gonna be parked there as guests using the services um, at the lobby bar or in the outdoor areas. So, but we have a plan. Uh, we've already engaged a valet service. That letter is in your um, uh, your packet, um, it's a Metro Valley Parking Solutions, which is um, already operates here in Royal Oak and does many other hotels in the area. We're gonna use the West parking lot 
Um, for a valet, we can fit about 15 to 20 more cars in there on the west parking lot. We also have a letter, or a, uh, I think it was an email from Laura Bashi, who's the owner of Village Grill, and we can use their 20 spots, which the valet service has already been out and said we probably can fit about 37. So just there alone, we have about 60, uh, 57 uh, more spots that we can manage uh, either on our property or right next door. And we're gonna go beyond that. We are working to try and get one more site nearby. Uh, we have been talking to the Royal Oak uh, Missionary Church. We're not sure about that. I mentioned that in my letter, but uh, from a sustainability viewpoint, we don't wanna create a parking lot for 87 spaces. It would be the size of this property now. There is ample blacktop all along 11 Mile, and people who would be more, most of those businesses are not open in the evening, and, and um, the valet company said that they do a lot of work in acquiring these leases. So we believe we'll have our site on the west side parking lot for additional valet parking, the parking across the street at the Village Grill right next door, and also one other site that we're gonna work on, which will probably give us all total right around somewhere around 80 access to 80 additional spaces um, and we also are going to advertise for the concerts that we don't want people parking in the neighborhood we're going to make that very clear and we're also going to have somebody monitoring it particularly on potter so we think that all together will uh, not cause any kind of parking issue uh, in the in the neighborhood. And we also have a lot of people who walk to the concerts. They bring their, their lawn chairs from the neighborhood, both uh, north and south. So I want to address those two issues, and um, either before or after the public hearing, we'll be glad to answer any questions you have. What is the, Nate, how, Nate, how will the, the garage turned bar operate? Is this going to be, is this a special event space, a catering well, space, the, the, or is it? The generic use, and I appreciate the way you're using the word bar, that is just to be an event space, either a small conference space, uh, uh, a, a small you know, funeral luncheon space, uh, a, a space for, for business, a space for a small cocktail party that somebody may have. It can only seat about 40 people. It's not gonna have, um, it, it's not gonna have regular sit down service. It's just gonna be used for events. It's the outdoor space next door that will have bar service. Okay, so there's gonna be a roll down door. There'll be seven seats at the, at, the, uh, at the bar and then they'll be on the outside and then there'll be, I think, eight tables. Wait, uh, so, so indoors it's just a catering space. Right. But, but adjacent to it outdoors between the building and Potter is a bar? Is it an outdoor? But it's an outdoor. Yeah, it's an outdoor seated bar area. Yeah. And what will its hours of operation be? Uh, that will be from regular till midnight. It's not going to be till two in the morning. We're licensed to do two in the morning. Um. So so there is a like a bar. Like how will people get drinks? Well, there'll be there'll, there'll be somebody at the uh, there'll be a bar inside. The roll up, you know, there's a roll up window, and the bar will be right there, and that's what, how they'll have service of drinks. But people will only sit outside; they'll, they won't sit inside. Right, unless there, unless there, there's an event going on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just, just following up with it, just making I'm trying to understand because, again, personally, as a person who's advocating for neighborhood businesses and walking, the parking seems like less of a problem to me than the noise. And I'm trying to understand um, the hours of operation um, as well as when the concerts happen because are they gonna stay the same rotation as they currently are? So what the hours are, what the time frame is? Because on the one hand, I'm hearing that the bar and the liquor license is to be an amenity for the residents of the hotel who presumably come in all seasons and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. but the concerts are only in the summer. And again, as a person who walks by the place, I think it looks great. I don't live by the place and I haven't been to the concert, so I can't assess the noise. But I'm trying to understand um, why you would need a valet if the activities are mostly for the people in the hotel. Um, so a little bit more about the hours and the operations as far as the vision, because I can't, I, I don't quite understand, because it seems to be representing two different things, which well, maybe it's that, addressing both. Well, what we're saying is that 
if there is an event at that event space, we may need valet service. <coughs> um, and But on the concert nights, we would have to have the valet service. That's only 12 days. That's 12, that's 12 Saturdays in the, in, the, in the summertime. That's primarily when we think we're going to need that service. The so rest the valet's for extraordinary situations, so the concerts and then other events. Yeah, and then if there's a special event, that those would most likely be the, the scenarios. Um, and the hours of those type of things would be? The special events? Yeah. No, let me, yeah, yeah I'll let Jim, I'll let Jim talk about special events. I don't think Dennis has been to every concert. I don't think I've seen you at one, Dennis. Well, um, so the bands kind of came out of the pandemic because we just wanted to get outside and there was a lot of musicians that hadn't performed. And we set those on Saturdays mm -hmm. from 6 to 10. And we thought that that was a good time to end because we are part of a neighborhood, so 10 o'clock seemed reasonable. We could go to 11 on the weekend pursuant to the noise ordinance, but we thought that that was a little much, so we didn't do it. Um, we've we're most likely going to keep that model, but I don't want to be pinned down to it. There's some operational issues with having a busy night with having a band, but people in the neighborhood, um, many people in the neighborhood, some don't, but I evidently have been learning in the past couple of days, but people seem to like it. Um, I particularly like it. I've met a lot of cool people there. so. You know, it's up for discussion as to how that model is going to work. We could do, there was some discussion about an entertainment space in that old storage building. And I have to tell you, that's about a thousand square feet. So you're not going to put a band in there ever. You might have an acoustic guitar in there. And we have to, to Kelly, Kelly will tell you, you have to put a dance floor on the plants. And people are only supposed to dance in this 10 square feet. So we put that as a performance space slash dance floor in that, um, in that storage building, but there's not gonna be a band in there. There's not gonna be a band on the outside deck. And I just wanted to correct Dennis because the plan of operation indicates to answer Commissioner Douglas's question that that uh, storage building bar on the West Coast is gonna be used as you know a regular place that anybody could go to. I, don't, I think we'll do a lot of events in that space, but I also foresee that that space would be available for people. It'd be a great place to watch a football game. Uh, it'd be a great place to get together with your friends and it would serve us that outdoor deck. So I don't intend, I don't want anybody to think that that space would only sure. be okay. for events. But, but just outside, of, so I understand the concerts, I understand that time frame and you, what you have had in the past, but you're getting a liquor license that would be for all year round, right? Right. So, so when you're not rolling up that garage door or having the outdoor concerts, like, what's the plan in terms, is it just people buy something and go to their room then, or, or is there going to be a nice place? Up? I saw the igloos in the thing. So, yeah. so what hours will the liquor license be relevant during normal business hours? <clears throat> My understanding is you can do liquor from 7 a.m. to 2 in the morning. So that gets you mimosas in the lobby to, you know, coming back after a wedding. And the one thing about the design of the place right now is it wasn't really foreseen. I mean, there's a lot of things that Ben Jones did in a really cool way. I love the form. I love the old motor lodge roots. I like that it's a ranch and it's two stories instead of six, but designing in space is something he didn't do. So this gets us the lobby space to have people in the winter time. It gets us the garage space to get people in the winter time. And it gets us the diner, which I think will also provide a lot of room service for the hotel and food for people in the pavilion space, um, you know, when we have bands or at any time. The pavilion space has kind of become a neighborhood gathering spot. So even if we don't have events, people from the neighborhood are there playing cornhole or hanging out or, you know, doing things and people get hungry. We've had food trucks uh, that have serviced a lot of that, but, um, you know, it'd be nice if we have our own brand of food. And to answer your question, Mayor Allison, we asked Dora if she would do food service because we love Dora at Village Grill, as I'm sure a lot of you folks do, but she's too busy. She's unable to do it. I would love it if she could do our food service, but she can't. I have a quick question. I haven't been to the concert. Just make sure I'm clear for the record. Where is the band when you have a concert? Where, where are they located? So um, 
If I could go, Mr. Murphy, to a view of the entire courtyard. So the way we placed the band is essentially in that. In the, in the AstroTurf area? Or? Yeah, in the AstroTurf area, about where that Connect Four is, so facing the hotel. So the music, the sound goes towards the hotel. The hotel's kind of like a, a U. Now where do the fans sit to enjoy it? The fans sit uh, on that green space going back. And if we have a big show like the Reeferman coming that we know is going to be a big draw, we'll uh, rope off the parking spots on either side of the pavilion so people have more room for their <coughs> lawn chair and things like that. So. It's interesting, and it's been a community gathering spot. I know it's very unconventional, but we don't have any of these old motor lodges as hotels in Detroit. A lot of other motor lodges that are converted from these 50s old motor lodges have bands. They have music. It's like an essential part of it. So the mix of music in what I did uh, and, and what I think is appropriate is to look more in what I told the bands is we're looking more for quality and not for volume. And I think that's a trend, based on what I've read, that we need to continue. The, I have a decimeter on my phone. Um, you can get you know, a decimeter. The decibels that are allowed vary as to whether you're commercial, whether you back to residential, will stay within the limits. <clears throat> it's in our plan of operation, we have to. Uh, couple, couple more questions if uh, I can keep going. Number one, uh, what do you do for meeting space now? Anything? We really don't have any. Uh, we've got a big suite upstairs that's about 1,000 square feet. It's not handicap accessible. Um, we've got a uh, room or two that are a little bit on the larger side. Like uh, the Royal Oak, there's a Royal Oak Potluck Club on Facebook and they wanted to do a potluck in conjunction with uh, the bands. and. There's one, the only handicap accessible space is about 400 square feet. On the first floor, we've got that thousand square foot upstairs. I'd like to be able to be like, hey, have, you know, have this potluck thing in the garage. Have it in, you know, have it in the diner, have it in the lobby. I just don't have the space. And that's the other question that you didn't ask, but right now we have no handicap accessible bathrooms because they weren't designed in in 1953. This gives us four which is a good upgrade and it gives us meeting space on the first floor that's handicap accessible, which we just don't really have. All right, let me ask you a question about the proposed space where the roll-up doors, I guess you're calling that the garage area. Right. So to get to the to, uh, handicap accessible restrooms and somebody's in the meeting space, they're having a meeting and they got to use the bathroom, they come out to the south and go around? How, where, how do they get there? They go out to the east. I'm sorry, I can't point to that, but I think Mr. Murphy is. There's a, a doorway there and they can go out to the east to use that restroom. Oh, okay. Because I, I heard that they have to go outside. So that is, there's a, there's a small outdoors passage there. Right. Okay. So uh, I would point out what you're what you're pointing to there. I believe you're looking at the same thing I was looking at. That floor plan says on it bar, and it has both indoor and outdoor seats. There. Correct. Yeah, and I think Dennis misspoke when he said that that was just event space right. because I think we'll use it a lot for events, but we would certainly love to have people watching a game or something in that space. It's very it's well suited for it. Okay, and where, where's the other, uh, you said four, where's the other handicap accessible? There's two on the east coast, so on the complete other side of the hotel. Oh, over Keep here. Keep going. Oh, okay. There's two, there's a non-accessible one in the lounge on the first floor of the lobby. There's another non-accessible one upstairs, but the two on the east coast. Phase two, that's part of phase yeah. two. Right, are uh, all the way to the east. Those buildings, that building is currently vacant because of the weird way that Jones built the hotel rooms where you have to straddle the toilet to use the sink. Those weren't really something that we felt was <laughs> good for the market. So fortunately that gets redone and we get handicap restrooms there to service that diner. All right, other questions for the petitioners? Mr. Ellison. 
I haven't got much. I had a question on the dumpster. The way you've got the single dump. Is that dumpster serving the entire facility of the hotel and your proposed eating areas? Yes. Okay. And we have a, a two yard dumpster uh, that we own that the city dumps, which is currently right there on the plan. Okay. But you're, so this, so this dumpster you've got, you've got it totally enclosed. Right. I'm looking at a single access door uh, from inside the walled area coming out of your uh, uh, outdoor cafe area. Right. I don't see any access for that dumpster for operations in the hotel. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're right. Uh, there's one door that goes into that dumpster enclosure from that, the that's deck. That's all there is. And, and yeah. you can't even go around the front to open the sliding door because you got walls up. Right. So, I mean, that's that, that's a problem. So that's why I was asking if it was just for for the uh, for the usage of the eating or for the, for the entire hotel. Cause right. And again, you know, in this form of layout of 30,000 square foot of building over an acre and a half, we just really didn't, you know, design in any place to do it. I've really been happy that we haven't had an accident yet with them going all the way up to get it and then backing out all the way to 11 mile. But you know, that's a 10 foot curve on 11 mile. There's a lot of traffic and grazing. As far as the dumpster location, I personally don't have a problem with it because there's no parking on Potter Street um, all the way up past mm -hmm. where that door would be. And there's, and there's three curb cuts across the street. It's just the business, it's not residential. So any, any uh, trash going in there, that, that doesn't bother me because it wouldn't, the tra it's going to be directed back out to 11 mile road anyway. So, but. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Razor. Is, you really want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I need to introduce my team, uh, John Calvin, our manager, Harry Crush, our uh, F&B uh, manager. Yeah, it takes good teams, and I've got a great team at uh, Hotel Royal Oak. You know, when I started the law firm, a lot of times I wondered, you know, should I do this, right? And we've got great teams at the law firm. And if it wasn't for you know, John and for Harry and for the rest of our team, and it was just me, you know, I can't prepare a 58 room, you know, bedroom house for, you know, 58 rooms of guests, but we can with teams. So yeah, I, I, I only I only say that because I, I, the the hotel has kind of an eclectic operation. It's kind of um, it, in a positive way disorganized. That's kind of how, and that, and I think that's one of the things that makes you popular. It's because people the unpredictability of what they're going to find at Hotel Royal Oak. Um, now you've got liquor license rules and you've got all these other rules and it's going to change the philosophy of the way, I mean, your, 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 your uh, uh, guests can't walk across but their beers. <laughs> it, you're, it, it's a, it just sounds to me like, you know, if it ain't broke. <laughs> it, it's, uh, let me give you a lawyer's perspective. It, everything that's going on is very cool. And I dig it. But we have to compete with for business travelers in the marketplace. And business travelers aren't going to stay at Hotel Royal Oak if we don't have a bar, and if you don't have a beer and a burger after work. And what you'll see at the hotel is the weekends take care of themselves. When the music theater has a great act, it takes care of itself. But we're deficient on business travel. And this is, we have really cool business travelers. They're very entrepreneurial, they're very neat. But if somebody's shopping in the marketplace and they're a business travel traveler, they're gonna click buy, they're gonna swipe, what is it, left? Yeah, no, and at Hotel Royal Oak, because we just don't have a little lobby bar. Yeah. And we don't have food. No, I, and I understand all that. I, 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 I get what you're kind of doing. You're just making that next step up to grab the you know the lucrative money that's out there, the business travelers and all that out there, and, and I understand that, and you need to have these amenities to do that. Um, it, but again, it's it's a case of trying to adjust a lot of things around to make it work. And you got this part over here, and you got this part over there, and you got that part over there. And it's just it just for my organized mind, which is not organized anymore. Just I'm not sure. It's uh, it's very eclectic. You know, it's a spread out ranch style yeah. place instead of one building. Yeah. But you remind me of my uh, dad when I bought the condemned house on, on uh, that I live on on Lake. Yeah. And I said, "What are you doing? You know, knock this thing down." Well, you know, but, and, and, and in fairness, you know, I, I was only one of a number of people that said, "What the hell are you doing buying this hotel?" So, 
but you know it's worked. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna doubt your success. You got a plan. You got the motivation. You want to do it. I just I guess as a as a patron of Hotel Royal Oak, I don't know. I kind of like the concerts, but I was all kind of free and loosey goosey. But uh, okay, it's, it's yours. I you know we'll hope to to recreate that as much as possible while you know and keep that sense of community and that mm -hmm. sense of you know not being no, highly regulated while complying with everything that. Yeah. Kelly tells me that I need to do for the LCC. That's the the prospect of people walking across the parking lot with a beer is something that's been happening at that place for 70 years. Maybe there's some suggestions we can work with with the commission. To not, not that it's legal, that. anyways. But it's just you know you're gonna you're 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 gonna change into something that's much more structured and and that's. I guess that's what you're doing. So I, I'm going to stop now before I talk myself right out of this. So. All right. Um, <laughs> any other comments? Sir? Are we ready to move to uh, the public hearing? Okay. I'm going to ask the petitioners to have a seat, and we'll open the public hearing. All right. Is there anyone in the uh, public here like to come up and speak Let's like this gentleman you. does? Why don't you come on up, introduce yourself. You have three minutes. Sure. I introduce what's just like my first name, last name, where I live. Yeah. Whatever. Sure. Cool. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. So my name is uh, Kevin Chara. I live on 2nd Street, so just south of the hotel. Now I got a mo I've got a, some multiple concerns here. Uh, so a lot of people in and out of town will come to visit for the band music. You know, this has been advertised on like Detroit Fox News or whatever online. You can find the articles about it. So this is now going to be going on until midnight, right? And it appears this music may be now extending outside of just Saturday. I do not see this being proposed just for a business, business professional staying midweek. I believe it's intended to an attraction to be an attraction for people from all walks to party at my neighbor's expense. Mixing this motel with alcohol is not a good is not good for residential safety. This is not the immediate downtown Royal Oak area and does not have the same level of policing. So my main concern number one is the lowered property value due to comparable pricings of homes surrounding motels surrounding the motel decreasing as a result of the late night noise disturbances and inebriated people. For reference, I'm a healthy 27 year old. I can't sleep when this band plays at 10 p.m. It's very loud. Number two, parking is a huge problem. So, like I said, I live on 2nd Street. Uh, South Alexander becomes too, too dangerous to enter or exit during this time because there's so many people parked on the left and right side of it that it becomes one lane. So if someone's trying to maybe turn left or even turn right into it and someone's coming up from like northbound on South Alexander, it's not safe. I I'm, cannot prove that accidents have happened, but I would not doubt it. Number three, uh, excessive use of parking, and I'm going to say excessive, I don't know the legality of parking within my neighborhood, but I will say the excessive use of parking on 2nd Street due to insufficient parking spaces leaves a shortage for one myself, two of my friends if they want to visit, and three for my neighbors. We only have one side parking and a lot of people have very uh, small driveways in this area. So of those parked, I would also imagine that they will be parked there now for the entire night if they choose to spend the night at the motel due to becoming too inebriated to leave. They're going to be serving a lot of alcohol four different or three different places. Are they going to be able to leave? I think the plan is to obviously, they have some drinks, they're more likely to stay at the motel. So, to end it, I did not move to where I did in Royal Oak so that I could party at a motel resort. This is not what I want, and I would be in disbelief, disbelief if any of my neighbors who know what we all currently know about this project see this any differently. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, anybody else in, like to come up? My right dear, please come on up, introduce yourself, and you have three minutes. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is John Kane. I'm the CEO of 3IS. That is an electrical engineering consultancy based in Novi. I've lived in Novi for 40 years. I've been coming to Royal Oak for 40 years. Uh, business, I've uh, actually I've been uh, consulting with a group in Royal Oak called Bamboo. It's a tech uh, technology startup accelerator. Uh, I uh, recently, about two, three years ago, uh, after spending many, uh, many years bringing clients, customers, and business partners into this city, I became aware of this because my passion hobby is I play in a blues band and we play here. And when I heard the discussion about DBA levels, that is something that we do at all the bars. We bars and venues, we play at outdoor festivals. Um, they, during sound check, we can certainly dial that down, and certainly for the gentleman that had the comment, the, my experience is they only they end at 10, 
and whatever DBA level that could be measured and uh, effectuated in this area could be easily controlled by the bands and during sound check. Uh, I look at it from the standpoint, I don't know anything about traffic patterns around here, but I know that all the followers that have come to this, we pulse them on email and they said the access is fine, there's no issues. Maybe they're parking in neighborhoods. I'm not sure if they're parking up and down 11 Mile. But I, that seems like that would be something that could be worked out as, as far as directing the people that attend these things. And it just seems like with the hustle and bustle that's going on in the Main Street 11 Mile, that corridor, I mean, that's where I'm most familiar with, uh, to, to bring a little bit more uh, entertainment and a, a vibe out further away from the city uh, it, with this super cool eclectic hotel. I mean, you go into the hotel rooms, it looks like you've been transported back to the 60s. Uh, I just think that I, I, I really support the, uh, this petition for these amenities because I, I think for business travelers, I recommend uh, clients that are coming into town to stay here. But it just seems like there's a way to work this out so that the uh, residents uh, don't have an issue with it, but at the same time, it, it drives revenue and and fun to the area. And that's all I got to say. All right, thank you. Other members of the public who would like to speak on this issue, right here. Good evening, my name is Katherine Morris. I live on Potter Avenue. I'd like to take my time to focus on two issues. One, the Hotel Royal Oak's description of the current status quo, and two, the number of requests in this ask, that is the size of the ask. Um, first of all, parking, overflow parking has been a problem on the Saturday night concerts. Um, there are much more traffic in the residential areas on Potter, on the Stanley Court and other cross streets there. Second of all, the noise is loud. I personally have made noise complaints regarding the Saturday night concerts. I made them not because the sound bleeds as you travel away and it sounds terrible. I made them not because they went on well after my young children were trying to sleep. I made them because I downloaded an OSHA approved DBA noise meter to my phone. I took multiple readings inside and outside of my home. I cross-checked that with the acceptable DBA levels in the Royal Oak um, noise ordinance. This is section 770, and they were above the acceptable limits. A signed letter that they will comply with the noise ordinances going forward is meaningless. They've been subject to these noise ordinances as long as the concerts have been happening and have been disobeying them. So I don't put a lot of stock in a promise to do better. They've had the opportunity. Um, in addition to noise, alcohol has found its way to the premises. I know that because there are litter bot there are, excuse me, small alcohol bottles and beer bottles littering the um, masonry wall along Potter and the parking lot. So I think there, there's already some litter complaints as well. Secondly, the number of the exceptions and variances the hotel is requiring. As I see it, we have, we have these zoning requirements and laws in place to set the foundation. You know, previous commissioners, previous residents have done the work of setting the rules, the floors and the ceilings for the type of community we want to have. When there are many requests for different exceptions, for different changes, there's an easy answer. No, we already have the foundation we want. These are exceptions to that on already on a non-conforming property. Um, the only compelling argument we've heard is to compete with a new entry to the, to the space, to the hotel space. And I just don't think that should be done to the detriment of the quality of life and potential public interest and safety um, issues to the neighboring residents homeowners, renters, pets, families, senior citizens, everyone. So thank you for your consideration. All right, thank you. Uh, other, right here. Hello, I'm Stephanie Ellis and I live on Stanley Court. I'm the home in the picture with the pool right behind the property. Um, I think it's really important to consider how the hotel has conducted itself so far. I know earlier we said the, the music and the concerts is not part of this approval, but I think it's, it's very telling on how they're gonna handle their, themselves going forward. 
I've also made complaints to the hotel and the police department about the noise levels on many occasions. The hotel has stopped answering my phone calls. They have my number and they won't pick up when I call. Um, so this has been going on for, for several years. I can't have a conversation with my guests on, my, on the outside of my property. Inside my home, even with windows closed, I can hear the music over the TV or anything else going in, on inside my home. Many times the band will play, play past 10 p.m. and that's mainly when I make my complaints is, you know, can they, can they please stop, it's 10 p.m. Um, the parking is also an issue. We've had accidents on our street, on Stanley Court. We have a, a dead end street. So many times people will turn down our street and throw it in reverse and try to get out um, back onto Potter. People have run into parked cars on our street when that happens. There's been police reports um, related to that. I'm also very concerned about my property value. I don't know who I'm going to sell my home to when I decide to leave Royal Oak. I don't know who would want to be next to a concert venue. I also did not hear any restrictions on the number of nights they can have live music. Right now it's been Saturday nights, but I don't know what the plan is if they can do that every night of the week if they want. I think the city should focus on filling the vacant spaces in downtown. As we heard earlier, there's not a lot of liquor licenses out there, so why would we give one to outside of downtown Royal Oak? Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, uh, other members of the public would like to speak on this issue? There's one that right back there. Uh, Rick Kurlowski, I live on Virginia, which is not necessarily adjacent to this, but I know how the mission creep goes. So uh, I fully understand that they need to probably put in a small cocktail bar, maybe a little restaurant for a continental breakfast to increase what's going on. So that's not too much of an issue for me. That's on the, it's, it's next to 11 miles, it's not gonna affect anything. The bar on the west side or, is absolutely ridiculous. You're 20 feet from a house. 20 feet. The notion that this is only going to be for uh, special events. Well, and we all know how special events can suddenly multiply to every, I mean, if we're already watching football games, there'll be basketball games, there'll be everything else. Uh, we don't need a stage. Well, then don't put one in. Okay? If, you don't, if you're not going to have live music, you're not going to have anything else, then just take it out. It's in there. So obviously there's going to be stuff. You can have a karaoke bar in there with it wide open for how long? Does anybody remember the, the little, the juke, I think it was a jukebox on 14 Mile in Woodward when it comes to parking, how that works? Who in the hell is going to pay for, for a valet parking when you can park down uh, Potter Street? It's ridiculous. Of course you're going, to, you're going to park where it's free. The notion that somebody's going to take valet is ridiculous. Now they, they may just go park in the, in the, um, Location, the locations next to the uh, uh, restaurants and that, but valet, really? If it's free and you just can walk there, that's just ridiculous. But the biggest problem is that proposed bar, and that's what it is, a bar on the west side. I don't care if it's 40 people or not. And you're gonna have outside service, which means there's no, no noise abatement at all. That's gotta go, this plan, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm worried about this, if this goes here, it's gonna go in every place else. That, so how are you gonna stop it if somebody wants in Woodward wants to do it? All right, you're gonna set up precedence here. So yes, I understand the small, and by the way, three bars, really? Three bars for this place? I can see one small cocktail bar for, for business travelers who wanna have one. You have a breakfast nook for people who want a breakfast or a sandwich. The third bar's gotta go. It's just ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other members of the public who'd like to speak, there's a hand. Come on up. Introduce yourself. Please. Hi there. Uh, I'm Steve Hunt. Uh, live on Potter Avenue. Um, I'd say it's probably about uh, 80 feet from the corner of uh, the proposed uh, uh, barn uh, reuse uh, that we're talking about uh, to the corner of my lot. Uh, I'd like to say that, you know, I've been around uh, the neighborhood uh, in a couple of different houses since about 1995. 
and uh, we all remember what that place used to be. I recognize some familiar faces, uh, Mr. Ellison, Mr. <laughs> Cowan, from back in the old days when we were dealing with this uh, nuisance. Uh, it's an interesting place now. Uh, my friends and family like to come here. We like to see the music on the weekends. Um, there's going to be a certain faction of people that just don't want anything in their backyard. We get that. Parking hasn't been a big problem. We don't mind it. So, the liquor bottles aren't from the people that are coming to the music. That's from uh, other riffraff. Um, the people that come to the, the music is usually, in my experience, older people like me that like to sit in a lawn chair and have a cocktail and watch a blues band. So. Uh, I don't see the, the people as the problem. Uh, have there been some loud shows? Yeah, they're going to have to uh, commit to, to keeping it down. So uh, I'm in support of it. Uh, this guy wants to improve this property and make it look better. I'm all for it. So I'm here to give my support. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Other members of the public? I see a hand right there. Good evening. My name is Stefan Saba, and I live right next to the pool house in that neighborhood, in that house there, um, off of Stanley Court. So when they do have the concert, it blares directly into our backyard because there's an opening there that goes through the wall into the backyard there. I love what they have done to the place. The renovations are great. It's beautiful inside. I've been in it. Uh, we actually recommend people stay there. Um, not opposed to having some place for guests to sit and have a joyful drink and have a meal. Uh, I do have concerns about parking and about the extra noise that will come with those um, proposed renovations. That's all I have to say. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Right there. My name's John Thomas. Uh, I'm a property owner on Potter. You can almost see my house from exactly w what we were just talking about. Just beyond the dumpster. I've, I've owned the property since 1989. And I will commend the owner that, that he's cleaned it up. It's pretty nice looking. But in terms of having number one right there where they're gonna leave that tree in there, okay? Right there next to the, where the dumpster is, now they're gonna pull the dumpster forward. And they're gonna put a fence. If you would pull a picture up of that fence, you could see right through that fence. So is it, what's gonna to happen to the music? The music's gonna come into that neighborhood. I'm a landlord, so I don't I don't live there, but I have tenants that are have. Com I got a postcard, so that's why I'm here. But my tenants were were expressing concern for this, and I just feel. And in that first block, I think there's six houses there. I think there's three or four families that have little kids that are less than five years old. What time are those kids going to bed? Seven thirty, eight o'clock. I'm concerned about, you know, I can remember Coral Gables. I don't know how long you people have been around here. Coral Gables had serious problems, and, and what I've realized is that alcohol does not bring out the best in people. So I'm concerned for the neighborhood, and it's a f quiet family neighborhood, and I, I, I you know, I, I don't have any problem with them coming up with you know, like a cocktail bar or something like that. But outdoor concerts, especially right there, I mean, you're, you're, you're within 30 feet of the house. I'm the next house there. <clears throat> so I have to say, I don't think it's a good idea. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Right there. Come on up. Hello. I live now on the Stanley, Stanley Court, and what I can say, the music is really loud. I can hear it in my house with the closed door and windows. That's the first. I'm not sure if that's a good idea with the bar on the corner, like, uh, like he said, uh, with the alcohol. I'm not sure if the 
area, you know, with these kids, is good for the alcohol. Maybe like a cocktail bar, I agree. But uh, with the live music outside, it's really loud, and I don't like alcohol. Thank you. All right, thank you. I see a hand back there. Hello, um, my name is Annie. I live on Curry Avenue between 11 Mile and Chambers, and I share all the concerns that my fellow neighbors have voiced, but the primary reason I'm here is to talk about my concern about parking. Um, we've heard the business owners say this is a, the idea is for a hamburger and a beer, but then we've, we're also hearing a lot about music from someone who comes in from Novi. I know someone who comes in from Birmingham um, and um, event space, funeral luncheon. Parking is already a problem. My primary concern is as a renter who lives on Curry Avenue, I rely on street parking. The driveway in my building is leased to the first floor unit, so as a tenant of the second floor, I pay for a yearly resident parking permit, and that comes with one guest parking permit for the evening from 5.30 p.m. to 8.30 a.m. Occasionally, I have more than one guest after 5.30 p.m., such as my holiday festivist party coming up when I rely on nearby streets notably chambers to provide parking for my guests and family members. Restricting more of the streets, such as chambers, to resident parking will also limit the ability to host friends and family at my home and uh, will do the same to my neighbors. Um, I did, I'll wrap up by saying I don't respect that I don't believe that this business owner will build, um, will improve their relationship with the neighborhood uh, and residents who've already complained and have issues. And it's very unclear where this uh, project is going. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, other members of the public would like to be heard on this issue. There's a hand. Good evening. My name is Włodzimierz uh, Zubal. I'm living on a Stanley Court 818. And it's the same problem with my neighbors. The loud music, it's very loud. I don't know how other people didn't hear this, but for last year we stayed by summertime only a couple weekends because we have to move from the house. Uh, everybody working. This concert is usually Saturday. We like to rest, go outside reading book or invite somebody, it's not possible to listen anybody to talking. Even if we go home and go to bedroom, you hear music. The music is really loud and this is a problem. And I don't know, we complain about this, nobody reacts. I don't know how, I'm from different country, I live here 20 years, but I don't know how can be in like a city, so nobody listen, nobody, you know. Just after two years we have this meeting here, and listen about this music, which we have already two years, and nobody reacts for this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone uh, else in the audience like to step up right over here? Sorry, it takes so long. Nancy, oh, this Nancy Poprovsky, 1119 Batavia, thanks for listening. In my, opinion, when, in my opinion, when your child is in a rock band, it's cool. It keeps you young and bonded when parents aren't always considered cool. More on that later. Speaking of cool, the Hotel Royal Oak's owner has stated that Royal Oak is a cool city. So maybe this new project for his hotel will bring more profit and would be cool for him. But what about his neighbors? I feel sorry for them. I know from experience that not all people want to hear very loud music in the privacy of home or backyard. Overall, I have great neighbors. 
We help them look out for each other. If one of us has a major celebration with loud noise, many cars and people, etc., we make contact with respect. This may happen once or twice a year, but what about a bar that stays open all week with loud music, drunk patrons, and too many cars day after day, night after night? This is not respectful and ruins the neighborhood's quality of life. In fact, while leaving the CVS on 4th Street this past summer, I heard music in the far distance. It got much louder as I headed towards 11 Mile near Hungry Howie's. Hotel Royal Oak had a band out front. I could hear it all the way from 4th Street to 11 Mile. So what about the houses directly behind the hotel? That's not cool. My friend lives in a condo a few doors down from a so-called cool bar that is cool to the patrons. The loud pounding noise keeps neighbors up all night. Parking is impossible. Drunk patrons are rowdy and the police are called constantly. Usually what happens is that it gets quieter for a while, parking is still horrific, and drunk patrons are still obnoxious. Allegedly the bar owner and mayor are friends, so that's a problem. Back to my son's rock band. They asked the neighbors about practicing, but one neighbor wasn't home. They began to play, and shortly after, someone came to our door. It was my neighbor that was gone when they started. His wife just got home after surgery and needed peace and quiet. They quit playing. Now that's cool. Will Hotel Royal Oak bands quit playing for the neighbors right there, recovering from surgery, or maybe just wanting peace and quiet in their home sweet home? Thank you. Thank you. Back here. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Trish Oliver. I've lived in Royal Oak for almost 40 years. Uh, I feel sorry for listening you know, to the neighbors, especially the mothers who are trying to get their children to sleep. I remember when my children were young, I'd set them down and then creep away and hope for some free time while they slept. And inevitably, the doorbell would ring and they would awaken. But I did not have to sit next to a bar with music, so I did not have to contend with that. Um, I also feel sorry for the neighbor with the beautiful swimming pool. Uh, she's created a, her little slice of heaven on earth, and it will be uh, imposed upon by the, the noise and the expansion uh, of the hotel into a drinking establishment. So uh, for the first time ever, uh, I believe that this planning commission should listen to the people who live close to this uh, live concert drinking venue that no other city would approve and instead of the people, and listen to the neighbors who are our ears and eyes of our, you know, our, our, they're our experts, and uh, listen to them instead of the people who donated so much money to the mayor in the last election. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to, from the public like to speak? Uh, I see one right there. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Rochelle Felty and I live on Vermont. I'm new to Royal Oak for about three years and I discovered Hotel Royal Oak with the music on Saturday night and have enjoyed it a lot the last couple of years. I think that their ideas about expanding and doing things is good for the community. It does bring a lot more people into the community. It makes a lot more people see the wonderful Royal Oak that we all live in and that we love being here. So I don't object to any of it. I'm very supportive of the things that they're doing. I don't think that it is super rowdy. I've been there. I haven't been drunk and passed out on anybody's lawn, promise. <laughs> and I, just, I think that it's it brings so much to the community and expanding our what we want to provide for people to see that Royal Oak is a very friendly and, and inclusive place. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right, anyone else out in the public there like to step up and uh, be heard on this issue? All right, going once, 
Twice? Is that a hand back there? Okay. Uh, all right, I'm gonna close the public hearing at this time. Bring it back to this side of the table for the consideration uh, of the commissioners. Discussion, questions for the, more questions for the petitioners or Mr. Murphy or a motion or Person. whatever pleases the commissioners. <laughs> I just want to offer um, some reflections. As a person who's been a, a extensive business traveler, my trips usually are two to four weeks, so I often live in hotels. Um, and I also work from home for more than 20 years, and so I'm very sensitive to noise during the day. And so a um, couple reflections. During the pandemic, the, the jazzercise on um, Maine in the north near where I lived had their classes outside all during the pandemic and it drove me absolutely insane because I could hear it inside my house. It was very loud and it was extremely difficult to concentrate or do my work. Um, I also lived in Coconut Grove, Miami, Florida in a high rise building where there was noise on the weekends and I lived in a high rise and it didn't disturb me as much because that was an area that was known for a party and I chose to live there. Um, um, but it was still disturbing, um, but the jazzercise was more so. I'm hearing here a lot of concerns about the noise um, from the neighbors, and so I'm highly concerned about the decibel issue, the types of music, and that aspect of it. Um, and, and similarly, as a business traveler, when I've stayed in hotels that have weekend events, <laughs> I used to go to the same hotel in Indonesia very frequently, and I started to learn which room not to stay in, so I did not have to hear the noise on the weekends because it was so loud and so disturbing. Um, and I, so I wonder if that even impacts some of your guests who might be longer term stay. Um, on the issue of the liquor license, though, um, and the food, I understand the interest in having that service there, and I could say, as a nearby resident who might come or someone who'd stay there, to me, it seems beneficial, but if it's enclosed, if the music's very quiet, if the music's outside, the speaker should be pointing away from the hotel, maybe to noisy 11 mile. I don't know about neighbors on the other side. Um, so I'm kind of torn on this issue, but I'm highly concerned about the noise. The parking, I am concerned somewhat, but I think that can be remedied almost more easily. Um, and then the idea that this would turn into something that would be ongoing all the time, um, again, a quiet bar service enclosed, heck, a smoking room enclosed, something that someone doesn't have. Some people do smoke still. <laughs> um, but the idea of loud noise and that does concern me. Anything else? That's just my reflection okay. so far. Other, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and I think um, maybe to kick this off a little bit, um, I heard some things that we all agree on, and I heard some things that are up for uh, discussion and dispute. Uh, what we all agree, and, and full disclosure, I live on South Alexander, so this hotel uh, used to be Motel, uh, was at the end of my street. I've driven by it in its non-heyday, and I drive by it now. Uh, I drive by it during uh, the concerts as well, moving kids around. Um, and living on South Alexander for 22 years, 23 years, I sometimes don't want to count. Um, you know, I think we all agree that we don't want to go back to the days of the $30 a night, you know, bed bug, you know, roach motel. Uh, I think everybody agrees that where we're at today uh, in terms of the, the hotel, the facility, the rooms, things of that nature, uh, it's a much better improvement for the surrounding neighborhood and for our city at large. Um, I understand the petitioners need to um, uh, incorporate uh, a bar service. Um, I don't think it's unusual for hotels uh, that are competing, especially during the week, um, to have uh, some sort of service. Um, the tables um, look, in the way it's set up, look to me to be set up for the use of the patrons of the hotel primarily and maybe some neighborhood traffic. I think if people had a choice to come to Royal Oak, no offense to the petitioner, they're probably not gonna stop at that hotel bar uh, when they have so many options in downtown Royal Oak. I would see some people maybe coming out of the neighborhood for a quick drink, meet a friend or something like that. Um, so I think the idea, the concept at a 10,000 foot level uh, makes sense to keep a successful business small business going. If you're not growing, you're dying. And if you're dying, you're going back to $30 a night motels. And I don't think any of us want to see that. The thing that I hear coming up most is the concern with sound. Um, and we've had some, and maybe we could get some reminders, Mr. Murphy. Um, there's this, the pur purview of the Planning Commission is, is a little 
um, you know, we have to consider all of these factors, uh, but when it comes to the enforcement of sound and if something is breaking our ordinance, um, and we've had these conditions in other parts of the city, uh, it's enforced. I think the nature of what has transpired uh, over uh, the summers uh, with the special permits is a little different than what we've done with actual plans of operation and liquor licenses. So I'm not giving false hope or hope or anything, but uh, when these things, um, when liquor licenses get approved with noise ordinances, it's a huge um, enforcement issue. It's, I mean, if they move a, a, a bar or if they move a tap, uh, that is a violation of, of liquor law. Michigan is very, very strict. So um, I think that is a little bit separate because that's something that would come to the city commission to understand uh, hours of operation, decibel levels, uh, what are the what are the noise canceling technologies that you're employing? Um, I will disclose my company does make noise canceling uh, equipment. Uh, I'm not advocating for it one way or the other, uh, but there are remedies when you start looking at things that um, you know are tied to a liquor license that go above and beyond a special permit. I certainly uh, empathize with the neighbors. I would not want to have blaring sound in my backyard, um, but at the same time. Uh, what's reasonable is determined and prescribed by law, and it needs to be enforced if that's the case, independent of what a layout or site plan or recommendation would be. Um, I have neighbors. I live on South Alexander, like I said, and I've probably got yeah, a very 45-foot lots on any given Saturday night. I got my next-door neighbors. They have people over all the time. Uh, over the years, put my kids to bed early. Sometimes the radio's a little loud. Sometimes it's not. Um, I think there are things you can do with canned music to avoid disruption. Uh, any sort of live music, if it's a solo guitar inside a, a, a building, I'm not as concerned about, but if it's the, the concerts, the, the Saturday night concerts, I think that is something that uh, should be um, and can be managed and will be and considered differently in an express liquor license agreement. So uh, I think it's important that we hear this feedback and I'm grateful that the folks that came out tonight to express their concerns about the noise because um, I don't know where this is going, but if it moves on to the commission, that's something that um, you know has to be better um, uh, immortalized in a liquor license agreement versus you know the status quo of how it's operating today. Um, those are my comments for now. All right, other comments? Oh, there you go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a tough one. I'll be up front. I do not like the cafe where it's, the outdoor cafe where it's at. Mm -hmm. Buried back in the corner of that lot, you are putting it right next door to residents and across the street from residents. And I think there's a far better place to, if you're going to have that social area, my suggestion would be put it in the center where you have your, your grass area. And, and, and wall it up like the bars downtown have. You got it out in the middle of the street, they put the bars on it, and, and you know, you can serve it from your from your front lounge. Um, I'm going back and forth on the on the back bar that the garage one configured differently. It made it more of a of a meeting room for the hotel, a gathering space for the hotel that offers bar service so that you can have those. You're gonna need to watch the football game or someone can have a small lunch meeting or Christmas parties for whatever in that space and, and, and use it in that way rather than a bar that's open for the public. You know, you can open to the public and offer it to rent to the public, but don't make it a bar that you put music in there and people come in and eat. And I think that's not a good use of that spot. I think you've got a unique opportunity to turn that into something special that's going to benefit the hotel. Um, my, I also had an idea, I don't know if it would work or not, <clears throat> where you're putting your bar up front in the, off, the, off the lobby. Um, you could gut out, I'm not sure if you could afford to lose four rooms, but you could gut out those four existing rooms and make that your your conference center bar and not use the garage. Um, God, there was something else I was going to talk about, too. I can't get it. But, um, oh, 
I, you know, we've heard a lot of comments tonight about the, the noise from the bands. Yes, it's it, yeah, they're they're bands, they're amplified, they're out there, and I'm not sure if people say you do shut down at 10 o'clock, you don't shut down at 10 o'clock. I don't care. You're, it's bothering people. We need to you need to solve that problem. If if, if 10 o'clock is the shut off, 10 o'clock is the shut off. But again, it's once a month. You have a concert once a month, or you have them every weekend now. Twelve a year, once uh, every Saturday. Uh, not green crews and not art space I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Short, I'm sorry. <coughs> Mayor Allison, we start the season a lot later. Microphone. Microphone. Oh, I'm Close sorry. The mic, Jim. We um, actually this past year started the season a lot later. Uh, every Saturday, not dream crews, not art speeds and eats. So this past year we had 12 shows. The first year for the pandemic we actually started in March because it was super warm and we were dying to get out of the house. Uh, so probably 12 shows. 12 shows a year. So you're basically yeah. once a month. So you're not you're not doing. No, no it's it's only weekend. during the summer. So it's every it's Saturday. Okay. So, yeah. so oh, so you're in 12 shows during the summer. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Can we roll that back? Can you do every other weekend for the summer? Get you like six or eight shows or, or whatever. Change the rules so that you shut your time off. Because I think it's a good draw for the for the hotel. It's a good draw for the area. And done properly, I think it could be a benefit to the neighborhood. But if it's but if it's you know twelve shows over th three four f four warm months, it, that's a lot, especially if the neighbors aren't convinced that you're you know you're working with them. So, but then so let me can I, can I say yeah, this? I'm actually surprised to hear that from the neighbors because I haven't heard that before. We did just have a management change, so I'd encourage anybody to walk in and talk to John Calvin, who's the manager, or talk to Harry, who's at the front desk and the F&B guy, and tell us when it's an issue. Because the neighbors are our market. You want the neighborhood to love you. So I've heard today that there's some folks that don't love us, which, you know, is concerning to me. And I want to hear that. You know, you want to hear things like that when you own a business. So, you know, we don't listen, like for example, the one gentleman who talked about there's, there's an opening on that north wing that goes through. And obviously that's a conduit for a lot of noise for him, uh -huh. so we gotta soundproof that, that's an issue. The selection of bands and telling bands, you know, what to play and telling them they have a hard stop at 10 seems really important. And maybe going to more of an unplugged model so it's not so amplified and it's not such an issue seems to be you know something that we need to do likewise that deck on the on the garage side on the west side um definitely there's some sound things that we can do with that um and some ways that we can insulate that i i hear you yeah no I, there's a lot of things that need to be modified so i'm not sure if we're in a position to approve this tonight it, it, would you be open to holding this over to get your team the opportunity to work with some of these changes and maybe reach out to the, to get some more input from the neighbors. Um, because I got to say right now, I'm not sure if I can approve this. If, it, if I've got to approve this, I'm probably not going to do it. So here's the, here's the issue. So this process has taken a long time. We did a purchase agreement for that liquor license in, I want to say June. Um, and we have deadlines to purchase it. So we just extended that deadline for 30 days. That deadline expires 1230. So these liquor licenses are hard to come by at these resorts. To get a resort, um, you have to have more than 25 sleeping rooms. So what I'd rather is I'd rather listen to the comments from everybody and I'd rather do those and reconfigure those before we go to the commission for final approval and work with the neighbors and listen to everything that everybody said. Because I want to keep it on a, you know, on a timeline. Plus, I want to do any building we have to do to modify the space, January, February, and March, which is our slowest season. But primarily, it's the liquor license. If we don't close by 1230, then we lose the license. So then I got to go out and get another one. Okay. And that's, that's a tough thing to do. But I can listen to your comments and I'd encourage the neighbors um, who, I walked out the other day on Stanley Court because we had that meeting 
Um, and the folks on Stanley Court didn't come, and they were closest to the hotel. So I stopped by each one of their houses. I left a business card at each house, and I didn't hear back. So, you know, I, I want to ask the neighbors to, like, come to us and talk to us, because you know how to get a hold of me. I've lived in Royal Oak since 94. I have my business razor law here. You know, I'm not an out-of-towner. I'm here. Okay, now, I understand. I did. I've known you for a lot of years, Jim, and I, and I, I know what you're all about. Are you willing to consider getting rid of the social area on the west and the northwest corner? Um, I see that more as a hangout with around a fire sort of place. You know, not a not wood because we can't have wood. I actually found a really cool mid-century modern fireplace yeah, for that. But yeah, I mean everything's like I don't negotiable. care what it's made out of, whether it's made out of PVC or wood or whatever. I just think putting tables back there. With people sitting around them in the early evening, drinking and talking, and you know how their voices rise, and I think it's just going to be a disturbance to the neighbors. And I and could it, work on the the only problem is, and I'm not saying no because I want to do something that works. The only problem is is any other reconfiguration I do is going to eat up parking. So I had a conversation with the manager and some other folks about doing one entrance on the main U and expanding a deck out of the lobby, but it eats up four or five spaces. So I'm trying to do a plan that uses the existing space to do something. And so, you know, I think... And, and, and again, we can talk about parking spaces. The only time you've got a parking problem is when you have your concerts. True. And nine times out of ten, you're during you know one Monday through Friday, the hotel's got guests and they've all got their parking places, and you haven't got events going on except for the weekend. So, so your parking issues come up during the weekend, and you've already talked about you're going to use the the, the lot over at Village. Uh, you've got your valet they, to take care of the transient cars that are coming in for people that are coming in for the shows. So I, I'm not as upset about giving you, you know, a, a cut on, on some of the spaces. I'd rather, again, I'd rather see you take that social area and put it into your center space, even if you've got to take a couple of parking spaces away from that and can configure it so that it's, so it's kind of a, a, a bigger social space in the confines, in the center of your building. So it's surrounded by four walls of your building. And then, and then you can, you know, if, how you facilitate serving it out there out on the front lounge, back lounge, it doesn't matter. But I just don't like it over in that corner. I think it's too close to the neighborhood, and and I think you can use that space much better by turning your garage area into more of a, a quiet lounge. Keep all your activity into the lounge. It's off the um, uh, uh, the, the lobby. Because that's the front of your building. That's 11 Mile Road. That's busy, busy city. So there, and then, and then you've got your concept. Those are my opinions. But I'm just telling you, if we've got to go on this tonight with that social area in that corner, you're not going to give me a vote. Okay, I understand. Okay, um, let me ask you: hour a day limitation for the social? I'm sorry. Uh, if there was a limitation on the time that we'd use the West Bar deck. Is what I'm I'll call not, it. Yeah, again, I, I'm not sure if that would even do it because it, it's, it's going to be the one time you're going to get out there and it's, it's a, you know the, the Lions are going to win the Super Bowl and you're going to have a big party out there and this thing and it's going to be loud and it's going to be right there as opposed to bringing it up front where it's in the middle of your hotel so the only area you're disturbing are, are, are your guests and you have to deal with that I, I hear you. business level. I just don't think it's fair to put that kind of activity on the farthest northwest corner of your property away from everything else. I mean, it's far away from the hotel rooms, it's far away from your lobby. It's because you've got a building there and an empty space that you want to fill it with something, and I understand that. Fill it with a couple more parking spaces. Put your, put your dumpster back there. I, I don't know, but I just don't think that's the place for that to be. All right, we have... Um any other questions over here? Uh, Commissioner not, Douglas. Not questions, so much, but comments. Um, yes. Uh, I, I agree with, with Commissioner Allison. Um, this is a hotel, and it's a non-conforming use, um, but it exists as a hotel. And the bar in the northwest corner is like a completely different ancillary activity. Um, if it were, I mean, I, I had thought initially that it was purely a, a a private booking space, not a public 
far. Um, and I just, I, I think it's too close to the neighborhood. Um, I just, I think it's superfluous. Um, it's probably a revenue center, so I'm, I imagine it affects their, their, you know, the profitability of the liquor license, but I just don't feel like it fits. Um, and I, as I said earlier, I've been to the concerts at the hotel, uh, the Saturday concerts. I've enjoyed myself, but it's in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Nobody ever thought there would be rock concerts um, in that space. Um, and so I, and so this will come to the, the city commission, to, to uh, Mayor Fournier and I and the rest of the city commissioners. And um, as was made clear earlier, we as a, a, a City Commission can't deny a liquor license. We can only approve or disapprove of a plan of operation. Mm -hmm. And so it will be when that comes to us at the City Commission that we will consider whether or not to grant a liquor license that allows that outdoor entertainment. But I will say that given the existing conditions, I'm, I'm not inclined to um, support that. All right, Mr. Esbury. Yeah, I think the two previous speakers made some pretty good points. I think it's reasonable to assume that if you're the first house immediately to the north of the hotel, that you should be able to sit in the corner of your yard and garden or do whatever without a bar patron literally sitting 18 inches away. The bar itself wouldn't bother me so much if it was cinder block walls on three sides and then perhaps you had doors opening to the north facing 11 mile. But the patio as configured, I do think does create an opportunity for too much noise. I think it does impinge on the neighborhood, and, and I think, you know, those neighbors do deserve some separation. It looks like you have roughly, depending how many people sit in the horseshoe booth, seating for 44 or 48 people, what have you, on the inside. And I think that could be configured in such a way, again, you know, blocked off on all three walls so there's nothing, no noise going toward the neighborhood. You know, I, I, I don't think that's a heavy ass, and I think protecting the neighborhood to some degree you know, I think that's fair and reasonable. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so we're looking at, I mean, we've focused a lot of the conversation on um, the northwest corner and on the special event uh, concert. So what I'm trying to do is sort this out. And there are other elements in this plan. Uh, one, um, my understanding there's a three bar application. It sounds like some commissioners up here have an issue with one of those locations, but there's a float and then there's another um, plan here to have one in the front and then um, the restaurant uh, to the east. So we focused a lot on this part and maybe that's something that there aren't the votes here, you know, for that corner to recommend, you know, that particular location. But what about the rest of the project? You know, cause I see, um, you know, the little restaurant area here uh, to the east being, um, again, for business travelers that, you know, get in late or whatever, want to get some eggs in the morning, bacon, whatever, they have options. They can go two doors down, they can go here. It's a dead space right now. It's adaptive reuse. It's something that um, certainly clears up. I mean, if we had vacant space there, or we could convert that to something productive where neighbors could go and even grab a cup of coffee or some eggs or whatever, toast, breakfast, whatever they serve. Um, and then I do think the, uh, the concept and idea of having a um, service area for the bar uh, and having a bar and, and whether that front part in the lobby is there as it is, I, I think is, um, you know, um, I would say, I, I don't know, I don't know the business um, here, but, you know, it would seem it would be uh, critical for the success of the, the hotel operation <coughs> given, um, you know, what the market uh, bears nowadays. Um, the idea of um, the bar in the northwest corner, um, you know, I like to think optimistically that there are abilities to manage sound and noise. And I mean, you have an operation here with a lot of rooms that have been here since 1950. There's always people and things going on and people walking around, closing their car doors. There is noise there today. Um, having a big, loud speaker system in that back corner is clearly a, a no-go. But, you know, I don't know what that sounds like when you have five tables of people outside sitting around having a beer with maybe a low-grade radio, or not radio, piped-in music. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying I would want to totally abandon that idea, but I, I see the concerns of my, my fellow commissioners. But the rest of the operation um, and the request here, um, I'd like to maybe hear what my colleagues think about 
the rest of it because I do think there's a lot of positives here. Uh, we always focus on the things that, that may be of concern, but I, I'd really like to hear about the rest of the proposal here and is there something here that's a partial recommendation that goes to the commission versus an all-in-one? Uh, before I call on yeah. Mr. Ellison, I just, again, want to clarify the, the process here. We have a special land use that would be, are we going to recommend that there be uh, liquor allowed on this site, correct? Mr. Murphy, don't, don't uh, stop paying attention to me over there. Um, there that, that's the question that's number one for the special land use. Now, I have a little bit of, a, of an issue here, is that the basis of consideration has at least three, number two, number three, and number four, that really are very dependent on the plan of operation which we've heard some of it, but I don't think we have the plan of operation in our packet. If it was, I missed it. Uh, we've asked some questions about that here, but I'm, I'm struggling that without knowing what the plan of operation is, I don't know if it will be operated to be harmonious. I don't know if it's going to be disturbing, and I don't know if it's going to be an improvement because I don't know the plan of operation. So I've, I've got some hesitancy about that, but my point is the first vote we're going to do here is specially land use Yes or no, we can make recommendations to the city commission what uh, the operations might be, including the music, if we want. But that's issue number one, correct? Okay, Mr. Ellison. No, you threw me off because I was going to respond <laughs> to what, what the mayor was saying. Um, just to clarify, I don't have a problem with the diner whatsoever. I don't have a problem with the bar off the lobby. Okay, and I don't have major heartburn with the bar in the back. I just absolutely not on the outdoor serving area. I think I think the the, the big space in the back, the use of the garage, again, if it's utilized as a is not as a common restaurant open all the time, come and get your dinner, but as as a meeting space for the hotel that that they can serve liquor, obviously, and you know you can have baby showers back there. You can have whatever back there. Utilize that space for the public, because this city is, is, does not have a lot of meeting space, but also for your hotel patrons, and, and, and just get the idea of that being a, a, a you know, a walk in it by a beer type of place. Um, but again, that you can do that up front with the, with the lounge off the, uh, off the lobby, and um, uh, the, diner, the diner to me is a no-brainer, that, that's, that, that's easy. But again, I wish, you know, when you look at the old style hotels when these things were built, what was always in the center of the courtyard? The swimming pool. So what you need, if your focus is going to be your liquor license and your, and your restaurant, put that patio in the center of your courtyard. Take out four parking spaces, move it across, and you're going to have a place for people to sit to watch your concerts that are going to be held and, and okay. make it all work. Um, over here, Ms. Beaky. I, I want to make a comment responding to uh, the mayor's uh, com uh, question about the other aspects. I, too, I don't have a lot of difficulty with the bar in the front or that diner. And as I said, as a functioning hotel, I can understand the want to have that liquor license. Uh, so much other comments, the one in the other corner with the outside deck. I mean, again, I don't know anything about the cash flow or the rentals, but we, need, we also need long-term residency type spaces. Royal Oak has a lot of attraction for people. Maybe that's a bigger suite with a nice side patio, but again, to move the activities into the center of the area. And again, I just want to express my deep concern and empathy for people who have been not able to use their own gardens, their yards, <laughs> during the summer because it's so loud. Um, so that unplugged idea, a different kind of vibe, and when you're having live music, I think is essential to create something that is both uh, wonderful, and, and, and I think it is wonderful, but we're past the pandemic now. We don't have those excuses. I'm, I'm thanking my lucky stars. Those jazzercise women went back indoors. It's almost all women. A few men sometimes go to jazzercise. I've even been there, but that kind of noise, we just it's not appropriate near residential areas um, past that pandemic grace period, in my opinion. Um, anyway, to answer your question, so that so to me, that's one liquor license and, and approval for that special use. But the one in the back is the one again I have the same concerns with because I just think it will exacerbate something that has become a bit of a norm with your visitors to those musical events, um, and it would just go on more. All right, again, just uh, focusing and yes. trying to focus everybody. The first question is about whether or not we want to recommend that liquor be served on this property. That's, that's number one. 
and we have our, our, that should be focus number one. I think, and Mr. Murphy can correct me, that what goes where is in the site plan. So, I mean, they are related, but, uh, you know, the site plan is a second issue. I would say that the special land use, the text for the special land use, does describe the discrete areas. That's, that's what I was going to ask. Oh, it does. You. I think we have to designate how many locations the liquor is going to be served in, in the special, special land, land use. use. Mm. Yes, it is. It, it is in the special land use, Mr. Murphy. Am I? It's related. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, if it was more minor in nature, you may view it differently than if it was the four areas that they've described. Okay. Because so this, this, the text for the special land use, item six, other findings, lists A, the bar lounge with outdoor social area, that's the northwest, B, the bar lounge in the lobby, C, the outdoor lounge, and D, the diner. Um, and E, additional service areas, F, off street parking, but for, you know, in terms of the areas, those are the, the crucial elements. Um, but I might be inclined to support the, um, the meeting space in the northwest corner, but when it came to me at the city commission, I would be looking to see that um, come in as a, a private meeting space, not a public bar. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor. I think the uh, petitioner wanted to offer a few clarifications maybe before we um, ask any more questions, if that's... Okay. I have a proposal. Um, certainly. Okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, just to break the log jam, because no, we, we're, we're listening and we, we, we understand. So here, unfortunately, we've got this time frame, but we do have the opportunity if the Planning Commission so chooses to move it forward that the City Commission will be able to work out the absolute fine details. Okay. First of all, so this is a package deal. We'll eliminate the Northwest outdoor space. Okay. We'll move that somewhere to the east parking lot. We're talking to Jeff right now, but it's hard to define exactly where it would go. Maybe where C Commissioner Ellison has, has mentioned, adjacent to the outdoor social area. So um, we'd like to keep the event space, the, the meeting space, the building. It'll be enclosed. It won't have you know uh, windows to open up. So if any sound will be within the building, OK? Um, and Wait, I'm sorry, which meeting space is that? The, 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 in the northwest the corner, the, the, oh, the, the old garage. Yes, the old garage. So we would uh, preserve that as meeting space for rentals, events, those types of things. And then we would uh, come before the city commission. We'd like to keep the outdoor social area, but we would then uh, come to the city commission with a sound management plan for those 12 concerts. Whether it's unplugged, whether it's using sound uh, reduction, something of that nature uh, that has uh, a little more to it than just saying we're going to observe the sound ordinance and we'll work with a sound engineer or whoever to see what is the best way we can do that. So that would be our proposal. Yes. Go ahead. I just want to make go sure, ahead. if I, I could, Gary. Just want to make sure I heard you correctly. So the social area is going to go away from the northwest corner. Yes. Okay, and it's going to be relocated somewhere Hopefully within the center of the horseshoe. In the in the yeah in the okay, east somewhere in, we in the call horseshoe. East parking lot area. Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure I heard that clear. It's right. A, so as we as, as we approve the um, the uh, land use, and we've got a we, so we can still designate the three locations for the liquor license. Is it three locations for the liquor license or four? The diner doesn't have the liquor license, does it? The diner does too. The, the, the diner is a licensed area. Yeah, the okay. diner's a licensed okay. area. So, the social so area, the, the bar the lobby, so, so the yeah. the uh, event, uh, the the building, the garage, and then this. Uh, whether this, uh, it, it, if it's adjacent, it just, uh, where I'm the, getting at, I'm trying to speed this up. What we right. got to do is we got to approve a land use with four locations. Details we worked out in the plan of operation. That goes in front of the city commission. Is that fair, Joe? Joseph? Is it? Is it four areas? If we move that area. If the outdoor areas. area, is, considering if the outdoor area is adjacent to the horseshoe, as you call it, the outdoor yeah. social district, then that would be four areas if okay. you include that in that configuration. Yeah. So we got the events, I'll call it the event space. The garage is one. The garage. 
We've got the lounge off the lobby is two. Right. You've got the um, diner is three. Three. If that's right. And then the fourth then is the is with the, the outdoor, outdoor social space. area with the outdoor additional outdoor space that we're moving. Okay. So and Joe, we can do that. We can designate those four spots, and then the details of how those are laid out can come out in plan of operation. Yes. All right, other. Just one other point of clarification, though. But moving that deck from that 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 northwest corner garage, you're saying that when that moves, it's no longer just going to be operational on those nights of the music. That the bar will be outside in that area all the time, all during the year, right? Because your bar is supposed to be open all the time, or it's only open for special events. I'm just thinking about the noise again and voices carrying. Yeah, again, yeah, my, no. my understanding on special event, there's not, there's not going to be a bar access outside. No, no outside access. Right. So all no, the no, all we're going to eliminate the outside the access. The event area will happen within the building. There's no yeah, everything bar. would happen within that garage area. Right, but, but, but the deck would still be moved to the outside of the middle zone, but only used during the concerts then? No, no, it could be no. That would be used anytime. Okay. Yeah. If I'm, if I may. You may. You may. Please, <laughs> please. <laughs> We're trying to visualize something which we do not have drawings, yes. and the public has not been noticed of. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Got to come That's back. That's why I was asking. I'm sorry. I, uh, say that again. All of us are trying to visualize what's been verbalized. Typically, we have those shown on a set of drawings, and that's what we word correctly in our public notice, and people are well informed in advance of the meeting and at the meeting are able to see the actual drawings to understand what's being discussed. We're talking about entirely different concepts which we have not vetted, nor has the public been given any notice of. Well, okay. okay, I'm going to hold on a second. I'm going to just make uh, see if I can clarify that because what I thought is that the drawing showed an outdoor bar space, three indoor bar spaces, and we're still talking about the same. We're still talking about one outdoor bar space that would move, and the other three. The, that that Northwest isn't going to be a bar. I don't think we're going to approve that. The other two are going to be the bars that they've proposed. So what we're really talking about is saying you're, you're not going to have an outdoor liquor space on the Northwest corner. You're going to put it somewhere else. So I think the only thing we're not that wasn't put out to the public is the movement of that space to another space. And we don't have any idea the size of it, how it operates, if it meets the building code, fire code requirements, we don't have any knowledge of any of that. Joseph, how can we do this so that we can get the uh, the site plan, the liquor license problem solved? Can 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 we send that out of the land use with the, that description, and so they can finalize the liquor license, and then we'll bring up? I don't know how you then move to approve a site plan which you don't have in front of you. Yeah, let's let's uh, let the, our council have well, a word before here. we I guess before you try to answer that, Joseph. A liquor license has been used frequently up here by the commission. You're not approving a liquor license. No. That is done by the state, subject to the plan of operation by the commission at a later date, where they also consider the music or live entertainment as part of that plan of operation. So saying we're approving a liquor license is not well, correct. No, but, but we're already... approving a special land use for bars for different uses that are proposed in this building, such as for the use of a potential bar eventually if the liquor licenses are obtained. So I just want to make sure because a lot of people have said we're approving a liquor license. We are not approving, or you're not asked to approve, nor can you approve a liquor license. You're approving the special land uses that are being proposed physically to those buildings, the restaurant, the addition of the bar and lounge spaces uh, within that building. So I just want to make that clear because that's been yeah, said a lot. I, I, Thanks. I, I apologize. I mean, I know that well enough. I, do I know you do. In order, in order to get the liquor license, we've got to have the land use. And so I, just a point of clarification related to that because this does come up often when we're talking about this. Once we either recommend or not recommend the special land use, if it were to become uh, attached to this property, that's something that then is retained even if the property is sold. Correct. We've talked about that. So that changes the dimension of this property in perpetuity. Correct. It runs with the land, so anything granted would run with the land. 
Mm-hmm. So even if another operator was there, that would be granted. I mean, they'd have so. to work out the liquor licensing uh-huh. sale and transfer yeah. of that, but uh, the the physical changes would run with the land and stay with the land. It would extend, as Joseph described to you, it would maintain that pre-existing non-conforming use mm-hmm. uh, that's essentially grandfathered in because that existed prior to the change in the zoning ordinance. We're, we're voting to permit this use on the land. Right. Correct. And you could vote to approve or deny. Again, it's a recommendation. The commission can do whatever they see fit, regardless of your recommendation. Although I'm sure they value your thoughts and recommendations. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and I, I think Mr. Casada summed it up, I mean, quite well, where um, we have a site plan in front of us today. Right. I think what the discussion has boiled down to, at least what I get a feeling from some of the commissioners, is the northwest corner, you have an outdoor seating area. That's Some find that not acceptable. It's too close to the neighborhood. It might be too loud. It might pose some issues. The petitioner has said, which is often the case up here, there's small minor changes and things like that. Okay, we'll move that outdoor area and we'll move it into the middle, right there surrounded, where the only neighbors are the patrons, of the hotel. That garage there we'll still use for special events. We want to for special events, like if you have a birthday party or potluck luncheon, whatever it is, and they want to sell beer out of there, they'll still do that, but that's a, you know, there's no, it's confined inside the building, winter, summer, whatever. It's in that, it's in that facility. There's not the noise issue uh, that would accommodate the same thing with the garage doors open in the, in the outdoor service area. So the noise issue has been there. The petitioner has also said, which is I believe outside the purview of this planning body, because it's dealing with the, it's not really a site plan issue so much. I think the, spe- the, the noise of the special events, that's something that has to be handled in the plan of operation with the city commission and to give confidence to this planning commission because that is where a lot of the neighbors have come and said, hey, this is, this is too loud, that they're gonna provide a plan in their, in their plan of operation to control the sound of uh, those 12 events or five events, whoever they plan to do, if they're acoustic, they put big noise canceling speakers up there, whatever it is with sound engineers, professionals, that there will be, but that's outside the special land use to say, hey, look, they can have a bar here, uh, they can serve alcohol on this property as far as a land use point of view, and they'll do it in these three spots with the exception of the unknown, which we imagine is going to be straight in the middle there. Uh, they don't have to put that in. It doesn't have to be approved that they have that outdoor deck. That, that part could come back uh, for further consideration if there is a, um, something that can't be worked out, um, I would imagine. Um, and to me, that sounds reasonable, take all the noise and everything aside, should a hotel in Royal Oak have a, be able to serve liquor at this, at this property uh, in these general area or in these areas, these specific areas, I think we should be able to answer that question tonight. Where that outdoor place goes in the middle, I think is the question. Where the dumpster is, the site plan, everything else, other than that, where they would move that outdoor uh, service area, um, you know, I believe there's a site plan here to, you know, make comments on and make recommendations on as far as forwarding that that um, recommendation. I, maybe I'm simplifying it too much. There's all these considerations, but we have a certain specific task. And I think Mr. Casada summed it up way better than me. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, if I understand correctly, this is the first time we've done this where we've had a special land use permitting alcohol use. That's This is a new ordinance, yeah. yes? It's a little tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And I also heard, though, from Mr. Murphy that we can recommend operational, uh, make operational recommendations, which I think we should. Mm-hmm. I think we should say, you're going to say, every year you're going to state the number of events. They're going to be on Saturday night. They're only going to be so late on Saturday night. After a certain time, they're going to be cut off. Uh, the uh, Bars are going to be open at such and such a time. I think all those things uh, I think we could recommend. I also agree that the, I haven't really piped up too much about this, but the garage area as a meeting space makes sense. 
but that too, it, you know, is not going to be, you know, after 10 o'clock. Um, and, and there's no outdoor meeting or outdoor bar space there. So I, I, I think that whoever makes a motion, um, I think the first one is, are we going to recommend permitting alcohol on this property and any operational recommendations you want to make? Mr. Esprit. So my only thought would be, I mean, we've spent a lot of time kicking around, uh, thank you, the idea of, you know, where the liquor licenses should be applicable and what's appropriate and what's not. But we haven't talked about you. So there are 12 contingencies, I think, if I have it right, being recommended by the planning department, the last six of which are largely administrative and, you know, the boilerplate stuff. But, you know, setbacks, off-street parking, and other standards shall be provided as determined necessary and advisable by the planning commission. Non-conforming uses structure may be extended and altered. We haven't talked about, well, we have talked about the outdoor social area. We haven't talked about the parking numbers. We haven't talked about eliminating the seating along 11 mile as the planning department has recommended. The planning department is recommending that we get rid of the waste receptacle enclosure in its entirety as it's related to fodder. So, I mean, there's okay. So Are you looking at the, the site, site plan? plan. Site yeah. plan. Okay, but there, that's the second. Issue. Yep. No, no, but I mean, they're tied together, and, 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 and if they're looking for any advisory comments from us, I mean, there's, there's a whole lot more to this than just where the specific uses of the liquor license are gonna, going to be. Okay, yes. Um, I don't want to get confused. Maybe I'm confusing myself. Is that, um, all right, go ahead. Well, I'm going to try a motion. All right. Um, I move that we approve the special land use as described by staff with one exception and that is removal of the social area, um, the outdoor social area, item 6A, um, in, uh, in the northwest corner. That's, that would be the only change. This leaves the lobby bar intact. It leaves the center, you know, service area in the center horseshoe intact, and it leaves the diner intact. I mean, that's really the only change from the special land used as proposed. Except, correct me if I'm wrong, okay. the, what they're proposing is a bar in the garage, and we're saying I, I said remove the social outdoor social area. Oh, I didn't say remove the bar. Okay. If that's your motion, then that's your motion. Yes. Uh, okay. Remove the bar from where? From the social area or from the from Remove the, the outdoor social area yeah. from the northwest corner. Okay. But you're not eliminating it from the project because they want to move that into the center. And that's got a bar with it. Uh, to, uh, to be determined by the plan of operation. Okay. I mean, this, these are physical conditions, and that's the one physical change from the plan okay. as submitted. Okay. Um, so I'm going to repeat the motion. Uh, the motion is to approve the special land use as uh, proposed with the exception of the outdoor social area in 6, described in 6A. Yes. What you okay. Is there a second? I'll second it for discussion. All right, comments? I mean, I, okay. No, you said we still have the four locations for serving alcohol in that in that motion, in that yep. land use. Okay, so okay. We still have four. Okay, okay. And, and okay, I'm going to pipe up. I'm not going to support this because what I heard about the garage is it's a bar, there's a dance floor, it's always open. And I can operate till two o'clock in the morning. That's what I heard. And when I look on the map, I can do a little bit of eyeballing. I look on. The, I think that I think that building is about twelve feet from the house. I don't think it's twenty feet. I think it's twelve feet from that house. I don't know if anybody went out there and measured it. So I'm not going to support that. You guys can, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'll take a different take on that. Um, I think that the dance floor and all of that, I don't, I don't, and this will all be determined in the plan of operation that, and, and if we want to offer the recommendation that, you know, it, the special land use is approved also with the recommendation that, you know, there's limitations on that bar there. I think the intent of that bar is to have alcohol service for primarily special events 
and then maybe in the winter the patrons come there. I think the dance the dance floor is just small a small wedding, so they can a dance. Small wedding or small you know kids' birthday party or whatever it may be. I think we've seen this at the city commission on countless occasions where almost every single liquor license applicant uh, wants to have um, the ability to have a dance floor. It's rarely um, a feature. I don't see that being or even having the capacity, again, no offense to the petitioner, to even compete with a dance bar, dance club, and like, that would be equivalent in Detroit or, or, or Royal Oak. I believe that you might have um, for a bar mitzvah. You know, uh, you might have in a, 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 some music playing and then, you know, some kids, I guess, men in a bar mitzvah's case, because you become a man, and, you know, uh, and dancing in the 10 by 10 foot area, maybe whatever. So I don't think the intent is to make that a club or bar. I think it's to support the guests that are staying there to have a community space. And with all community space, when you cater and things like that, people are going to be like, oh, well, can we get, you know, some beer on tap? We're going to have a, a business meeting here, a luncheon meeting, and we want to serve some beer, whatever it may be. So I think that's really my understanding of the purpose. So that will be sorted out in the plan of operation. But from strictly saying this location for a special land use uh, should have the ability to serve alcohol um, in these areas as a, as a land use point of view, um, I support the details of how they're going to do it. We can offer some recommendations with that approval. And we can, uh, you know, when it comes to the city commission, there will be everything from noise, how you do that, to, you know, no glow sticks and whatever. I don't know. Um, that's my, you know, feeling of it. Just my experience being up here 12 years, seeing lots of liquor licenses come forward. Can I ask the architect a quick question? Sure. What is the garage made out of? I believe it's all... Concrete block. Concrete block. Yeah. Okay, and we do have the ability to soundproof that if we needed to. Yeah, well, we, we can look at furring the walls out. Yeah, the alternative is in a long discussion. I wanted to just, it's not, it's not made out of tin, so it's got, no, no. It's already got some eight inch very block. Dense. It's already got some sound deadening on it. Okay. Correct. Mr. Esbury. Actually, I have a question for our city attorney. And with all due respect to Ms. Douglas, it's late, we're getting punchy, and I think we're all starting to think in circles, but the motion that Ms. Douglas has proposed, do you feel it's adequately encompassing as an advisory tool for the City Commission, or is it lacking in any way? No, I think it's uh, spot on. All right. <laughs> you got one win, all right? You got it. <laughs> I was just going to make the comment that, that as much as I, I think it's appropriate that this venue, this this motel or hotel would have liquor license, that, that northwest corner does concern me equally, as Mr. Casada has mentioned. And my other concern, because our public hearing is the only uh, opportunity for the neighbors, for the city uh, residents to have this opportunity to come and comment, um, I mean, they can come comment at the other approval, but the, it moves along much more. I'd be, I could be more comfortable if it were able to come back, and I recognize the time crunch. So I guess I'm hesitant to approve, even though in in general terms I'm kind of with the idea. But as far as what we have on paper, to Mr. Murphy's point, um, is not quite there yet. And so, so in that sense, I would be hesitant um, to approve tonight. But I understand the city commission um, will receive. I mean, it moves on regardless of our position. I would say that the site plan is there. You're just taking a marker and you're scratching out that outdoor service area, at least not the motion that's on the table. Now, whether that's acceptable or not, you know, but as a modus of rationale, the rationale is we have a site plan in the motion that was made that scratches out that corner uh, where the outdoor service area would be for that northwest corner. The outdoor bar. Right, and I'm acknowledging the indoor bar might also be a problem at that corner for me. Okay, that's different, though, but that's, yeah, we do have a site plan. Yeah. yeah. I suppose I could, I don't know if my vote is even needed, but I would support the motion if it came with a, a recommendation, an operational recommendation said that the garage area be limited to event and meeting space, and that's okay if they serve liquor, but if it's an event and meeting space. That's my, that's I, my feeling. I, 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 uh... I would call for a vote on the motion as presented. Okay. I think that's all I can do. And then just, yeah. All right. Any further discussion on the motion as presented, which is to recommend approval of the special land use as presented with the exception of um, removing the 
outdoor social area in the northwest corner. Just one quick clarification from council. If a motion like this fails, we're not, we can still chip away at it and make modifications, right? We're not, it's because it's not an explicit denial. Yes. Got it. Okay. Just trying to pretend to be that lawyer talk, you know? Just want to okay. confirm. All right. If there's no uh, further uh, discussion, uh, I'm going to call for the uh, vote, the voice vote on the motion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. 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 So we have aye. one, two, three, four ayes and two nays. So the motion passes. So now Sweet. we are on the site plan. I think four, five, and six. And um, so I got to ask a cor clarification here. The site plan says that area is a bar up in the in the garage. Um, so that's what we would be dealing with here. We have to prove that or deny it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Tim. Yeah, I'm looking. If you're talking about the bar that's on the outside of the garage building, the one that's inside the what used to be the social area, because there's a second bar inside that. There's a bar inside that building, and then there's a bar outside. I'm not going to, I'm just saying, I'm not supporting I the bar inside. Don't. You're not supporting the bar inside. I'm not. Yeah, we said this is gone. Yeah, I understand so that. All. I understand that, okay? But this is still left. Yeah, six and, tables. And that's, a, and that's a bar. Um, if you look at it, this is outside bar. That's a service station bar. Yeah, yeah and then... Yeah, that outside area is gone, the service to the outside, my understanding, but it would be just that interior part there as the permanent service. So is there no more liquor in the garage area? Uh, no, there's, there's still liquor. Okay. Meeting and event space. Mm -hmm. For, that's what I think, but well, that's I, my opinion. Yeah. That could all be worked out. The plan Mr. Mayor. Operation. Yeah, I'm just saying the, the site plan on that, I mean, it's it's a bar, meeting and event space, it's six tables in a in a bar Whatever, to, yeah, to make okay. drinks you know what i mean it's never going to be this raucous place with six tables so if it's a place in the winter time that you know there's a pistons game on or something and the people staying in the hotel the business travelers want to go in there because they're you know they they're they decided they're just going to watch a game in there i don't know how that impairs the neighborhood or any you know why that has to be a special event or a meeting space, I think it's, with six, I, I agree, I would actually be more in alignment with Mr. Casada's thought, or Casada's thought, if um, it was, you know, 20 tables, but it's six. Uh, let me just make a comment. Meeting space in a hotel, but it's what I understood when I, when I uh, spoke to people about this, is that at supporting the hotel as a meeting space, you know, you use meet, hotel meeting rooms for things like arbitrations, or mm -hmm. mediations, or other uh, uh, presentations. Like for instance, if you were gonna have a neighborhood meeting about a special land use, you could hold it in mm -hmm. a meeting space. That's what a meeting space is to me. And if you wanna serve alcohol during that, uh, that's great. Or if you wanna do something like that, I'm, I'm still not supporting a 365 day a year, whatever, uh, up, open till two o'clock bar in that space. Okay. That's just my opinion. Okay, but we have a motion to make here. Some... All right, I'm looking at the site plan, which has 12 points in it. Um, the three that I'm looking at are four, five, and six. Um, number four, I would remove the reference to the outdoor social area since it's already gone. So number four would read the outdoor lounge and all other outdoor service areas shall only include those elements depicted on the site and landscape plans. Um, number five has to do with the, um, the trash bin. Sure, um, can I stop for a minute, where are you at? On page nine and 10 of the PDF, which the site is, plan. Which is page one and two of the site plan right. report from the staff. Item five here uh, uh, asks them to um, okay, not put the waste enclosure on Potter. Um, I find backing out onto 11 Mile a lot less desirable than backing out to Potter, so I would strike number five. Um, number six is outdoor seating along 11 Mile Road for the diner shall be removed. Anybody got any preferences there? Um, that 
Mr. Mayor. Uh, so, I mean, they would still, well, I guess, let me look at the plan. That, does, is there any encroachment onto the public right of way for that outdoor seating on 11? Uh, no, but it's a, it's, a, it's a sidewalk. It's right next to 11. Yeah. I just don't know if it would invoke the sidewalk permit. So um, I'll, I will, I'll retain item six. Um, uh, striking the outdoor seating along at least East 11 Mile. You know, things change, time change. They could come back at some other point with some minor revision to this. Um, but for the time being, I'm going to honor the staff's desire to remove that outdoor seating. But all other elements, all other 12 site plan elements would be retained. That's my motion. All right. But you, okay, <clears throat> let me see if I can restate it. The motion is to approve the site plan. I thought you said number four was struck, no? For uh, the phrase outdoor social area is ah, struck. There you go, okay. Striking the phrase outdoor social area and uh, striking number five. Yes. And all, uh, uh, th that's the motion. Yes. Okay. Is there a second? I think it's worthy of discussion. I'll second it. Okay. Motion is seconded. Uh, <coughs> all right. And again, just to, I just want to be uh, clear then with Mr. Murphy and, the, and our legal counsel that if we approve this, the, the motion, they can put a bar in, in the garage. Yes or no? Is it yes? Okay. Thank you. All right. Further discussion? All right. Seeing none, I'm going to call for the vote uh, on the motion to approve the site plan, uh, striking the words in number four, outdoor social area, and striking number five of the contingencies, accepting all others. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. 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 Okay, we got four to two. Motion passes. Congratulations. Good luck to you. Do we have anything else to do on this one? All right. Very good. All right, what's next on the agenda? I gotta dig dig the agenda out. Meeting dates. What's that? Yeah, I think I think maybe we should just take a second to just kind of let the folks that yeah. stay here till midnight know what the next steps are. I think that would be helpful for them to understand that what just got approved oh, for the residents. and what the um, all the concerns about noise and all of that stuff are going to be addressed uh, through the plan of operation when it gets in front of uh, the city commission. And so, there will be a public hearing. And there's public hearings and there's a whole other steps of processes. So if your primary complaint is about noise and disturbances and all of that, that goes outside the layout. That actually is incorporated in, in something that isn't a physical map, rather a operating plan, which is not existent today because they don't have the liquor license to have an operating plan, so to speak. Does that make sense? And I don't know if it's a reasonable thing since Mr. Razor, the owner, is here and the people have stayed so long, perhaps if you have a moment in the hall afterwards to, to meet each other. Because, again, if people have spent a couple years with that noise issue, I think it's very important that your neighbors and you meet. And this is a great opportunity if you have a chance. Yeah, Because they're done. still here. Yeah, yeah that would be great. Can, can, I, can I ask a question? No, no we're done. We have okay. to go move on. <laughs> right? Oops, I'm not the chair, but sorry. I know it's midnight. It's past All midnight. Right. I promised myself I wouldn't stay past the letter. <laughs> Let's see where we're at here. Other business. Uh, number two, meeting at dates and religious holidays. Oh, Mr. Esby. Well, I was just going to say, having uh, reviewed the memo from staff, I'd like to make a motion to approve the meeting dates and religious <laughs> holidays for 2024. <laughs> Is there a second? Second by the mayor. Is there a discussion on this issue? Let's work on not staying till 11. I want new rules. But yes, I approve, I, I approve that message. <laughs> All right. Um, we lost somebody. But uh, he's, oh, no, he's we found him. He can yell yes. <laughs> he ran away. Yes. Yes. Approving next year's dates. The meeting right. staying on you, Tuesday, Did you hear right? the motion? <laughs> no. The motion was to approve, as recommended, the uh, holiday uh, oh, God. dates okay. for next year. Meeting schedule. Meeting schedule. Aye. Is oh. there, okay, we'll <laughs> call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, good. Uh, next non-action items, the RCOC road report. <clears throat> Who's in charge of this? 
This is just a, th that and the next item are just yeah. informational. So in case uh, if you have Six any questions. Okay. Is there any comments from the or questions for the commissioners on the administrative site plan approvals? Sometimes there is. Not All right. Time. Hold on one more second. Is there does any of the planning commissioners? We've had a long evening, but if any of the planning commissioners wish to make a statement for the record before we move to adjourn. Save it till December. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whatever it might be. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, wait. I'll add, I will add some tails in 30 seconds. The master plan staff worked with DPZ to do the educational component, which was sent out uh, largely in the Royal Oak Today publication, which was the second week in October. It was a four page spread. Very we nice. did social media releases, and the survey is now available. No, survey number two can be taken by anyone. Uh, signage is in the parks, uh, there's signage in the lobby and at other locations, along with surveys, and people should start receiving the postcards in the mail if you aren't, haven't already. And, and the signs are very good and, and, and noticeable. And how long is the survey open? Open through the end of the calendar year. All right. Very good. All right. Thank you. Thank is you there update. a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Okay. <laughs> uh, call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you so much for your hard work tonight.